or really let the matter drop, was the question that worried him all the way. He thought angrily of the pleasure he would have at seeing the fright of that small and frail but proud man when covered by his pistol. And then he felt with surprise that of all the men he knew, there was none he would so much like to have for a friend as that very adjutant whom he so hated. Chapter 7 The Emperor Reviews the Army Enthusiasm of Nicholas The day after Rostov had been to see Boris, a review was held of the Austrian and Russian troops, both those freshly arrived from Russia and those who had been campaigning under Kutuzov. The two emperors, the Russian with his heir the Tsarevich and the Austrian with the Archduke, inspected the allied army of 80,000 men. From early morning, the smart, clean troops were on the move, forming up on the field before the fortress. Now thousands of feet and bayonets moved and halted at the officer's command, turned with banners flying, formed up at intervals, and wheeled round other similar masses of infantry in different uniforms. Now was heard the rhythmic beat of hoofs and the jingling of showy cavalry in blue, red, and green braided uniforms, with smartly dressed bandsmen in front mounted on black, roan, or grey horses. Then again, spreading out with the brazen clatter of the polished, shining cannon that quivered on the gun carriages, and with the smell of linstocks, came the artillery, which crawled between the infantry and cavalry, and took up its appointed position. Not only the generals in full parade uniforms, with their thin or thick waists drawn in to the utmost, their red necks squeezed into their stiff collars, and wearing scarves and all their decorations, not only the elegant pomaded officers, but every soldier with his freshly washed and shaven face, and his weapons clean and polished to the utmost, and every horse groomed till its coat shone like satin, and every hair of its wetted mane lay smooth, felt that no small matter was happening, but an important and solemn affair. Every general and every soldier was conscious of his own insignificance, aware of being but a drop in that ocean of men, and yet at the same time was conscious of his strength as a part of that enormous whole. From early morning strenuous activities and efforts had begun, and by ten o'clock all had been brought into due order. The ranks were drawn up on the vast field. The whole army was extended in three lines, the cavalry in front, behind it the artillery, and behind that again the infantry. A space like a street was left between each two lines of troops. The three parts of that army were sharply distinguished. Kutuzov's fighting army, with the Pavlograds on the right flank of the front, those recently arrived from Russia, both guards and regiments of the line, and the Austrian troops. But they all stood in the same lines under one command and in a like order. Like wind over leaves ran an excited whisper, They're coming! They're coming! Alarmed voices were heard, and a stir of final preparation swept over all the troops. From the direction of Olmutz in front of them, a group was seen approaching. And at that moment, though the day was still, a light gust of wind blowing over the army slightly stirred the streamers on the lances, and the unfolded standards fluttered against their staffs. It looked as if by that slight motion the army itself was expressing its joy at the approach of the emperors. One voice was heard shouting, Eyes front! Then, like the crowing of cocks at sunrise, this was repeated by others from various sides, and all became silent. In the death-like stillness, only the tramp of horses was heard. This was the Emperor's sweets. The Emperors rode up to the flank, and the trumpets of the 1st Cavalry Regiment played the general march. It seemed as though not the trumpeters were playing, but as if the army itself, rejoicing at the Emperor's approach, had naturally burst into music. Amid these sounds, only the youthful, kindly voice of the Emperor Alexander was clearly heard. He gave the words of greeting, and the first regiment roared hurrah so deafeningly, continuously, and joyfully that the men themselves were awed by their multitude and the immensity of the power they constituted. Rostov, standing in the front lines of Kutuzov's army, which the Tsar approached first, experienced the same feeling as every other man in that army, 
a feeling of self-forgetfulness, a proud consciousness of might, and a passionate attraction to him who was the cause of this triumph. He felt that at a single word from that man, all this vast mass, and he himself an insignificant atom in it, would go through fire and water, commit crime, die, or perform deeds of highest heroism. And so he could not but tremble, and his heart stand still at the imminence of that word. Hurrah! 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 thundered from all sides, one regiment after another, greeting the Tsar with the strains of the march. And then, Hurrah! Then the general march, and again, Hurrah! Hurrah! growing ever stronger and fuller, and merging into a deafening roar. Till the Tsar reached it, each regiment in its silence and immobility seemed like a lifeless body. But as soon as he came up, it became alive, its thunder joining the roar of the whole line along which he had already passed. Through the terrible and deafening roar of those voices, amid the square masses of troops standing motionless as if turned to stone, hundreds of riders composing the suites moved carelessly but symmetrically, and above all freely, and in front of them two men, the emperors. Upon them the undivided, tensely passionate attention of that whole mass of men was concentrated. The handsome young Emperor Alexander in the uniform of the horse guards, wearing a cocked hat with its peaks front and back, with his pleasant face and resonant, though not loud, voice, attracted everyone's attention. Rostov was not far from the trumpeters, and with his keen sight had recognized the Tsar and watched his approach. When he was within twenty paces, and Nicholas could clearly distinguish every detail of his handsome, happy young face, he experienced a feeling of tenderness and ecstasy such as he had never before known. Every trait and every movement of the Tsars seemed to him enchanting. Stopping in front of the Pavlograds, the Tsar said something in French to the Austrian Emperor and smiled. Seeing that smile, Rostov involuntarily smiled himself and felt a still stronger flow of love for his sovereign. He longed to show that love in some way, and knowing that this was impossible, was ready to cry. The Tsar called the colonel of the regiment and said a few words to him. Oh, God, what would happen to me if the Emperor spoke to me? thought Rostov. I should die of happiness. The Tsar addressed the officers also. I thank you all, gentlemen. I thank you with my whole heart. To Rostov every word sounded like a voice from heaven. How gladly would he have died at once for his Tsar. You have earned the St. George's standards and will be worthy of them. Oh, to die, to die for him, thought Rostov. The Tsar said something more, which Rostov did not hear, and the soldiers, straining their lungs, shouted, Hurrah! Rostov, too, bending over his saddle, shouted Hurrah with all his might, feeling that he would like to injure himself by that shout, if only to express his rapture fully. The Tsar stopped a few minutes in front of the hussars, as if undecided. How can the Emperor be undecided? thought Rostov. But then even this indecision appeared to him majestic and enchanting, like everything else the Tsar did. That hesitation lasted only an instant. The Tsar's foot, in the narrow pointed boot then fashionable, touched the groin of the bob-tailed bay mare he rode. His hand in a white glove gathered up the reins, and he moved off accompanied by an irregularly swaying sea of aides-de-camp. Farther and farther he rode away stopping at other regiments, till at last only his white plumes were visible to Rostov from amid the suites that surrounded the emperors. Among the gentlemen of the suite, Rostov noticed Volkonsky sitting his horse indolently and carelessly. Rostov recalled their quarrel of yesterday, and the question presented itself whether he ought or ought not to challenge Volkonsky. Of course not, he now thought. Is it worth thinking or speaking of it at such a moment? At a time of such love, such rapture, and such self-sacrifice, what do any of our quarrels and affronts matter? I love and forgive everybody now. When the Emperor had passed nearly all the regiments, the troops began a ceremonial march past him, 
and Rostov on Bedouin, recently purchased from Denisov, rode past too at the rear of his squadron, that is, alone and in full view of the emperor. Before he reached him, Rostov, who was a splendid horseman, spurred Bedouin twice and successfully put him to the showy trot in which the animal went when excited. Bending his foaming muzzle to his chest, his tail extended, Bedouin, as if also conscious of the emperor's eye upon him, passed splendidly, lifting his feet with a high and graceful action, as if flying through the air without touching the ground. Rostov himself, his legs well back and his stomach drawn in, and feeling himself one with his horse, rode past the emperor with a frowning but blissful face, like a very devil, as Denisov expressed it. Fine fellows, the Pavlograds, remarked the emperor. My God, how happy I should be if he ordered me to leap into the fire this instant, thought Rostov. When the review was over, the newly arrived officers, and also Kutuzovs, collected in groups and began to talk about the awards, about the Austrians and their uniforms, about their lines, about Bonaparte, and how badly the latter would fare now, especially if the Essen Corps arrived and Prussia took our side. But the talk in every group was chiefly about the Emperor Alexander. His every word and movement was described with ecstasy. They all had but one wish, to advance as soon as possible against the enemy under the Emperor's command. Commanded by the Emperor himself, they could not fail to vanquish anyone, be it whom it might. So thought Rostov and most of the officers after the review. All were then more confident of victory than the winning of two battles would have made them. Chapter 8 Boris visits Prince Andrew at Olmitz, Prince Dolgorukov. The day after the review, Boris, in his best uniform and with his comrade Berg's best wishes for success, rode to Olmutz to see Bolkonsky, wishing to profit by his friendliness and obtain for himself the best post he could, preferably that of adjutant to some important personage, a position in the army which seemed to him most attractive. It is all very well for Rostov, whose father sends him ten thousand roubles at a time, to talk about not wishing to cringe to anybody and not be anyone's lackey. But I, who have nothing but my brains, have to make a career, and must not miss opportunities, but must avail myself of them, he reflected. He did not find Prince Andrew in Olmutz that day, but the appearance of the town where the headquarters and the diplomatic corps were stationed, and the two emperors were living with their suites, households, and courts, only strengthened his desire to belong to that higher world. He knew no one, and despite his smart guardsman's uniform, all these exalted personages passing in the streets in their elegant carriages with their plumes, ribbons, and medals, both courtiers and military men, seemed so immeasurably above him an insignificant officer of the guards that they not only did not wish to, but simply could not be aware of his existence. At the quarters of the commander-in-chief, Kutuzov, where he inquired for Bolkonsky, all the adjutants and even the orderlies looked at him as if they wished to impress on him that a great many officers like him were always coming there, and that everybody was heartily sick of them. In spite of this, or rather because of it, next day, November 15th, after dinner, he again went to Olmitz, and entering the house occupied by Kutuzov, asked for Bolkonsky. Prince Andrew was in and Boris was shown into a large hall, probably formerly used for dancing, but in which five beds now stood, and furniture of various kinds, a table, chairs, and a clavichord. One adjutant nearest the door was sitting at the table in a Persian dressing gown, writing. Another, the red stout Nizvitsky, lay on a bed with his arms under his head, laughing with an officer who had sat down beside him. A third was playing a Viennese waltz on the clavichord, while a fourth, lying on the clavichord, sang the tune. Bolkonsky was not there. None of these gentlemen changed his position on seeing Boris. The one who was writing, and whom Boris addressed, turned round crossly and told him Bolkonsky was on duty, and that he should go through the door on the left into the reception room if he wished to see him. Boris thanked him and went to the reception room, where he found some ten officers and generals. When he entered, Prince Andrew, his eyes drooping contemptuously with that peculiar expression of polite weariness which plainly says, if it were not my duty I would not talk to you for a moment, 
was listening to an old Russian general with decorations who stood very erect, almost on tiptoe, with a soldier's obsequious expression on his purple face, reporting something. Very well, then, be so good as to wait, said Prince Andrew to the general in Russian, speaking with the French intonation he affected when he wished to speak contemptuously. And noticing Boris, Prince Andrew, paying no more heed to the general, who ran after him, imploring him to hear something more, nodded and turned to him with a cheerful smile. At that moment, Boris clearly realized what he had before surmised, that in the army, besides the subordination and discipline prescribed in the military code, which he and the others knew in the regiment, there was another, more important subordination, which made this tight-laced, purple-faced general wait respectfully while Captain Prince Andrew, for his own pleasure, chose to chat with Lieutenant Drubetskoy. More than ever was Boris resolved to serve in future not according to the written code, but under this unwritten law. He felt now that merely by having been recommended to Prince Andrew, he had already risen above the general who at the front had the power to annihilate him, a lieutenant of the guards. Prince Andrew came up to him and took his hand. I'm very sorry you did not find me in yesterday. I was fussing about with Germans all day. We went with Vyrota to survey the dispositions. When Germans start being accurate, there's no end to it. Boris smiled, as if he understood what Prince Andrew was alluding to as something generally known. But it was the first time he had heard Vyrota's name, or even the term dispositions. Well, my dear fellow, so you still want to be an adjutant? I've been thinking about you. Yes, I was thinking for some reason Boris could not help blushing, of asking the commander-in-chief. He has had a letter from Prince Kuragin about me. I only wanted to ask because I fear the guards won't be in action, he added as if in apology. All right, all right, we'll talk it over, replied Prince Andrew. Only let me report this gentleman's business, and I shall be at your disposal. While Prince Andrew went to report about the purple-faced general, that gentleman, evidently not sharing Boris's conception of the advantages of the unwritten code of subordination, looked so fixedly at the presumptuous lieutenant who had prevented his finishing what he had to say to the adjutant that Boris felt uncomfortable. He turned away and waited impatiently for Prince Andrew's return from the commander-in-chief's room. "'You see, my dear fellow, I've been thinking about you.' said Prince Andrew, when they had gone into the large room where the clavichord was. It's no use your going to the commander-in-chief. He would say a lot of pleasant things, ask you to dinner. That would not be bad as regards the unwritten code, thought Boris. But nothing more would come of it. There will soon be a battalion of us aides de camp and adjutants. But this is what we'll do. I have a good friend, an adjutant-general, and an excellent fellow, Prince Dolgorukov. And though you may not know it, the fact is that now Kutuzov with his staff and all of us count for nothing. Everything is now centered round the Emperor. So we will go to Dolgorukov. I have to go there anyhow, and I've already spoken to him about you. We shall see whether he cannot attach you to himself or find a place for you somewhere nearer the sun. Prince Andrew always became specially keen when he had to guide a young man and help him to worldly success. Under cover of obtaining help of this kind for another, which from pride he would never accept for himself, he kept in touch with the circle which confers success and which attracted him. He very readily took up Boris's cause and went with him to Dolgorukov. It was late in the evening when they entered the palace at Olmitz, occupied by the emperors and their retinues. That same day, a council of war had been held, in which all the members of the Hofkriegsrat and both emperors took part. At that council, contrary to the views of the old generals Kutuzov and Prince Schwarzenberg, it had been decided to advance immediately and give battle to Bonaparte. The council of war was just over when Prince Andrew, accompanied by Boris, arrived at the palace to find Dolgorukov. Everyone at headquarters was still under the spell of the day's council at which the party of the young had triumphed. The voices of those who counseled delay and advised waiting for something else before advancing had been so completely silenced, and their arguments confuted by such conclusive evidence of the advantages of attacking, that what had been discussed at the council, the coming battle and the victory that would certainly result from it, 
no longer seemed to be in the future, but in the past. All the advantages were on our side. Our enormous forces, undoubtedly superior to Napoleon's, were concentrated in one place. The troops inspired by the Emperor's presence were eager for action. The strategic position where the operations would take place was familiar in all its details to the Austrian General Weirother. A lucky accident had ordained that the Austrian army should manoeuvre the previous year on the very fields where the French had now to be fought. The adjacent locality was known and shown in every detail on the maps, and Bonaparte, evidently weakened, was undertaking nothing. Dolgorukov, one of the warmest advocates of an attack, had just returned from the council, tired and exhausted, but eager and proud of the victory that had been gained. Prince Andrew introduced his protégé, but Prince Dolgorukov, politely and firmly pressing his hand, said nothing to Boris, and evidently unable to suppress the thoughts which were uppermost in his mind at that moment, addressed Prince Andrew in French. Ah, my dear fellow, what a battle we have gained! God grant that the one that will result from it will be as victorious. However, my dear fellow, he said abruptly and eagerly, I must confess to having been unjust to the Austrians, and especially to Weirota. What exactitude, what minuteness, what knowledge of the locality, what foresight for every eventuality, every possibility, even to the smallest detail. No, my dear fellow, no conditions better than our present ones could have been devised. This combination of Austrian precision with Russian valour, what more could be wished for? So the attack is definitely resolved on, Polkonsky asked Dolgorukov. And do you know, my dear fellow, it seems to me that Bonaparte has decidedly lost his bearings. You know that a letter was received from him today for the Emperor. Dolgorukov smiled significantly. Is that so? And what did he say? inquired Bolkonsky. What can he say? Tradiridira and so on, merely to gain time. I tell you, he's in our hands, that's certain. But what was most amusing, he continued with a sudden good-natured laugh, was that we could not think how to address the reply, if not as consul, and of course not as emperor, it seemed to me it should be to General Bonaparte. But between not recognizing him as emperor and calling him General Bonaparte, there is a difference, remarked Bolkonsky. That's just it, interrupted Dolgorukov, quickly laughing. You know, Bilibin, he's a very clever fellow. He suggested addressing him as usurper and enemy of mankind. Dolgorukov laughed merrily. Only that, said Bolkonsky. All the same, it was Bilibin who found a suitable form for the address. He's a wise and clever fellow. What was it? To the head of the French government. Au chef du gouvernement français, said Dolgorukov with grave satisfaction. Good, wasn't it? Yes, but... He will dislike it extremely, said Bolkonsky. Oh, yes, very much. My brother knows him. He's dined with him, the present emperor, more than once in Paris, and tells me he never met a more cunning or subtle diplomatist. You know, a combination of French adroitness and Italian play-acting. Do you know the tale about him and Count Markov? Count Markov was the only man who knew how to handle him. You know the story of the handkerchief? It's delightful and the talkative Dolgorukov, turning now to Boris, now to Prince Andrew, told how Bonaparte, wishing to test Markov, our ambassador, purposely dropped a handkerchief in front of him and stood looking at Markov, probably expecting Markov to pick it up for him, and how Markov immediately dropped his own beside it and picked it up without touching Bonaparte's. Delightful, said Bolkonsky, but I've come to you, Prince, as a petitioner on behalf of this young man. You see... But before Prince Andrew could finish, an aide-de-camp came in to summon Dolgorukov to the Emperor. "'Oh, what a nuisance!' said Dolgorukov, getting up hurriedly and pressing the hands of Prince Andrew and Boris. "'You know, I should be very glad to do all in my power, both for you and for this dear young man.' Again he pressed the hand of the latter with an expression of good-natured, sincere, and animated levity. "'But, you see, another time.' Boris was excited by the thought of being so close to the higher powers as he felt himself to be at that moment. He was conscious that here he was in contact with the springs that set in motion the enormous movements of the mass of which in his regiment he felt himself a tiny, obedient, and insignificant atom. They followed Prince Dolgorukov out into the corridor and met, coming out of the door of the Emperor's room by which Dolgorukov had entered, 
a short man in civilian clothes with a clever face and sharply projecting jaw which without spoiling his face gave him a peculiar vivacity and shiftiness of expression this short man nodded to Dolgorukov as to an intimate friend and stared at Prince Andrew with cool intensity walking straight toward him and evidently expecting him to bow or to step out of his way Prince Andrew did neither a look of animosity appeared on his face and the other turned away and went down the side of the corridor. "'Who was that?' asked Boris. "'He's one of the most remarkable, but to me most unpleasant of men, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Prince Adam Chartorisky. It is such men as he who decide the fate of nations,' added Bolkonsky with a sigh that he could not suppress as they passed out of the palace. Next day the army began its campaign and up to the very Battle of Austerlitz, Boris was unable to see either Prince Andrew or Dolgorukov again, and remained for a while with the Ismailov Regiment. Chapter 9 Nicholas not in the action at Vishal. The Emperor. Nicholas's devotion to him. At dawn on the 16th of November, Denisov's squadron, in which Nicholas Rostov served, and which was in Prince Bagration's detachment, moved from the place where it had spent the night, advancing into action as arranged, and after going behind other columns for about two-thirds of a mile, was stopped on the high road. Rostov saw the Cossacks, and then the first and second squadrons of hussars and infantry battalions and artillery pass by and go forward, and then Generals Bagration and Dolgorukov ride past with their adjutants. All the fear before action which he had experienced as previously all the inner struggle to conquer that fear, all his dreams of distinguishing himself as a true hussar in this battle had been wasted. Their squadron remained in reserve, and Nicholas Rostov spent that day in a dull and wretched mood. At nine in the morning he heard firing in front and shouts of hurrah, and saw wounded being brought back, there were not many of them, and at last he saw how a whole detachment of French cavalry was brought in convoyed by a sotnya of Cossacks, a squadron of a hundred cavalrymen. Evidently, the affair was over, and, though not big, had been a successful engagement. The men and officers returning spoke of a brilliant victory, of the occupation of the town of Vishau and the capture of a whole French squadron. The day was bright and sunny after a sharp night frost, and the cheerful glitter of that autumn day was in keeping with the news of victory, which was conveyed not only by the tales of those who had taken part in it, but also by the joyful expression on the faces of soldiers, officers, generals, and adjutants as they passed Rostov going or coming. And Nicholas, who had vainly suffered all the dread that precedes a battle, and had spent that happy day in inactivity, was all the more depressed. "'Come here, Rostov! Let's drink to drown our grief!' shouted Denisov, who had settled down by the roadside with a flask and some food. The officers gathered round Denisov's canteen, eating and talking. "'There! They're bringing another!' cried one of the officers, indicating a captive French dragoon who was being brought in on foot by two Cossacks. One of them was leading by the bridle a fine large French horse he had taken from the prisoner. "'Sell us that horse!' Denisov called out to the Cossacks. "'If you like, Your Honor." The officers got up and stood round the Cossacks and their prisoner. The French dragoon was a young Alsatian who spoke French with a German accent. He was breathless with agitation, his face was red, and when he heard some French spoken he at once began speaking to the officers, addressing first one, then another. He said he would not have been taken, it was not his fault, but the corporals who had sent him to seize some horse cloths, though he had told him the Russians were there. And at every word he added, but don't hurt my little horse, and stroked the animal. It was plain that he did not quite grasp where he was. Now he excused himself for having been taken prisoner, and now, imagining himself before his own officers, insisted on his soldierly discipline and zeal in the service. He brought with him into our rear guard all the freshness of atmosphere of the French army, which was so alien to us. The Cossacks sold the horse for two gold pieces, and Rostov, being the richest of the officers, now that he had received his money, bought it. "'But don't hurt my little horse,' said the Alsatian good-naturedly to Rostov, when the animal was handed over to the hussar. 
Rostov smilingly reassured the dragoon and gave him money. Allez, allez, said the Cossack, touching the prisoner's arm to make him go on. The Emperor, the Emperor, was suddenly heard among the hussars. All began to run and bustle, and Rostov saw coming up the road behind him several riders with white plumes in their hats. In a moment everyone was in his place, waiting. Rostov did not know or remember how he ran to his place and mounted. Instantly his regret at not having been in action and his dejected mood amid people of whom he was weary had gone. Instantly every thought of himself had vanished. He was filled with happiness at his nearness to the Emperor. He felt that this nearness by itself made up to him for the day he had lost. He was happy as a lover when the longed-for moment of meeting arrives. Not daring to look round, and without looking round, he was ecstatically conscious of his approach. He felt it not only from the sound of the hoofs of the approaching cavalcade, but because as he drew near, everything grew brighter, more joyful, more significant, and more festive around him. Nearer and nearer to Rostov came that sun shedding beams of mild and majestic light around, and already he felt himself enveloped in those beams. He heard his voice, that kindly, calm, and majestic voice that was yet so simple. And as if in accord with Rostov's feeling, there was a deathly stillness amid which was heard the Emperor's voice. The Pavlograd hussars? he inquired. The reserve, sire, replied a voice, a very human one compared to that which had said the Pavlograd hussars. The Emperor drew level with Rostov and halted. Alexander's face was even more beautiful than it had been three days before at the review. It shone with such gaiety and youth, such innocent youth, that it suggested the liveliness of a fourteen-year-old boy, and yet it was the face of the majestic Emperor. Casually, while surveying the squadron, the Emperor's eyes met Rostov's and rested on them for not more than two seconds. Whether or no the Emperor understood what was going on in Rostov's soul, it seemed to Rostov that he understood everything. At any rate, his light blue eyes gazed for about two seconds into Rostov's face. A gentle, mild light poured from them. Then all at once he raised his eyebrows, abruptly touched his horse with his left foot, and galloped on. The young Emperor could not restrain his wish to be present at the battle, and in spite of the remonstrances of his courtiers, at twelve o'clock left the third column with which he had been, and galloped toward the vanguard. Before he came up with the hussars, several adjutants met him with news of the successful result of the action. This battle, which consisted in the capture of a French squadron, was represented as a brilliant victory over the French, and so the Emperor and the whole army, especially while the smoke hung over the battlefield, believed that the French had been defeated and were retreating against their will. A few minutes after the Emperor had passed, the Pavlograd division was ordered to advance. In Vishau itself, a petty German town, Rostov saw the Emperor again. In the marketplace, where there had been some rather heavy firing before the Emperor's arrival, lay several killed and wounded soldiers, whom there had not been time to move. The Emperor, surrounded by his suite of officers and courtiers, was riding a bob-tailed chestnut mare, a different one from that which he had ridden at the review and bending to one side, he gracefully held a gold lorgnette to his eyes and looked at a soldier who lay prone with blood on his uncovered head. The wounded soldier was so dirty, coarse, and revolting that his proximity to the Emperor shocked Rostov. Rostov saw how the Emperor's rather round shoulders shuddered as if a cold shiver had run down them, how his left foot began convulsively tapping the horse's side with the spur and how the well-trained horse looked round unconcerned and did not stir. An adjutant, dismounting, lifted the soldier under the arm to place him on a stretcher that had been brought. The soldier groaned. Gently, gently, can't you do it more gently, said the emperor, apparently suffering more than the dying soldier, and he rode away. Rostov saw tears filling the emperor's eyes and heard him as he was riding away say to Chartorisky, what a terrible thing war is! What a terrible thing! Quelle terrible chose que la guerre! The troops of the vanguard were stationed before Vishau within sight of the enemy's lines, which all day long had yielded ground to us at the least firing. 
The Emperor's gratitude was announced to the vanguard, rewards were promised, and the men received a double ration of vodka. The campfires crackled, and the soldiers' songs resounded even more merrily than on the previous night. Denisov celebrated his promotion to the rank of major, and Rostov, who had already drunk enough, at the end of the feast proposed the Emperor's health. Not our sovereign, the emperor, as they say at official dinners, said he, but the health of our sovereign, that good, enchanting, and great man. Let us drink to his health and to the certain defeat of the French. If we fought before, he said, not letting the French pass, as at Schoengraben, what shall we not do now when he is at the front? We will all die for him gladly, is it not so, gentlemen? Perhaps I'm not saying it right. I've drunk a great deal, but that is how I feel, and so do you too. To the health of Alexander the First! Hurrah! Hurrah! rang the enthusiastic voices of the officers. And the old cavalry captain Kirsten shouted enthusiastically, and no less sincerely than the twenty-year-old Rostov. When the officers had emptied and smashed their glasses, Kirsten filled others and in shirt sleeves and breeches went glass in hand to the soldiers' bonfires, and with his long grey moustache, his white chest showing under his open shirt, he stood in a majestic pose in the light of the campfire, waving his uplifted arm. Lads, here's to our sovereign the emperor, and victory over our enemies. Hurrah! he exclaimed in his dashing old hussar's baritone. The hussars crowded round and responded heartily with loud shouts. Late that night, when all had separated, Denisov, with his short hand, patted his favorite Rostov on the shoulder. As there's no one to fall in love with on campaign, he's fallen in love with the Tsar, he said. Denisov, don't make fun of it, cried Rostov. It is such a lofty, beautiful feeling, such a, I believe it, I believe it, friend, and I share and approve. No, you don't understand. And Rostov got up and went wandering among the campfires, dreaming of what happiness it would be to die, not in saving the emperor's life, he did not even dare to dream of that, but simply to die before his eyes. He really was in love with the Tsar and the glory of the Russian arms and the hope of future triumph. And he was not the only man to experience that feeling during those memorable days preceding the Battle of Austerlitz. Nine-tenths of the men in the Russian army were then in love, though less ecstatically, with their Tsar and the glory of the Russian arms. Chapter 10 Preparations for Action Dolgorukov's Opinion of Napoleon and of His Position Kutuzov's Depression The next day the Emperor stopped at Vishal, and Villiers, his physician, was repeatedly summoned to see him. At headquarters and among the troops nearby, the news spread that the Emperor was unwell. He ate nothing and had slept badly that night, those around him reported. The cause of this indisposition was the strong impression made on his sensitive mind by the sight of the killed and wounded. At daybreak on the 17th, a French officer who had come with a flag of truce demanding an audience with the Russian Emperor was brought into Vishal from our outposts. This officer was Sabari. The emperor had only just fallen asleep, and so Savary had to wait. At midday he was admitted to the emperor, and an hour later he rode off with Prince Dolgorukov to the advanced post of the French army. It was rumored that Savary had been sent to propose to Alexander a meeting with Napoleon. To the joy and pride of the whole army, a personal interview was refused, and instead of the sovereign, Prince Dolgorukov, the victor at Vishal, was sent with Savary to negotiate with Napoleon if Contrary to expectations, these negotiations were actuated by a real desire for peace. Toward evening, Dolgorukov came back, went straight to the Tsar, and remained alone with him for a long time. On the 18th and 19th of November, the army advanced two days' march, and the enemy's outposts, after a brief interchange of shots, retreated. In the highest army circles, from midday on the 19th, a great, excitedly bustling activity began, which lasted till the morning of the 20th, when the memorable Battle of Austerlitz was fought. Till midday on the 19th, the activity, the eager talk running to and fro and dispatching of adjutants, was confined to the Emperor's headquarters. But on the afternoon of that day, 
This activity reached Kutuzov's headquarters and the staffs of the commanders of columns. By evening, the adjutants had spread it to all ends and parts of the army, and in the night from the 19th to the 20th, the whole 80,000 allied troops rose from their bivouacs to the hum of voices, and the army swayed and started in one enormous mass six miles long. The concentrated activity which had begun at the Emperor's headquarters in the morning and had started the whole movement that followed was like the first movement of the main wheel of a large tower clock. One wheel slowly moved, another was set in motion, and a third, and wheels began to revolve faster and faster, levers and cog wheels to work, chimes to play, figures to pop out, and the hands to advance with regular motion as a result of all that activity. Just as in the mechanism of a clock, so in the mechanism of the military machine, an impulse once given leads to the final result. And just as indifferently quiescent till the moment when motion is transmitted to them are the parts of the mechanism which the impulse has not yet reached. Wheels creak on their axles as the cogs engage one another, and the revolving pulleys whir with the rapidity of their movement. But a neighboring wheel is as quiet and motionless as though it were prepared to remain so for a hundred years. But the moment comes when the lever catches it, and obeying the impulse, that wheel begins to creak and joins in the common motion, the result and aim of which are beyond its ken. Just as in a clock the result of the complicated motion of innumerable wheels and pulleys is merely a slow and regular movement of the hands which show the time, so the result of all the complicated human activities of 160,000 Russians and French, all their passions, desires, remorse, humiliations, sufferings, outbursts of pride, fear, and enthusiasm, was only the loss of the Battle of Austerlitz, the so-called Battle of the Three Emperors, that is to say, a slow movement of the hand on the dial of human history. Prince Andrew was on duty that day and in constant attendance on the commander-in-chief. At six in the evening, Kutuzov went to the emperor's headquarters and, after staying but a short time with the Tsar, went to see the Grand Marshal of the court, Count Tolstoy. Bolkonsky took the opportunity to go in to get some details of the coming action from Dolgorukov. He felt that Kutuzov was upset and dissatisfied about something and that at headquarters they were dissatisfied with him and also that at the Emperor's headquarters everyone adopted toward him the tone of men who know something others do not know. He therefore wished to speak to Dolgorukov. "'Well, how do you do, my dear fellow?' said Dolgorukov, who was sitting at tea with Bilibin. "'The fate is for tomorrow. How is your old fellow? Out of sorts?' "'I won't say he's out of sorts, but I fancy he would like to be heard.' "'But they heard him at the Council of War, and will hear him when he talks sense.' But to temporize and wait for something, now when Bonaparte fears nothing so much as a general battle, is impossible. Yes, you have seen him, said Prince Andrew. Well, what is Bonaparte like? How did he impress you? Yes, I saw him, and am convinced that he fears nothing so much as a general engagement, repeated Dolgorukov, evidently prizing this general conclusion which he had arrived at from his interview with Napoleon. If he weren't afraid of a battle... Why did he ask for that interview? Why negotiate, and above all, why retreat, when to retreat is so contrary to his method of conducting war? Believe me, he is afraid, afraid of a general battle. His hour has come. Mark my words. But tell me, what is he like, eh? said Prince Andrew again. He is a man in a grey overcoat, very anxious that I should call him Your Majesty, but who, to his chagrin, got no title from me. That's the sort of man he is, and nothing more, replied Dolgorukov, looking round at Bilibin with a smile. Despite my great respect for old Kutuzov, he continued, we should be a nice set of fellows if we were to wait about and so give him a chance to escape or to trick us, now that we certainly have him in our hands. No, we mustn't forget Zuvorov and his rule, not to put yourself in a position to be attacked, but yourself to attack. Believe me, in war, the energy of young men often shows the way better than all the experience of old conctators. Note, conctator, the delayer, 
a nickname given to Quintus Fabius Maximus Verucosus because of his cautious military tactics. But in what position are we going to attack him? I've been at the outposts today, and it is impossible to say where his chief forces are situated, said Prince Andrew. He wished to explain to Dolgorukov a plan of attack he had himself formed. Oh, that's all the same, Dolgorukov said quickly, and getting up he spread a map on the table. All eventualities have been foreseen. If he is standing before Brünn, and Prince Dolgorukov rapidly but indistinctly explained Vairota's plan of a flanking movement. Prince Andrew began to reply and to state his own plan, which might have been as good as Vairota's, but for the disadvantage that Vairota's had already been approved. As soon as Prince Andrew began to demonstrate the defects of the latter and the merits of his own plan, Prince Dolgorukov ceased to listen to him and gazed absent-mindedly not at the map, but at Prince Andrew's face. There will be a council of war at Kutuzov's tonight, though. You can say all this there, remarked Dolgorukov. I will do so, said Prince Andrew, moving away from the map. Whatever are you bothering about, gentlemen, said Bilibin, who till then had listened with an amused smile to their conversation, and now was evidently ready with a joke. Whether tomorrow brings victory or defeat, the glory of our Russian arms is secure. Except your Kutuzov, there is not a single Russian in command of a column. The commanders are Herr General Wimpfen, Le Comte de Langeron, Le Prince de Liechtenstein, Le Prince de Hohenlohe, and finally Prish Prish, and so on, like all those Polish names. Be quiet, backbiter, said Dolgorukov. It is not true. There are now two Russians, Miloradovich and Dokhturov, and there would be a third, Count Arakcheyev, if his nerves were not too weak. However, I think General Kutuzov has come out, said Prince Andrew. I wish you good luck and success, gentlemen, he added, and went out after shaking hands with Dolgorukov and Bilibin. On the way home, Prince Andrew could not refrain from asking Kutuzov, who was sitting silently beside him, what he thought of tomorrow's battle. Kutuzov looked sternly at his adjutant, and after a pause replied, I think the battle will be lost. And so I told Count Tolstoy, and asked him to tell the Emperor. What do you think he replied? But, my dear general, I am engaged with rice and cutlets. Look after military matters yourself. Yes, that was the answer I got. Chapter 11 The Council of War Vairota's Plans Kutuzov Sleeps Prince Andrew's Reflection Shortly after nine o'clock that evening, Vairota drove with his plans to Kutuzov's quarters where the Council of War was to be held. All the commanders of columns were summoned to the commander-in-chiefs, and with the exception of Prince Bagration, who declined to come, were all there at the appointed time. Vaidota, who was in full control of the proposed battle, by his eagerness and briskness presented a marked contrast to the dissatisfied and drowsy Kutuzov, who reluctantly played the part of chairman and president of the Council of War. Vaidota evidently felt himself to be at the head of a movement that had already become unrestrainable, he was like a horse running downhill harnessed to a heavy cart. Whether he was pulling it or being pushed by it, he did not know, but rushed along at headlong speed with no time to consider what this movement might lead to. Vaidota had been twice that evening to the enemy's picket line to reconnoitre personally, and twice to the emperors, Russian and Austrian, to report and explain, and to his headquarters, where he had dictated the dispositions in German, and now, much exhausted, he arrived at Kutuzov's. He was evidently so busy that he even forgot to be polite to the commander-in-chief. He interrupted him, talked rapidly and indistinctly without looking at the man he was addressing, and did not reply to questions put to him. He was bespattered with mud and had a pitiful, weary and distracted air, though at the same time he was haughty and self-confident. Kutuzov was occupying a nobleman's castle of modest dimensions near Ostralitz, in the large drawing-room, which had become the Commander-in-Chief's office, were gathered Kutuzov himself, Vairota, and the members of the Council of War. They were drinking tea and only awaited Prince Bagration to begin the Council. At last Bagration's orderly came with the news that the Prince could not attend. Prince Andrew came in to inform the Commander-in-Chief of this, and availing himself of permission previously given him by Kutuzov to be present at the Council, 
he remained in the room. Since Prince Bagration is not coming, we may begin, said Bayrota, hurriedly rising from his seat and going up to the table on which an enormous map of the environs of Brünn was spread out. Kutuzov, with his uniform unbuttoned, so that his fat neck bulged over his collar as if escaping, was sitting almost asleep in a low chair with his podgy old hands resting symmetrically on its arms. At the sound of Vairota's voice, he opened his one eye with an effort. Yes, yes, if you please. It is already late, said he. And nodding his head, he let it droop and again closed his eye. If at first the members of the council thought that Kutuzov was pretending to sleep, the sounds his nose emitted during the reading that followed proved that the commander-in-chief at that moment was absorbed by a far more serious matter than a desire to show his contempt for the dispositions or anything else. He was engaged in satisfying the irresistible human need for sleep. He really was asleep. Vairota, with the gesture of a man too busy to lose a moment, glanced at Kutuzov, and having convinced himself that he was asleep, took up a paper and in a loud, monotonous voice began to read out the dispositions for the impending battle, under a heading which he also read out. Dispositions for an attack on the enemy position behind Kobelnitz and Sokolnitz, November 30th, 1805. Note, Weirota was reading in German and employed the new style calendar, so that these dispositions were drawn up on November 18th, old style. The dispositions were very complicated and difficult. They began as follows. As the enemy's left wing rests on wooded hills and his right extends along Kobelnitz and Sokolnitz behind the ponds that are there, while we, on the other hand, with our left wing by far outflank his right, it is advantageous to attack the enemy's latter wing, especially if we occupy the villages of Sokolnitz and Kobelnitz, whereby we can both fall on his flank and pursue him over the plain between Schlapanitz and the Turasa forest, avoiding the defiles of Schlapanitz and Belovitz, which cover the enemy's front. For this object, it is necessary that the first column marches, the second column marches, the third column marches, and so on, read Vaidota. The generals seemed to listen reluctantly to the difficult dispositions. The tall, fair-haired General Buxherbden stood leaning his back against the wall, his eyes fixed on a burning candle, and seemed not to listen or even to wish to be thought to listen. Exactly opposite Vairota, with his glistening wide-open eyes fixed upon him and his moustache twisted upwards, sat the ruddy Miloradovich in a military pose, his elbows turned outwards, his hands on his knees, and his shoulders raised. He remained stubbornly silent, gazing at Vairota's face, and only turned away his eyes when the Austrian chief of staff finished reading. Then Miloradovich looked round significantly at the other generals, but one could not tell from that significant look whether he agreed or disagreed, and was satisfied or not with the arrangements. Next to Vairota sat Count Langeron, who, with a subtle smile that never left his typically southern French face during the whole time of the reading, gazed at his delicate fingers, which rapidly twirled by its corners a gold snuff-box, on which was a portrait. In the middle of one of the longest sentences, he stopped the rotary motion of the snuff-box, raised his head, and, with inimical politeness lurking in the corners of his thin lips, interrupted Vairota, wishing to say something. But the Austrian general, continuing to read, frowned angrily, and jerked his elbows as if to say, you can tell me your views later, but now be so good as to look at the map and listen. Langeron lifted his eyes with an expression of perplexity, turned round to Miloradovich as if seeking an explanation, but meeting the latter's impressive but meaningless gaze, drooped his eyes sadly and again took to twirling his snuff-box. A geography lesson, he muttered as if to himself, but loud enough to be heard. Przebyszewski, with respectful but dignified politeness, held his hand to his ear toward Vairota with the air of a man absorbed in attention. Dokhturov, a little man, sat opposite Vairota with an assiduous and modest mien, and, stooping over the outspread map, conscientiously studied the dispositions and the unfamiliar locality. He asked Vairota several times to repeat words he had not clearly heard and the difficult names of villages. 
Weirother complied, and Dochturov noted them down. When the reading, which lasted more than an hour, was over, Langeron again brought his snuff-box to rest, and without looking at Weirother or at anyone in particular, began to say how difficult it was to carry out such a plan in which the enemy's position was assumed to be known, whereas it was perhaps not known, since the enemy was in movement. Langeron's objections were valid, but it was obvious that their chief aim was to show General Weirother, who had read his dispositions with as much self-confidence as if he were addressing schoolchildren, that he had to do not with fools, but with men who could teach him something in military matters. When the monotonous sound of Bairota's voice ceased, Kutuzov opened his eye as a miller wakes up when the soporific drone of the mill-wheel is interrupted. He listened to what Langeron said as if remarking, So you are still at that silly business, quickly closed his eye again and let his head sink still lower. Langeron, trying as virulently as possible to sting Bairota's vanity as author of the military plan, argued that Bonaparte might easily attack instead of being attacked, and so render the whole of this plan perfectly worthless. Weirota met all objections with a firm and contemptuous smile, evidently prepared beforehand to meet all objections, be they what they might. If he could attack us, he would have done so today, said he. So you think he is powerless? said Langeron. He has forty thousand men at most, replied Weirota, with the smile of a doctor to whom an old wife wishes to explain the treatment of a case. In that case he is inviting his doom by awaiting our attack, said Langeron, with a subtly ironical smile, again glancing round for support to Miloradovich, who was near him. But Miloradovich was at that moment evidently thinking of anything rather than of what the generals were disputing about. Ma foi, said he, tomorrow we shall see all that on the battlefield. Weirota again gave that smile which seemed to say that to him it was strange and ridiculous to meet objections from Russian generals and to have to prove to them what he had not merely convinced himself of, but had also convinced the sovereign emperors of. "'The enemy has quenched his fires, and a continual noise is heard from his camp,' said he. "'What does that mean? Either he is retreating, which is the only thing we need fear, or he is changing his position.' He smiled ironically. But even if he also took up a position in the Turassa, he merely saves us a great deal of trouble, and all our arrangements to the minutest detail remain the same. How is that? began Prince Andrew, who had for long been waiting an opportunity to express his doubts. Kutuzov here woke up, coughed heavily, and looked round at the generals. Gentlemen, the dispositions for tomorrow or rather for today, for it is past midnight, cannot now be altered, said he. You have heard them, and we shall all do our duty. But before a battle there is nothing more important, he paused, than to have a good sleep. He moved as if to rise. The generals bowed and retired. It was past midnight. Prince Andrew went out. The council of war, at which Prince Andrew had not been able to express his opinion as he had hoped to, left on him a vague and uneasy impression. Whether Dolgorukov and Bayrota or Kutuzov, Langeron and the others who did not approve of the plan of attack were right, he did not know. But was it really not possible for Kutuzov to state his views plainly to the Emperor? Is it possible that on account of court and personal considerations tens of thousands of lives, and my life, my life, he thought, must be risked. Yes, it is very likely that I shall be killed tomorrow, he thought. And suddenly, at this thought of death, a whole series of most distant, most intimate memories rose in his imagination. He remembered his last parting from his father and his wife. He remembered the days when he first loved her. He thought of her pregnancy and felt sorry for her and for himself, and in a nervously emotional and softened mood he went out of the hut in which he was billeted with Nizvitsky and began to walk up and down before it. The night was foggy, and through the fog the moonlight gleamed mysteriously. Yes, tomorrow, tomorrow, he thought. 
Tomorrow everything may be over for me. All these memories will be no more. None of them will have any meaning for me. Tomorrow, perhaps, even certainly, I have a presentiment that for the first time I shall have to show all I can do. And his fancy pictured the battle, its loss, the concentration of fighting at one point, and the hesitation of all the commanders. And then that happy moment, that Toulon, for which he had so long waited, presents itself to him at last. He firmly and clearly expresses his opinion to Kutuzov, to Vairota, and to the emperors. All are struck by the justness of his views, but no one undertakes to carry them out, so he takes a regiment, a division, stipulates that no one is to interfere with his arrangements, leads his division to the decisive point, and gains the victory alone. But death and suffering, suggested another voice. Prince Andrew, however, did not answer that voice, and went on dreaming of his triumphs. The dispositions for the next battle are planned by him alone. Nominally, he is only an adjutant on Kutuzov's staff, but he does everything alone. The next battle is won by him alone. Kutuzov is removed, and he is appointed. Well, and then? asked the other voice. If before that you are not ten times wounded, killed, or betrayed, well, what then? Well, then, Prince Andrew answered himself, I don't know what will happen and don't want to know and can't. But if I want this, want glory, want to be known to men, want to be loved by them, it is not my fault that I want it and want nothing but that and live only for that. Yes, for that alone. I shall never tell anyone. But, oh God, what am I to do if I love nothing but fame and men's esteem? Death, wounds, the loss of family, I fear nothing. And precious and dear as many persons are to me, father, sister, wife, those dearest to me, yet dreadful and unnatural as it seems, I would give them all at once for a moment of glory, of triumph over men, of love from men I don't know and never shall know. For the love of these men here, he thought, as he listened to voices in Kutuzov's courtyard. The voices were those of the orderlies who were packing up. One voice, probably a coachman's, was teasing Kutuzov's old cook, whom Prince Andrew knew and who was called Tit. He was saying, Tit, I say, Tit. Well, returned the old man, go, Tit, thresh a bit, said the wag. Oh, go to the devil, called out a voice, drowned by the laughter of the orderlies and servants. All the same, I love and value nothing but triumph over them all. I value this mystic power and glory that is floating here above me in this mist. Chapter 12 Rostov at the Front Visit of Bagration and Dolgorukov Rostov sent to reconnoitre Napoleon's proclamation That same night, Rostov was with a platoon on skirmishing duty in front of Bagration's detachment. His hussars were placed along the line in couples, and he himself rode along the line trying to master the sleepiness that kept coming over him. An enormous space with our army's campfires dimly glowing in the fog could be seen behind him. In front of him was misty darkness. Rostov could see nothing, peer as he would into that foggy distance. Now something gleamed grey, now there was something black, now little light seemed to glimmer where the enemy ought to be. Now he fancied it was only something in his own eyes. His eyes kept closing, and in his fancy appeared now the Emperor, now Denisov, and now Moscow memories. And he again hurriedly opened his eyes and saw close before him the head and ears of the horse he was riding and sometimes, when he came within six paces of them, the black figures of hussars. But in the distance was still the same misty darkness. Why not? It might easily happen, thought Rostov, that the emperor will meet me and give me an order, as he would to any other officer. He'll say, go and find out what's there. There are many stories of his getting to know an officer in just such a chance way and attaching him to himself. What if he gave me a place near him? 
Oh, how I would guard him, how I would tell him the truth, how I would unmask his deceivers. And in order to realize vividly his love and devotion to the sovereign, Rostov pictured to himself an enemy or a deceitful German whom he would not only kill with pleasure, but whom he would slap in the face before the emperor. Suddenly, a distant shout aroused him. He started and opened his eyes. Where am I? Oh, yes, in the skirmishing line. Pass and watchword, Shaft Olmutz. What a nuisance that our squadron will be in reserve tomorrow, he thought. I'll ask leave to go to the front. This may be my only chance of seeing the Emperor. It won't be long now before I'm off duty. I'll take another turn, and when I get back I'll go to the General and ask him. He readjusted himself in the saddle and touched up his horse to ride once more round his hussars. It seemed to him that it was getting lighter. To the left he saw a sloping descent lit up, and facing it a black knoll that seemed as steep as a wall. On this knoll there was a white patch that Rostov could not at all make out. Was it a glade in the wood lit up by the moon, or some unmelted snow, or some white houses? He even thought something moved on that white spot. I expect it's snow. That spot, a spot in Tash, he thought. There now, it's not a Tash. Natasha, sister, black eyes. Natasha. Won't you be surprised when I tell her how I've seen the Emperor? Natasha, take my sabre, Tash. Keep to your right, Your Honor. There are bushes here, came the voice of an Ozar, past whom Rostov was riding in the act of falling asleep. Rostov lifted his head that had sunk almost to his horse's mane and pulled up beside the Ozar. He was succumbing to irresistible, youthful, childish drowsiness. But what was I thinking? I mustn't forget. How shall I speak to the Emperor? No, no, that's not it. That's tomorrow. Oh, yes, Natasha, saber Tash. Saber them. Whom? The hussars. Ah, the hussars with moustaches. Along the Tverskaya street rode the hussar with moustaches. I thought about him, too, just opposite Guryev's house. Oh, Guryev. Oh, but Denisov's a fine fellow... But that's all nonsense. The chief thing is that the Emperor is here. How he looked at me and wished to say something, but dared not. No, it was I who dared not. But that's nonsense. The chief thing is not to forget the important thing I was thinking of. Yes. Natasha. Say, Natasha. Oh, yes, yes, that's right. And his head once more sank to his horse's neck. All at once it seemed to him that he was being fired at. What? 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 Cut them down! What? what? said Rostov, waking up. At the moment he opened his eyes, he heard in front of him where the enemy was the long-drawn shouts of thousands of voices. His horse and the horse of the hussar near him pricked their ears at these shouts. Over there where the shouting came from, a fire flared up and went out again, then another. And all along the French line on the hill, fires flared up and the shouting grew louder and louder. Rostov could hear the sound of French words, but could not distinguish them. The din of many voices was too great. All he could hear was, Ah! and Rrrr! What's that? What do you make of it? said Rostov to the hussar beside him. That must be the enemy's camp. The hussar did not reply. Why, don't you hear it? Rostov asked again, after waiting for a reply. "'Who can tell, Your Honor? replied the hussar reluctantly. "'From the direction it must be the enemy,' repeated Rostov. "'It may be he, or it may be nothing,' muttered the hussar. "'It's dark. Steady,' he cried to his fidgeting horse. Rostov's horse was also getting restive. It poured the frozen ground, pricking its ears at the noise and looking at the lights. The shouting grew still louder, and merged into a general roar that only an army of several thousand men could produce. 
The lights spread farther and farther, probably along the line of the French camp. Rostov no longer wanted to sleep. The gay, triumphant shouting of the enemy army had a stimulating effect on him. Vive l'Empereur! L'Empereur! he now heard distinctly. They can't be far off. Probably just beyond the stream, he said to the hussar beside him. The hussar only sighed without replying and coughed angrily. The sound of horses' hoofs approaching at a trot along the line of hussars was heard, and out of the foggy darkness the figure of a sergeant of hussars suddenly appeared, looming huge as an elephant. "'Your Honour, the generals,' said the sergeant, riding up to Rostov. Rostov, still looking round toward the fires and the shouts, rode with the sergeant to meet some mounted men who were riding along the line. One was on a white horse. Prince Bagration and Prince Dolgorukov, with their adjutants, had come to witness the curious phenomenon of the lights and shouts in the enemy's camp. Rostov rode up to Bagration, reported to him, and then joined the adjutants, listening to what the generals were saying. "'Believe me,' said Prince Dolgorukov, addressing Bagration, "'it is nothing but a trick. He has retreated and ordered the rear guard to kindle fires and make a noise to deceive us.' "'Hardly,' said Bagration. I saw them this evening on that knoll. If they had retreated, they would have withdrawn from that, too. Officer, said Bagration to Rostov, are the enemy's skirmishers still there? They were there this evening, but now I don't know, Your Excellency. Shall I go with some of my hussars to see? replied Rostov. Bagration stopped, and before replying tried to see Rostov's face in the mist. Well, go and see, he said after a pause. Yes, sir. Rostov spurred his horse, called to Sergeant Fyedchenko and two other hussars, told them to follow him, and trotted downhill in the direction from which the shouting came. He felt both frightened and pleased to be riding alone with three hussars into that mysterious and dangerous misty distance where no one had been before him. Bagration called to him from the hill not to go beyond the stream, but Rostov pretended not to hear him, and did not stop, but rode on and on, continually mistaking bushes for trees and gullies for men, and continually discovering his mistakes. Stakes. 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 Having descended the hill at a trot, he no longer saw either our own or the enemy's fires, but heard the shouting of the French more loudly and distinctly. In the valley he saw before him something like a river, but when he reached it he found it was a road. Having come out onto the road, he reined in his horse, hesitating whether to ride along it or cross it and ride over the black field up the hillside. To keep to the road, which gleamed white in the mist, would have been safer because it would be easier to see people coming along it. Follow me, said he, crossed the road, and began riding up the hill at a gallop toward the point where the French pickets had been standing that evening. "'Your Honour, there he is!' cried one of the hussars behind him. And before Rostov had time to make out what the black thing was that had suddenly appeared in the fog, there was a flash followed by a report, and a bullet whizzing high up in the mist with a plaintive sound passed out of hearing. Another musket missed fire but flashed in the pan. Rostov turned his horse and galloped back. Four more reports followed at intervals, and the bullets passed somewhere in the fog, singing in different tones. Rostov reined in his horse, whose spirits had risen like his own at the firing, and went back at a foot pace. "'Well, some more! Some more!' a merry voice was saying in his soul. But no more shots came. Only when approaching Bagration did Rostov let his horse gallop again, and with his hand at the salute rode up to the general. Dolgorukov was still insisting that the French had retreated and had only lit fires to deceive us. What does that prove, he was saying as Rostov rode up. They might retreat and leave the pickets. It's plain that they have not all gone yet, Prince, said Bagration. Wait till tomorrow morning. We'll find out everything tomorrow. The picket is still on the hill, Your Excellency, just where it was in the evening, reported Rostov, stooping forward with his hand at the salute and unable to repress the smile of delight induced by his ride and especially by the sound of the bullets. Very good, very good, said Bagration. Thank you, officer. Your Excellency, said Rostov, may I ask a favour? What is it? Tomorrow our squadron is to be in reserve. May I ask to be attached to the first squadron? 
What's your name? Count Rostov. Oh, very well. You may stay in attendance on me. Count Ilya Rostov's son? asked Dolgorukov. But Rostov did not reply. Then I may reckon on it, Your Excellency? I will give the order. Tomorrow, very likely, I may be sent with some message to the Emperor, thought Rostov. Thank God! The fires and shouting in the enemy's army were occasioned by the fact that while Napoleon's proclamation was being read to the troops, the Emperor himself rode round his bivouacs. The soldiers, on seeing him, lit wisps of straw and ran after him shouting, Vive l'Empereur! Napoleon's proclamation was as follows. Soldiers, the Russian army is advancing against you to avenge the Austrian army of Ulm. They are the same battalions you broke at Hollabrünn and have pursued ever since to this place. The position we occupy is a strong one, and while they are marching to go round me on the right, they will expose a flank to me. Soldiers, I will myself direct your battalions. I will keep out of fire if you with your habitual valour carry disorder and confusion into the enemy's ranks, but should victory be in doubt, even for a moment, you will see your emperor exposing himself to the first blows of the enemy. For there must be no doubt of victory, especially on this day, when what is at stake is the honour of the French infantry, so necessary to the honour of our nation. Do not break your ranks on the plea of removing the wounded. Let every man be fully imbued with the thought that we must defeat these hirelings of England, inspired by such hatred of our nation. This victory will conclude our campaign, and we can return to winter quarters where fresh French troops who are being raised in France will join us. And the peace I shall conclude will be worthy of my people, of you, and of myself. Napoleon. Chapter 13. Battle of Austerlitz. Prince Andrew badly wounded. At five in the morning it was still quite dark. The troops of the center, the reserves, and Bagration's right flank had not yet moved, but on the left flank the columns of infantry, cavalry, and artillery, which were to be the first to descend the heights to attack the French right flank and drive it into the Bohemian mountains according to plan, were already up and astir. The smoke of the campfires, into which they were throwing everything superfluous, made the eyes smart. It was cold and dark. The officers were hurriedly drinking tea and breakfasting, the soldiers munching biscuit and beating a tattoo with their feet to warm themselves, gathering round the fires, throwing into the flames the remains of sheds, chairs, tables, wheels, tubs, and everything that they did not want or could not carry away with them. Austrian column guides were moving in and out among the Russian troops and served as heralds of the advance. As soon as an Austrian officer showed himself near a commanding officer's quarters, the regiment began to move. The soldiers ran from the fires, thrust their pipes into their boots, their bags into the carts, got their muskets ready, and formed rank. The officers buttoned up their coats, buckled on their swords and pouches, and moved along the ranks, shouting. The train drivers and orderlies harnessed and packed the wagons and tied on the loads. The adjutants and battalion and regimental commanders mounted, crossed themselves, gave final instructions, orders, and commissions to the baggage men who remained behind, and the monotonous tramp of thousands of feet resounded. The column moved forward without knowing where, and unable from the masses around them, the smoke and the increasing fog, to see either the place they were leaving or that to which they were going. A soldier on the march is hemmed in and borne along by his regiment as much as a sailor is by his ship. However far he has walked, whatever strange, unknown, and dangerous places he reaches, just as a sailor is always surrounded by the same decks, masts, and rigging of his ship, so the soldier always has around him the same comrades, the same ranks, the same Sergeant Major Ivan Mitrich, the same company dog Jack, and the same commanders. The sailor rarely cares to know the latitude in which his ship is sailing, but on the day of battle, heaven knows how and whence, a stern note of which all are conscious sounds in the moral atmosphere of an army, announcing the approach of something decisive and solemn, and awakening in the men an unusual curiosity. On the day of battle, 
The soldiers excitedly tried to get beyond the interests of their regiment. They listen intently, look about, and eagerly ask concerning what is going on around them. The fog had grown so dense that, though it was growing light, they could not see ten paces ahead. Bushes looked like gigantic trees, and level ground like cliffs and slopes. Anywhere on any side one might encounter an enemy invisible ten paces off. But the columns advanced for a long time, always in the same fog, descending and ascending hills, avoiding gardens and enclosures, going over new and unknown ground, and nowhere encountering the enemy. On the contrary, the soldiers became aware that in front, behind, and on all sides, other Russian columns were moving in the same direction. Every soldier felt glad to know that to the unknown place where he was going, many more of our men were going too. There now, the Kurskis have also gone past, was being said in the ranks. It's wonderful what a lot of our troops have gathered, lads. Last night I looked at the campfires and there was no end of them. A regular Moscow. Though none of the column commanders rode up to the ranks or talked to the men. The commanders, as we saw at the Council of War, were out of humor and dissatisfied with the affair, and so did not exert themselves to cheer the men, but merely carried out the orders. Yet the troops marched gaily, as they always do when going into action, especially to an attack. But when they had marched for about an hour in the dense fog, the greater part of the men had to halt, and an unpleasant consciousness of some dislocation and blunder spread through the ranks. How such a consciousness is communicated is very difficult to define, but it certainly is communicated very surely and flows rapidly, imperceptibly, and irrepressibly, as water does in a creek. Had the Russian army been alone, without any allies, it might perhaps have been a long time before this consciousness of mismanagement became a general conviction. But as it was, the disorder was readily and naturally attributed to the stupid Germans, and everyone was convinced that a dangerous muddle had been occasioned by the sausage eaters. Note, to a Russian soldier, the Austrians, as well as non-Russian speakers generally, were all Germans. The word German, Niemitz in Russian, means a dumb man one who cannot speak so that we can understand him. Why have we stopped? Is the way blocked? Or have we already come up against the French? No, one can't hear them. They'd be firing if we had. They were in a hurry enough to start us, and now here we stand in the middle of a field without rhyme or reason. It's all those damn Germans muddling. What stupid devils. Yes, I'd send them out on in front. But no fear, they're crowding up behind. And now here we stand hungry. I say, uh, shall we soon be clear? They say the cavalry are blocking the way, said an officer. Ah, those damned Germans, they don't know their own country, said another. What division are you? shouted an adjutant riding up. The 18th. And why are you here? You should have gone on long ago. Now you won't get there till evening. What stupid orders. They don't themselves know what they're doing, said the officer and rode off. Then a general rode past, shouting something angrily, not in Russian. Tafa lafa, but what he's jabbering no one can make out, said a soldier, mimicking the general who had ridden away. I'd shoot them, the scoundrels. We were ordered to be at the place before nine, but we haven't got halfway. Fine orders, was being repeated on different sides. And the feeling of energy with which the troops had started began to turn into vexation and anger at the stupid arrangements and at the Germans. The cause of the confusion was that while the Austrian cavalry was moving toward our left flank, the higher command found that our center was too far separated from our right flank, and the cavalry were all ordered to turn back to the right. Several thousand cavalry crossed in front of the infantry who had to wait. At the front, an altercation occurred between an Austrian guide and a Russian general. The general shouted a demand that the cavalry should be halted, the Austrian argued that not he, but the higher command was to blame. The troops, meanwhile, stood, growing listless and dispirited. After an hour's delay, they at last moved on, descending the hill. The fog that was dispersing on the hill lay still more densely below where they were descending. In front, in the fog, a shot was heard, and then another. 
at first irregularly at varying intervals. And then more and more regularly and rapidly, and the action at the Goldbach stream began. Not expecting to come on the enemy down by the stream, and having stumbled on him in the fog, hearing no encouraging word from their commanders, and with a consciousness of being too late spreading through the ranks, and above all being unable to see anything in front or around them in the thick fog, the Russians exchanged shots with the enemy lazily, and advanced, and again halted, receiving no timely orders from the officers or adjutants who wandered about in the fog, in those unknown surroundings, unable to find their own regiments. In this way the action began for the first, second, and third columns which had gone down into the valley. The fourth column, with which Kutuzov was, stood on the Prats and Heights. Below, where the fight was beginning, there was still thick fog. On the higher ground it was clearing, but nothing could be seen of what was going on in front. Whether all the enemy forces were, as we supposed, six miles away, or whether they were nearby in that sea of mist, no one knew till after eight o'clock. It was nine o'clock in the morning. The fog lay unbroken like a sea down below, but higher up at the village of Schlapanitz, where Napoleon stood with his marshals around him, it was quite light. Above him was a clear blue sky, and the sun's vast orb quivered like a huge hollow crimson float on the surface of that milky sea of mist. The whole French army, and even Napoleon himself with his staff, were not on the far side of the streams and hollows of Sokolnitz and Schlapanitz, beyond which we intended to take up our position and begin the action, but were on this side, so close to our own forces, that Napoleon with the naked eye could distinguish a mounted man from one on foot. Napoleon, in the blue cloak which he had worn on his Italian campaign, sat on his small grey Arab horse a little in front of his marshals. He gazed silently at the hills which seemed to rise out of the sea of mist, and on which the Russian troops were moving in the distance, and he listened to the sounds of firing in the valley. Not a single muscle of his face, which in those days was still thin, moved. His gleaming eyes were fixed intently on one spot. His predictions were being justified. Part of the Russian force had already descended into the valley toward the ponds and lakes, and part were leaving these prats and heights which he intended to attack, and regarded as the key to the position. He saw over the mist that in a hollow between two hills near the village of Pratzen, the Russian columns, their bayonets glittering, were moving continuously in one direction toward the valley and disappearing one after another into the mist. From information he had received the evening before, from the sound of wheels and footsteps heard by the outposts during the night, by the disorderly movement of the Russian columns, and from all indications, he saw clearly that the Allies believed him to be far away in front of them and that the columns moving near Pratzen constituted the center of the Russian army, and that that center was already sufficiently weakened to be successfully attacked. But still he did not begin the engagement. Today was a great day for him, the anniversary of his coronation. Before dawn he had slept for a few hours, and, refreshed, vigorous, and in good spirits, he mounted his horse and rode out into the field in that happy mood in which everything seems possible and everything succeeds. He sat motionless, looking at the heights visible above the mist, and his cold face wore that special look of confident, self-complacent happiness that one sees on the face of a boy happily in love. The marshals stood behind him, not venturing to distract his attention. He looked now at the Pratzen Heights, now at the sun floating up out of the mist. When the sun had entirely emerged from the fog, and fields and mist were aglow with dazzling light, as if he had only awaited this to begin the action, he drew the glove from his shapely white hand, made a sign with it to the marshals, and ordered the action to begin. The marshals, accompanied by adjutants, galloped off in different directions, and a few minutes later the chief forces of the French army moved rapidly toward those Pratzen Heights which were being more and more denuded by Russian troops moving down the valley to their left. At eight o'clock, Kutuzov rode to Pratzen at the head of the fourth column, Miloradovich's, 
the one that was to take the place of Chebyshevsky's and Langeron's columns, which had already gone down into the valley. He greeted the men of the foremost regiment and gave them the order to march, thereby indicating that he intended to lead that column himself. When he had reached the village of Pratzen, he halted. Prince Andrew was behind among the immense number forming the commander-in-chief's suite. He was in a state of suppressed excitement and irritation, though controlledly calm, as a man is at the approach of a long-awaited moment. He was firmly convinced that this was the day of his Doulon, or his Bridge of Arcola. How it would come about he did not know, but he felt sure it would do so. The locality and the position of our troops were known to him as far as they could be known to anyone in our army. His own strategic plan, which obviously could not now be carried out, was forgotten. Now, entering into Bayrota's plan, Prince Andrew considered possible contingencies and formed new projects, such as might call for his rapidity of perception and decision. To the left, down below in the mist, the musketry fire of unseen forces could be heard. It was there Prince Andrew thought the fight would concentrate. There we shall encounter difficulties. And there, thought he, there I shall be sent with a brigade or division. And there, standard in hand, I shall go forward and break whatever is in front of me. He could not look calmly at the standards of the passing battalions. Seeing them, he kept thinking, that may be the very standard with which I shall lead the army. In the morning, all that was left of the night mist on the heights was a hoar-frost now turning to dew. But in the valleys it still lay like a milk-white sea. Nothing was visible in the valley to the left into which our troops had descended and from whence came the sounds of firing. Above the heights was the dark, clear sky, and to the right the vast orb of the sun. In front, far off on the farther shore of that sea of mist, some wooded hills were discernible, and it was there the enemy probably was, for something could be descried. On the right, the guards were entering the misty region with a sound of hoofs and wheels, and now and then a gleam of bayonets. To the left, beyond the village, similar masses of cavalry came up and disappeared in the sea of mist. In front and behind moved infantry. The commander-in-chief was standing at the end of the village, letting the troops pass by him. That morning Kutuzov seemed worn and irritable. The infantry passing before him came to a halt without any command being given, apparently obstructed by something in front. "'Do order them to form into battalion columns and go round the village,' he said angrily to a general who had ridden up. "'Don't you understand, Your Excellency, my dear sir, that you must not defile through narrow village streets when we are marching against the enemy?' I intended to reform them beyond the village, Your Excellency, answered the general. Kutuzov laughed bitterly. You'll make a fine thing of it, deploying in sight of the enemy. Very fine. The enemy is still far away, Your Excellency. According to the dispositions... The dispositions, exclaimed Kutuzov bitterly. Who told you that? Kindly do as you're ordered. Yes, sir. My dear fellow, Nizvitsky whispered to Prince Andrew, the old man is as surly as a dog. An Austrian officer in a white uniform with green plumes in his hat galloped up to Kutuzov and asked in the Emperor's name had the fourth column advanced into action. Kutuzov turned round without answering, and his eye happened to fall upon Prince Andrew, who was beside him. Seeing him, Kutuzov's malevolent and caustic expression softened, as if admitting that what was being done was not his adjutant's fault and, still not answering the Austrian adjutant, he addressed Bolkonsky. "'Go, my dear fellow, and see whether the third division has passed the village. Tell it to stop and await my orders.' Hardly had Prince Andrew started than he stopped him. "'And ask whether sharpshooters have been posted,' he added. "'What are they doing? What are they doing?' he murmured to himself, still not replying to the Austrian. Prince Andrew galloped off to execute the order. Overtaking the battalions that continued to advance, he stopped the third division and convinced himself that there were really no sharpshooters in front of our columns. The colonel at the head of the regiment was much surprised at the commander-in-chief's order to throw out skirmishers. He had felt perfectly sure that there were other troops in front of him and that the enemy must be at least six miles away. 
There was really nothing to be seen in front except a barren descent hidden by dense mist. Having given orders in the commander-in-chief's name to rectify this omission, Prince Andrew galloped back. Kutuzov, still in the same place, his stout body resting heavily in the saddle with the lassitude of age, sat yawning wearily with closed eyes. The troops were no longer moving, but stood with the butts of their muskets on the ground. All right, all right, he said to Prince Andrew, and turned to a general who, watch in hand, was saying it was time they started, as all the left flank columns had already descended. Plenty of time, Your Excellency, muttered Kutuzov in the midst of a yawn. Plenty of time, he repeated. Just then, at a distance behind Kutuzov, was heard the sound of regiments saluting, and this sound rapidly came nearer along the whole extended line of the advancing Russian columns. Evidently the person they were greeting was riding quickly. When the soldiers of the regiment in front of which Kutuzov was standing began to shout, he rode a little to one side and looked round with a frown. Along the road from Pratzen galloped what looked like a squadron of horsemen in various uniforms. Two of them rode side by side in front at full gallop. One in a black uniform with white plumes in his hat rode a bobtailed chestnut horse. The other, who was in a white uniform, rode a black one. These were the two emperors, followed by their suites. Kutuzov, affecting the manners of an old soldier at the front, gave the command attention and rode up to the emperors with a salute. His whole appearance and manner were suddenly transformed. He put on the air of a subordinate who obeys without reasoning. With an affectation of respect, which evidently struck Alexander unpleasantly, he rode up and saluted. This unpleasant impression merely flitted over the young and happy face of the emperor like a cloud of haze across a clear sky and vanished. After his illness, he looked rather thinner that day than on the field of Olmutz, where Bolkonsky had seen him for the first time abroad. But there was still the same bewitching combination of majesty and mildness in his fine gray eyes, and on his delicate lips the same capacity for varying expression and the same prevalent appearance of good-hearted, innocent youth. At the Olmutz Review he had seemed more majestic. Here he seemed brighter and more energetic. He was slightly flushed after galloping two miles, and reining in his horse, he sighed restfully and looked round at the faces of his suite, young and animated as his own. Chartorisky, Novosiltsev, Prince Volkonsky, Stroganov, and the others all richly dressed gay young men on splendid, well-groomed, fresh, only slightly heated horses, exchanging remarks and smiling, had stopped behind the emperor. The emperor Francis, a rosy, long-faced young man, sat very erect on his handsome black horse, looking about him in a leisurely and preoccupied manner. He beckoned to one of his white adjutants and asked some question. Most likely he's asking at what o'clock they started, thought Prince Andrew, watching his old acquaintance with a smile he could not repress as he recalled his reception at Brünn. In the Emperor's suite were the picked young orderly officers of the Guard and Line regiments, Russian and Austrian. Among them were grooms leading the Tsar's beautiful relay horses covered with embroidered cloths. As when a window is opened a whiff of fresh air from the fields enters a stuffy room, so a whiff of youthfulness, energy, and confidence of success reached Kutuzov's cheerless staff with the galloping advent of all these brilliant young men. "'Why aren't you beginning, Michael Larionovich?' said the Emperor Alexander hurriedly to Kutuzov, glancing courteously at the same time at the Emperor Francis. "'I am waiting, Your Majesty,' answered Kutuzov, bending forward respectfully. The Emperor, frowning slightly, bent his ear forward as if he had not quite heard. "'Waiting, Your Majesty,' repeated Kutuzov. Prince Andrew noted that Kutuzov's upper lip twitched unnaturally as he said the word waiting. Not all the columns have formed up yet, Your Majesty. The Tsar heard, but obviously did not like the reply. He shrugged his rather round shoulders and glanced at Novosiltsev, who was near him, as if complaining of Kutuzov. You know, Michael Ilarionovich, we are not on the Empress's field where a parade does not begin till all the troops are assembled, said the Tsar, with another glance at the Emperor Francis, as if inviting him, if not to join in, at least to listen to what he was saying. But the Emperor Francis continued to look about him and did not listen. 
That is just why I do not begin, sire, said Kutuzov in a resounding voice, apparently to preclude the possibility of not being heard, and again something in his face twitched. That is just why I do not begin, sire, because we are not on parade and not on the Empress's field, said he clearly and distinctly. In the Emperor's suite, all exchanged rapid looks that expressed dissatisfaction and reproach. Old though he may be, he should not, he certainly should not speak like that, their glances seemed to say. The Tsar looked intently and observantly into Kutuzov's eye, waiting to hear whether he would say anything more. But Kutuzov, with respectfully bowed head, seemed also to be waiting. The silence lasted for about a minute. However, if you command it, your majesty, said Kutuzov, lifting his head and again assuming his former tone of a dull, unreasoning, but submissive general. He touched his horse, and having called Miloradovich, the commander of the column, gave him the order to advance. The troops again began to move, and two battalions of the Novgorod and one of the Apsheron regiment went forward past the emperor. As this Apsheron battalion marched by, the red-faced Miloradovich, without his greatcoat, with his orders on his breast and an enormous tuft of plumes in his cocked hat, worn on one side, with its corners front and back, galloped strenuously forward, and with a dashing salute reined in his horse before the Emperor. "'God be with you, General,' said the Emperor. "'Ma foi, sire, nous ferons ce qui sera dans notre possibilité, sire.' "'Indeed, sire, we shall do everything that to do is possible, sire,' he answered gaily raising nevertheless ironic smiles among the gentlemen of the Tsar's suite by his poor French. Miloradovich wheeled his horse sharply and stationed himself a little behind the Emperor. The Apsheron men, excited by the Tsar's presence, passed in step before the Emperors and their suites at a bold, brisk pace. "'Lads!' shouted Miloradovich in a loud, self-confident and cheery voice, obviously so elated by the sound of firing, by the prospect of battle, and by the sight of the gallant Apsherons, his comrades in Suvorov's time, now passing so gallantly before the emperors that he forgot the sovereign's presence. "'Lads, it's not the first village you've had to take!' cried he. "'Glad to do our best!' shouted the soldiers. The emperor's horse started at the sudden cry. This horse that had carried the sovereign at reviews in Russia bore him also here on the field of Austerlitz, and during the heedless blows of his left foot, and pricking its ears at the sound of shots, just as it had done on the Empress's field, not understanding the significance of the firing, nor of the nearness of the Emperor Francis's black cob, nor of all that was being said, thought, and felt that day by its rider. The Emperor turned with a smile to one of his followers, and made a remark to him, pointing to the gallant Apsherons. Kutuzov, accompanied by his adjutants, rode at a walking pace behind the carabineers. When he had gone less than half a mile in the rear of the column, he stopped at a solitary deserted house that had probably once been an inn, where two roads parted. Both of them led downhill, and troops were marching along both. The fog had begun to clear, and enemy troops were already dimly visible about a mile and a half off on the opposite heights. Down below, on the left, the firing became more distinct. Kutuzov had stopped and was speaking to an Austrian general. Prince Andrew, who was a little behind and looking at them, turned to an adjutant to ask him for a field glass. "'Look! Look!' said this adjutant, looking not at the troops in the distance, but down the hill before him. "'It's the French!' The two generals and the adjutant took hold of the field glass, trying to snatch it from one another. The expression on all their faces suddenly changed to one of horror. The French were supposed to be a mile and a half away, but had suddenly and unexpectedly appeared just in front of us. It's the enemy? No. Yes, see it is. For certain. But how is that? said different voices. With the naked eye, Prince Andrew saw below them to the right, not more than five hundred paces from where Kutuzov was standing, a dense French column coming up to meet the Apsherons. Here it is. The decisive moment has arrived. My turn has come, thought Prince Andrew, and striking his horse he rode up to Kutuzov. The Apsherons must be stopped, Your Excellency, cried he. But at that very instant a cloud of smoke spread all round, firing was heard quite close at hand, and a voice of naive terror barely two steps from Prince Andrew shouted, Brothers, all's lost! And at this voice, as if at a command, everyone began to run. 
Confused and ever-increasing crowds were running back to where five minutes before the troops had passed the emperors. Not only would it have been difficult to stop that crowd, it was even impossible not to be carried back with it oneself. Volkonsky only tried not to lose touch with it, and looked around bewildered and unable to grasp what was happening in front of him. Nezvitsky, with an angry face, red and unlike himself, was shouting to Kutuzov that if he did not ride away at once he would certainly be taken prisoner. Kutuzov remained in the same place, and without answering drew out a handkerchief. Blood was flowing from his cheek. Prince Andrew forced his way to him. "'You're wounded?' he asked, hardly able to master the trembling of his lower jaw. "'The wound is not here. It is there,' said Kutuzov, pressing the handkerchief to his wounded cheek and pointing to the fleeing soldiers. "'Stop them!' he shouted, and at the same moment, probably realizing that it was impossible to stop them, spurred his horse and rode to the right. A fresh wave of the flying mob caught him and bore him back with it. The troops were running in such a dense mass that once surrounded by them it was difficult to get out again. One was shouting, Get on! Why are you hindering us? Another in the same place turned round and fired in the air. A third was striking the horse Kutuzov himself rode. Having by a great effort got away to the left from that flood of men, Kutuzov, with his suite diminished by more than half, rode toward a sound of artillery fire nearby. Having forced his way out of the crowd of fugitives, Prince Andrew, trying to keep near Kutuzov, saw on the slope of the hill amid the smoke a Russian battery that was still firing, and Frenchmen running toward it. Higher up stood some Russian infantry, neither moving forward to protect the battery, nor backward with the fleeing crowd. A mounted general separated himself from the infantry and approached Kutuzov. Of Kutuzov's suite only four remained. They were all pale and exchanged looks in silence. "'Stop those wretches!' gasped Kutuzov to the regimental commander, pointing to the flying soldiers. But at that instant, as if to punish him for those words, bullets flew hissing across the regiment and across Kutuzov's suite like a flock of little birds. The French had attacked the battery, and seeing Kutuzov were firing at him. After this volley, the regimental commander clutched at his leg. Several soldiers fell, and a second lieutenant who was holding the flag let it fall from his hands. It swayed and fell, but caught on the muskets of the nearest soldiers. The soldiers started firing without orders. Oh, oh, groaned Kutuzov despairingly and looked around. Volkonsky, he whispered, his voice trembling from a consciousness of the feebleness of age. Volkonsky, he whispered, pointing to the disordered battalion and at the enemy. What's that? But before he had finished speaking, Prince Andrew, feeling tears of shame and anger choking him, had already leaped from his horse and run to the standard. "'Forward, lads!' he shouted in a voice piercing as a child's. "'Here it is,' thought he, seizing the staff of the standard and hearing with pleasure the whistle of bullets evidently aimed at him. Several soldiers fell. "'Hurrah!' shouted Prince Andrew, and scarcely able to hold up the heavy standard, he ran forward with full confidence that the whole battalion would follow him. And really, he only ran a few steps alone. One soldier moved, and then another, and soon the whole battalion ran forward shouting hurrah and overtook him. A sergeant of the battalion ran up and took the flag that was swaying from its weight in Prince Andrew's hands, but he was immediately killed. Prince Andrew again seized the standard, and dragging it by the staff, ran on with the battalion. In front he saw our artillerymen, some of whom were fighting, while others, having abandoned their guns, were running towards him. He also saw French infantry soldiers who were seizing the artillery horses and turning the guns round. Prince Andrew and the battalion were already within twenty paces of the cannon. He heard the whistle of bullets above him unceasingly, and to right and left of him soldiers continually groaned and dropped. But he did not look at them. He looked only at what was going on in front of him, at the battery. He now saw clearly the figure of a red-haired gunner with his shako knocked awry, pulling one end of a mop while a French soldier tugged at the other. He could distinctly see the distraught yet angry expression on the faces of these two men, who evidently did not realize what they were doing. "'What are they about?' thought Prince Andrew as he gazed at them. "'Why doesn't the red-haired gunner run away as he is unarmed? Why doesn't the Frenchman stab him? He will not get away before the Frenchman remembers his bayonet and stabs him. And really, another French soldier, trailing his musket, ran up to the struggling men, and the fate of the red-haired gunner, who had triumphantly secured the mop and still did not realize what awaited him, was about to be decided. But Prince Andrew did not see how it ended. 
It seemed to him as though one of the soldiers near him hit him on the head with the full swing of a bludgeon. It hurt a little, but the worst of it was that the pain distracted him and prevented his seeing what he had been looking at. What's this? Am I falling? My legs are giving way, thought he, and fell on his back. He opened his eyes, hoping to see how the struggle of the Frenchmen with the gunners ended, whether the red-haired gunner had been killed or not, and whether the cannon had been captured or saved. But he saw nothing. Above him there was now nothing but the sky, the lofty sky, not clear, yet still immeasurably lofty, with grey clouds gliding slowly across it. How quiet, peaceful, and solemn. Not at all as I ran, thought Prince Andrew. Not as we ran, shouting and fighting. Not at all as the gunner and the Frenchman with frightened and angry faces struggled for the mop. How differently do those clouds glide across that lofty, infinite sky? How was it I did not see that lofty sky before? And how happy I am to have found it at last! Yes, all is vanity, all falsehood, except that infinite sky. There is nothing, nothing but that. But even it does not exist. There is nothing but quiet and peace. Thank God. On our right flank, commanded by Bagration, at nine o'clock the battle had not yet begun. Not wishing to agree to Dolgorukov's demand to commence the action, and wishing to avert responsibility from himself, Prince Bagration proposed to Dolgorukov to send to inquire of the commander-in-chief. Bagration knew that as the distance between the two flanks was more than six miles, even if the messenger were not killed, which he very likely would be, and found the commander-in-chief, which would be very difficult, he would not be able to get back before evening. Bagration cast his large, expressionless, sleepy eyes round his suite, and the boyish face of Rostov, breathless with excitement and hope, was the first to catch his eye. He sent him. "'And if I should meet His Majesty before I meet the Commander-in-Chief, Your Excellency?' said Rostov, with his hand to his cap. Uh, "'You can give the message to His Majesty,' said Dolgorukov, hurriedly interrupting Bagration. On being relieved from picket duty, Rostov had managed to get a few hours' sleep before morning, and felt cheerful, bold, and resolute, with elasticity of movement, faith in his good fortune, and generally in that state of mind which makes everything seem possible, pleasant, and easy. All his wishes were being fulfilled that morning. There was to be a general engagement in which he was to take part. More than that, he was orderly to the bravest general, and still more, he was going with a message to Kutuzov, perhaps even to the sovereign himself. The morning was bright, he had a good horse under him, and his heart was full of joy and happiness. On receiving the order, he gave his horse the rein and galloped along the line. At first he rode along the line of Bagration's troops, which had not yet advanced into action but were standing motionless. Then he came to the region occupied by Uvarov's cavalry, and here he noticed a stir and signs of preparation for battle. Having passed Uvarov's cavalry, he clearly heard the sound of cannon and musketry ahead of him. The firing grew louder and louder. In the fresh morning air were now heard not two or three musket shots at irregular intervals as before, followed by one or two cannon shots, but a roll of volleys of musketry from the slopes of the hill before Pratzen, interrupted by such frequent reports of cannon that sometimes several of them were not separated from one another, but merged into a general roar. He could see puffs of musketry smoke that seemed to chase one another down the hillsides, and clouds of cannon smoke rolling, spreading, and mingling with one another. He could also, by the gleam of bayonets visible through the smoke, make out moving masses of infantry and narrow lines of artillery with green caissons. Rostov stopped his horse for a moment on a hillock to see what was going on, but strain his attention as he would, he could not understand or make out anything of what was happening. There in the smoke, men of some sort were moving about, and in front and behind moved lines of troops, but why, whither, and who they were, it was impossible to make out. 
these sights and sounds had no depressing or intimidating effect on him. On the contrary, they stimulated his energy and determination. Go on, go on, give it them, he mentally exclaimed at these sounds, and again proceeded to gallop along the line, penetrating farther and farther into the region where the army was already in action. How it will be there I don't know, but all will be well, thought Rostov. After passing some Austrian troops, he noticed that the next part of the line, the guards, was already in action. So much the better, I shall see it close, he thought. He was riding almost along the front line. A handful of men came galloping toward him. They were our Uhlans, who with disordered ranks were returning from the attack. Rostov got out of their way, involuntarily noticed that one of them was bleeding, and galloped on. That is no business of mine, he thought. He had not ridden many hundred yards after that, before he saw to his left, across the whole width of the field, an enormous mass of cavalry in brilliant white uniforms, mounted on black horses, trotting straight toward him and across his path. Rostov put his horse to full gallop to get out of the way of these men, and he would have got clear had they continued at the same speed, but they kept increasing their pace, so that some of the horses were already galloping. Rostov heard the thud of their hoofs and the jingle of their weapons, and saw their horses, their figures, and even their faces more and more distinctly. They were our horse guards, advancing to attack the French cavalry that was coming to meet them. The horse guards were galloping, but still holding in their horses. Rostov could already see their faces, and heard the command, Charge! shouted by an officer, who was urging his thoroughbred to full speed. Rostov, fearing to be crushed or swept into the attack on the French, galloped along the front as hard as his horse could go, but still was not in time to avoid them. The last of the horse guards, a huge pockmarked fellow, frowned angrily on seeing Rostov before him, with whom he would inevitably collide. This guardsman would certainly have bowled Rostov and his Bedouin over. Rostov felt himself quite tiny and weak compared to these gigantic men and horses. Had it not occurred to Rostov to flourish his whip before the eyes of the guardsman's horse, the heavy black horse, Sixteen hands high, shied, throwing back its ears. But the pockmarked guardsman drove his huge spurs in violently, and the horse, flourishing its tail and extending its neck, galloped on yet faster. Hardly had the horse guards passed Rostov before he heard them shout, Hurrah! and looking back, saw that their foremost ranks were mixed up with some foreign cavalry with red epaulets, probably French. He could see nothing more, for immediately afterwards cannon began firing from somewhere and smoke enveloped everything. At that moment, as the horse guards, having passed him, disappeared in the smoke, Rostov hesitated whether to gallop after them or to go where he was sent. This was the brilliant charge of the horse guards that amazed the French themselves. Rostov was horrified to hear later that of all that mass of huge and handsome men, of all those brilliant rich youths, officers and cadets who had galloped past him on their thousand-ruble horses, only eighteen were left after the charge. Why should I envy them? My chance is not lost, and maybe I shall see the Emperor immediately, thought Rostov, and galloped on. When he came level with the foot guards, he noticed that about them and around them cannon balls were flying, of which he was aware not so much because he heard their sound as because he saw uneasiness on the soldiers' faces and unnatural warlike solemnity on those of the officers. Passing behind one of the lines of a regiment of foot guards, he heard a voice calling him by name. Rostov! What? he answered, not recognizing Boris. I say, we've been in the front line. Our regiment attacked, said Boris, with a happy smile seen on the faces of young men who have been under fire for the first time. Rostov stopped. Have you? he said. Well, how did it go? We drove them back, said Boris with animation, growing talkative. Can you imagine it? and he began describing how the guards, having taken up their position and seeing troops before them, thought they were Austrians, and all at once discovered from the cannonballs discharged by those troops that they were themselves in the front line and had unexpectedly to go into action. Rostov, without hearing Boris to the end, spurred his horse. "'Where are you off to?' asked Boris. "'With a message to His Majesty.' "'There he is,' said Boris, thinking Rostov had said His Highness, and pointing to the Grand Duke who, with his high shoulders and frowning brows, stood a hundred paces away from them, in his helmet and horse guard's jacket, shouting something to a pale, white-uniformed Austrian officer. "'But that's the Grand Duke, and I want the Commander-in-Chief or the Emperor,' said Rostov, and was about to spur his horse. 
Count! Count! shouted Berg, who ran up from the other side as eager as Boris. Count, I'm wounded in my right hand! And he showed his bleeding hand with a handkerchief tied round it. And I remained at the front. I held my sword in my left hand, Count. All our family, the von Bergs, have been knights. He said something more, but Rostov did not wait to hear it and rode away. Having passed the guards and traversed an empty space, Rostov, to avoid again getting in front of the first line as he had done when the horse guards charged, followed the line of reserves, going far round the place where the hottest musket fire and cannonade were heard. Suddenly he heard musket fire quite close in front of him and behind our troops, where he could never have expected the enemy to be. What can it be, he thought. The enemy in the rear of our army? Impossible. And suddenly he was seized by a panic of fear for himself and for the issue of the whole battle. But be that what it may, he reflected, there is no riding round it now. I must look for the commander-in-chief here, and if all is lost, it is for me to perish with the rest. The foreboding of evil that had suddenly come over Rostov was more and more confirmed the farther he rode into the region behind the village of Pratsen, which was full of troops of all kinds. What does it mean? What is it? Whom are they firing at? Who's firing? Rostov kept asking as he came up to Russian and Austrian soldiers, running in confused crowds across his path. The devil knows. They've killed everybody. It's all up now, he was told in Russian, German, and Czech by the crowd of fugitives who understood what was happening as little as he did. Kill the Germans, shouted one. May the devil take them, the traitors. Zum Henker dieser Hussen. Hang these Russians, muttered a German. Several wounded men passed along the road, and words of abuse, screams, and groans mingled in a general hubbub. Then the firing died down. Rostov learned later that Russian and Austrian soldiers had been firing at one another. My God, what does it all mean? thought he. And here, where at any moment the Emperor may see them. But no, these must be only a handful of scoundrels. They will soon be over. It, it can't be that. It, it can't be. Only to get past them quicker, quicker. The idea of defeat and flight could not enter Rostov's head. Though he saw French cannon and French troops on the Pratsen Heights, just where he had been ordered to look for the commander-in-chief, he could not, did not wish to believe that. Rostov had been ordered to look for Kutuzov and the Emperor near the village of Pratsen, but neither they nor a single commanding officer were there, only disorganized crowds of troops of various kinds. He urged on his already weary horse to get quickly past these crowds, but the farther he went the more disorganized they were. The high road on which he had come out was thronged with kaleshes, carriages of all sorts, and Russian and Austrian soldiers of all arms, some wounded and some not. This whole mass droned and jostled in confusion under the dismal influence of cannonballs flying from the French batteries stationed on the Pratsen Heights. Where is the Emperor? Where is Kutuzov? Rostov kept asking everyone he could stop, but got no answer from anyone. At last, seizing a soldier by his collar, he forced him to answer. Hey, brother, they've all bolted long ago, said the soldier, laughing for some reason and shaking himself free. Having left that soldier, who was evidently drunk, Rostov stopped the horse of a batman or groom of some important personage and began to question him. The man announced that the Tsar had been driven in a carriage at full speed about an hour before along that very road, and that he was dangerously wounded. It can't be, said Rostov. It must have been someone else. I saw him myself, replied the man, with a self-confident smile of derision. I ought to know the Emperor by now, after the times I've seen him in Petersburg. I saw him just as I see you. There he sat in the carriage, as pale as anything. How they made the poor black horses fly! Gracious me, they did rattle past. It's time I knew the Imperial horses and Ilya Ivanitch. I don't think Ilya drives anyone except the Tsar. Rostov let go of the horse and was about to ride on, when a wounded officer passing by addressed him. Who is it you want? he asked. The commander-in-chief? He was killed by a cannonball, struck in the breast before our regiment. Not killed, wounded, another officer corrected him. Who, Kutuzov? asked Rostov. Not Kutuzov, but what's his name? Well, never mind, there are not many left alive. Go that way, to that village. All the commanders are there, said the officer, pointing to the village of Hozieradek, and he walked on. Rostov rode on at a footpace, 
not knowing why or to whom he was now going. The emperor was wounded, the battle lost. It was impossible to doubt it now. Rostov rode in the direction pointed out to him, in which he saw turrets and a church. What need to hurry? What was he now to say to the Tsar or to Kutuzov, even if they were alive and unwounded? Take this road, Your Honor. That way you will be killed at once, a soldier shouted to him. They'd kill you there. Oh, what are you talking about, said another. Where is he to go? That way is nearer. Rostov considered, and then went in the direction where they said he would be killed. It's all the same now. If the emperor is wounded, am I to try to save myself? He thought. He rode on to the region where the greatest number of men had perished in fleeing from Pratzen. The French had not yet occupied that region, and the Russians, the uninjured and slightly wounded, had left it long ago. All about the field, like heaps of manure on well-kept plowland, lay from ten to fifteen dead and wounded to each couple of acres. The wounded crept together in twos and threes, and one could hear their distressing screams and groans, sometimes feigned, or so it seemed to Rostov. He put his horse to a trot to avoid seeing all these suffering men, and he felt afraid, afraid not for his life, but for the courage he needed and which he knew would not stand the sight of these unfortunates. The French, who had ceased firing at this field strewn with dead and wounded where there was no one left to fire at, on seeing an adjutant riding over it, trained a gun on him and fired several shots. The sensation of those terrible whistling sounds and of the corpses around him merged in Rostov's mind into a single feeling of terror and pity for himself. He remembered his mother's last letter. What would she feel, thought he, if she saw me here now on this field with the cannon aimed at me? In the village of Hozieradik there were Russian troops retiring from the field of battle, who, though still in some confusion, were less disordered. The French cannon did not reach there, and the musketry fire sounded far away. Here everyone clearly saw and said that the battle was lost. No one whom Rostov asked, could tell him where the Emperor or Kutuzov was. Some said the report that the Emperor was wounded was correct, others that it was not, and explained the false rumor that had spread by the fact that the Emperor's carriage had really galloped from the field of battle with the pale and terrified Oberhof Marshal Count Tolstoy, who had ridden out to the battlefield with others in the Emperor's suite. One officer told Rostov that he had seen someone from headquarters behind the village to the left, and thither Rostov rode, not hoping to find anyone, but merely to ease his conscience. When he had ridden about two miles and had passed the last of the Russian troops, he saw near a kitchen garden with a ditch round it two men on horseback facing the ditch. One with a white plume in his hat seemed familiar to Rostov. The other on a beautiful chestnut horse, which Rostov fancied he had seen before, rode up to the ditch, struck his horse with his spurs, and giving it the rein, leaped lightly over. Only a little earth crumbled from the bank under the horse's hind hoofs. Turning the horse sharply, he again jumped the ditch, and deferentially addressed the horseman with the white plumes, evidently suggesting that he should do the same. The rider, whose figure seemed familiar to Rostov and involuntarily riveted his attention, made a gesture of refusal with his head and hand, and by that gesture Rostov instantly recognized his lamented and adored monarch. "'But it can't be he!' Alone in the midst of this empty field, thought Rostov. At that moment Alexander turned his head, and Rostov saw the beloved features that were so deeply engraved on his memory. The emperor was pale, his cheeks sunken and his eyes hollow, but the charm, the mildness of his features, was all the greater. Rostov was happy in the assurance that the rumors about the emperor being wounded were false. He was happy to be seeing him. He knew that he might and even ought to go straight to him and give the message Dolgorukov had ordered him to deliver. But as a youth in love trembles, is unnerved, and dares not utter the thoughts he has dreamed of for nights, but looks around for help or a chance of delay and flight when the longed-for moment comes and he is alone with her, so Rostov, now that he had attained what he had longed for more than anything else in the world, did not know how to approach the Emperor, and a thousand reasons occurred to him why it would be inconvenient, unseemly, and impossible to do so. What? It is as if I were glad of a chance to take advantage of his being alone and despondent. 
A strange face may seem unpleasant or painful to him at this moment of sorrow. Besides, what can I say to him now, when my heart fails me, and my mouth feels dry at the mere sight of him? Not one of the innumerable speeches addressed to the emperor that Rostov had composed in his imagination could he now recall. Those speeches were intended for quite other conditions. They were for the most part to be spoken at a moment of victory and triumph, generally when he was dying of wounds and the sovereign had thanked him for heroic deeds, and while dying he expressed the love his actions had proved. Besides, how can I ask the emperor for his instructions for the right flank now that it is nearly four o'clock and the battle is lost? No, certainly I must not approach him. I must not intrude on his reflections. Better die a thousand times than risk receiving an unkind look or bad opinion from him, Rostov decided. And sorrowfully, and with a heart full of despair, he rode away, continually looking back at the Tsar, who still remained in the same attitude of indecision. While Rostov was thus arguing with himself and riding sadly away, Captain Fontol chanced to ride to the same spot and seeing the emperor, at once rode up to him, offered his services, and assisted him to cross the ditch on foot. The emperor, wishing to rest and feeling unwell, sat down under an apple tree, and Fontol remained beside him. Rostov, from a distance, saw with envy and remorse how Fontol spoke long and warmly to the emperor, and how the emperor, evidently weeping, covered his eyes with his hand and pressed Fontol's hand. And I might have been in his place, thought Rostov, and hardly restraining his tears of pity for the emperor, he rode on in utter despair, not knowing where to or why he was now riding. His despair was all the greater from feeling that his own weakness was the cause of his grief. He might, not only might, but should have gone up to the sovereign. It was a unique chance to show his devotion to the emperor, and he had not made use of it. What have I done? thought he. And he turned round and galloped back to the place where he had seen the emperor, but there was no one beyond the ditch now. Only some carts and carriages were passing by. From one of the drivers he learned that Kutuzov's staff were not far off in the village the vehicles were going to. Rostov followed them. In front of him walked Kutuzov's groom, leading horses in horse-cloths. Then came a cart, and behind that walked an old bandy-legged domestic serf in a peaked cap and sheepskin coat. Tit! I say tit! said the groom. What? answered the old man absent-mindedly. Go, tit! Thresh a bit! Oh, you fool! said the old man, spitting angrily. Some time passed in silence, and then the same joke was repeated. Before five in the evening, the battle had been lost at all points. More than a hundred cannon were already in the hands of the French. Przebyszewski and his corps had laid down their arms. Other columns, after losing half their men, were retreating in disorderly, confused masses. The remains of Langerons and Dokhturov's mingled forces were crowding around the dams and banks of the ponds near the village of August. After five o'clock, it was only at the August Dam that a hot cannonade delivered by the French alone was still to be heard from numerous batteries ranged on the slopes of the Pratzen Heights, directed at our retreating forces. In the rear guard, Dokhturov and others, rallying some battalions, kept up a musketry fire at the French cavalry that was pursuing our troops. It was growing dusk. On the narrow August Dam, where for so many years the old miller had been accustomed to sit in his tasseled cap peacefully angling, while his grandson, with shirt sleeves rolled up, handled the floundering silvery fish in the watering can. On that dam, over which for so many years Moravians in shaggy caps and blue jackets had peacefully driven their two-horse carts loaded with wheat, and had returned dusty with flour whitening their carts. On that narrow dam, amid the wagons and the cannon, under the horses' hoofs and between the wagon wheels, men disfigured by fear of death now crowded together, crushing one another, dying, stepping over the dying and killing one another, only to move on a few steps and be killed themselves in the same way. 
Every ten seconds a cannonball flew, compressing the air around, or a shell burst in the midst of that dense throng, killing some and splashing with blood those near them. Dolokhov, now an officer, wounded in the arm and on foot, with the regimental commander on horseback and some ten men of his company, represented all that was left of that whole regiment. Impelled by the crowd, they had got wedged in at the approach to the dam, and, jammed in on all sides, had stopped because a horse in front had fallen under a cannon and the crowd were dragging it out. A cannonball killed someone behind them. Another fell in front and splashed Dolokhov with blood. The crowd, pushing forward desperately, squeezed together, moved a few steps, and again stopped. Move on a hundred yards and we're certainly saved. Remain here another two minutes and it's certain death, thought each one. Dolokhov, who was in the midst of the crowd, forced his way to the edge of the dam, throwing two soldiers off their feet, and ran onto the slippery ice that covered the mill pool. Turn this way, he shouted, jumping over the ice which creaked under him. Turn this way, he shouted to those with the gun. It bears. The ice bore him, but it swayed and creaked, and it was plain that it would give way not only under a cannon or a crowd, but very soon even under his weight alone. The men looked at him and pressed to the bank, hesitating to step onto the ice. The general on horseback at the entrance to the dam raised his hand and opened his mouth to address Dolokhov. Suddenly a cannonball hissed so low above the crowd that everyone ducked. It flopped into something moist, and the general fell from his horse in a pool of blood. Nobody gave him a look or thought of raising him. Get onto the ice! Over the ice! Go on! Turn! Don't you hear? Go on! Innumerable voices suddenly shouted after the ball had struck the general, the men themselves not knowing what or why they were shouting. One of the hindmost guns that was going onto the dam turned off onto the ice. Crowds of soldiers from the dam began running onto the frozen pond. The ice gave way under one of the foremost soldiers, and one leg slipped into the water. He tried to right himself, but fell in up to his waist. The nearest soldier shrank back. The gun driver stopped his horse, but from behind still came the shouts, "'Onto the ice! Why do you stop? Go on! Go on!' And cries of horror were heard in the crowd. The soldiers near the gun waved their arms and beat the horses to make them turn and move on. The horses moved off the bank. The ice that had held under those on foot collapsed in a great mass, and some forty men who were on it dashed some forward and some back, drowning one another." Still the cannonballs continued regularly to whistle and flop onto the ice and into the water, and oftenest of all among the crowd that covered the dam, the pond, and the bank. On the Pratzen Heights, where he had fallen with the flagstaff in his hand, lay Prince Andrew Bolkonsky bleeding profusely and unconsciously uttering a gentle, piteous, and childlike moan. Toward evening he ceased moaning, and became quite still. He did not know how long his unconsciousness lasted. Suddenly he again felt that he was alive and suffering from a burning, lacerating pain in his head. Where is it? That lofty sky that I did not know till now, but saw today, was his first thought. And I did not know this suffering either, he thought. Yes, I did not know anything, anything at all, till now. But where am I? He listened and heard the sound of approaching horses and voices speaking French. He opened his eyes. Above him again was the same lofty sky with clouds that had risen and were floating still higher, and between them gleamed blue infinity. He did not turn his head and did not see those who, judging by the sound of hoofs and voices, had ridden up and stopped near him. It was Napoleon accompanied by two aides-de-camp. Bonaparte, riding over the battlefield, had given final orders to strengthen the batteries firing at the Auguste Dam, and was looking at the killed and wounded left on the field. Fine men, remarked Napoleon, looking at a dead Russian grenadier, who with his face buried in the ground and a blackened nape lay on his stomach, with an already stiffened arm flung wide. "'The ammunition for the guns in position is exhausted, Your Majesty,' said an adjutant who had come from the batteries that were firing at Auguste. "'Have some brought from the reserve,' said Napoleon. 
and having gone on a few steps, he stopped before Prince Andrew, who lay on his back with the flagstaff that had been dropped beside him. The flag had already been taken by the French as a trophy. That's a fine death, said Napoleon as he gazed at Bolkonsky. Prince Andrew understood that this was said of him, and that it was Napoleon who said it. He heard the speaker addressed as Sire, but he heard the words as he might have heard the buzzing of a fly. Not only did they not interest him, but he took no notice of them, and at once forgot them. His head was burning, he felt himself bleeding to death, and he saw above him the remote, lofty, and everlasting sky. He knew it was Napoleon, his hero. But at that moment Napoleon seemed to him such a small, insignificant creature compared with what was passing now between himself and that lofty, infinite sky with the clouds flying over it. At that moment it meant nothing to him who might be standing over him or what was said of him. He was only glad that people were standing near him and only wished that they would help him and bring him back to life which seemed to him so beautiful now that he had today learned to understand it so differently. He collected all his strength to stir and utter a sound. He feebly moved his leg and uttered a weak, sickly groan, which aroused his own pity. Ah, he is alive, said Napoleon. Lift this young man up and carry him to the dressing station. Having said this, Napoleon rode on to meet Marshal Lannes, who, hat in hand, rode up smiling to the Emperor to congratulate him on the victory. Prince Andrew remembered nothing more. He lost consciousness from the terrible pain of being lifted onto the stretcher, the jolting while being moved, and the probing of his wound at the dressing station. He did not regain consciousness till late in the day, when with other wounded and captured Russian officers he was carried to the hospital. During this transfer he felt a little stronger and was able to look about him and even speak. The first words he heard on coming to his senses were those of a French convoy officer, who said rapidly, We must halt here. The Emperor will pass here immediately. It will please him to see these gentlemen prisoners. There are so many prisoners today, nearly the whole Russian army, that he's probably tired of them, said another officer. All the same, they say this one is the commander of all the Emperor Alexander's guards, said the first one indicating a Russian officer in the white uniform of the horse guards. Volkonsky recognized Prince Repnin, whom he had met in Petersburg society. Beside him stood a lad of nineteen, also a wounded officer of the horse guards. Bonaparte, having come up at a gallop, stopped his horse. Which is the senior? he asked on seeing the prisoners. They named the colonel Prince Repnin. You are the commander of the Emperor Alexander's regiment of horse guards? asked Napoleon. I commanded a squadron, replied Repnin. Your regiment fulfilled its duty honorably, said Napoleon. The praise of a great commander is a soldier's highest reward, said Repnin. I bestow it with pleasure, said Napoleon. And who is that young man beside you? Prince Repnin named Lieutenant Suchtelen. After looking at him, Napoleon smiled. He's very young to come to meddle with us. Youth is no hindrance to courage, muttered Suchtelen in a failing voice. A splendid reply, said Napoleon. Young man, you will go far. Prince Andrew, who had also been brought forward before the Emperor's eyes to complete the show of prisoners, could not fail to attract his attention. Napoleon apparently remembered seeing him on the battlefield, and addressing him again used the epithet young man that was connected in his memory with Prince Andrew. Well, and you, young man, said he, how do you feel, mon brave? Though five minutes before Prince Andrew had been able to say a few words to the soldiers who were carrying him, now, with his eyes fixed straight on Napoleon, he was silent. So insignificant at that moment seemed to him all the interests that engrossed Napoleon. So mean did his hero himself, with his paltry vanity and joy and victory, appear compared to the lofty, equitable, and kindly sky which he had seen and understood, that he could not answer him. Everything seemed so futile and insignificant in comparison with the stern and solemn train of thought that weakness from loss of blood, suffering, and the nearness of death aroused in him. In him. 
in him. In him. In him. In him. Looking into Napoleon's eyes, Prince Andrew thought of the insignificance of greatness, the unimportance of life, which no one could understand, and the still greater unimportance of death, the meaning of which no one alive could understand or explain. The Emperor, without waiting for an answer, turned away and said to one of the officers as he went, Have these gentlemen attended to and taken to my bivouac. Let my doctor Laray examine their wounds. Au revoir, Prince Repnin, and he spurred his horse and galloped away. His face shone with self-satisfaction and pleasure. The soldiers who had carried Prince Andrew had noticed and taken the little gold icon Princess Mary had hung round her brother's neck. But seeing the favor the Emperor showed the prisoners, they now hastened to return the holy image. Prince Andrew did not see how and by whom it was replaced, but the little icon with its thin gold chain suddenly appeared upon his chest, outside his uniform. It would be good, thought Prince Andrew, glancing at the icon his sister had hung round his neck with such emotion and reverence. It would be good if everything were as clear and simple as it seems to Mary. How good it would be to know where to seek for help in this life, and what to expect after it beyond the grave. How happy and calm I should be if I could now say, Lord, have mercy on me. But to whom should I say that? Either to a power indefinable, incomprehensible, which I not only cannot address, but which I cannot even express in words. The great all or nothing, said he to himself, or to that God who has been sewn into this amulet by Mary. There is nothing certain, nothing at all, except the unimportance of everything I understand and the greatness of something incomprehensible but all-important. The stretchers moved on. At every jolt he again felt unendurable pain. His feverishness increased and he grew delirious. Visions of his father, wife, sister, and future son, and the tenderness he had felt the night before the battle, the figure of the insignificant little Napoleon, and above all, the lofty sky, formed the chief subjects of his delirious fancies. The quiet home life and peaceful happiness of Bald Hills presented itself to him. He was already enjoying that happiness when that little Napoleon had suddenly appeared with his unsympathizing look of short-sighted delight at the misery of others, and doubts and torments had followed, and only the heavens promised peace. Toward morning all these dreams melted and merged into the chaos and darkness of unconsciousness and oblivion which, in the opinion of Napoleon's Dr. Laray, was much more likely to end in death than in convalescence. He is a nervous, bilious subject, said Laray, and will not recover. And Prince Andrew, with others fatally wounded, was left to the care of the inhabitants of the district. Book Four, 1806 Chapter One Nicholas home on leave. Early in the year 1806, Nicholas Rostov returned home on leave. Denisov was going home to Voronezh, and Rostov persuaded him to travel with him as far as Moscow and to stay with him there. Meeting a comrade at the last post station but one before Moscow, Denisov had drunk three bottles of wine with him, and despite the jolting ruts across the snow-covered road, did not once wake up on the way to Moscow but lay at the bottom of the sleigh beside Rostov, who grew more and more impatient the nearer they got to Moscow. How much longer, how much longer? Oh, these insufferable streets, shops, bakers, signboards, street lamps, and sleighs, thought Rostov, when their leave permits had been passed at the town gate and they had entered Moscow. Denisov, we're here. He's asleep, he added, leaning forward with his whole body, as if in that position he hoped to hasten the speed of the sleigh. Denisov gave no answer. There's the corner at the crossroads where the cabman Zachar has his stand. And there's Zachar himself, and still the same horse. And here's the little shop where we used to buy gingerbread. Can't you hurry up? 
Now then, which house is it? asked the driver. Why, that one, right at the end, the big one. Don't you see? That's our house, said Rostov. Of course it's our house. Denisov, Denisov, we're almost there. Denisov raised his head, coughed, and made no answer. Dmitri, said Rostov to his valet on the box, those lights are in our house, aren't they? Yes, sir, and there's a light in your father's study. Then they've not gone to bed yet. What do you think? M mind now, D don't forget to put out my new coat, added Rostov, fingering his new moustache. Now then, get on, he shouted to the driver. Do wake up, Vaska, he went on, turning to Denisov, whose head was again nodding. Come, get on, you shall have three roubles for vodka, get on, Rostov shouted, when the sleigh was only three houses from his door. It seemed to him the horses were not moving at all. At last the sleigh bore to the right, drew up at an entrance, and Rostov saw overhead the old familiar cornice with a bit of plaster broken off, the porch, and the post by the side of the pavement. He sprang out before the sleigh stopped and ran into the hall. The house stood cold and silent, as if quite regardless of who had come to it. There was no one in the hall. Oh, God, is everyone all right? he thought, stopping for a moment with a sinking heart, and then immediately starting to run along the hall and up the warped steps of the familiar staircase. The well-known old door-handle, which always angered the countess when it was not properly cleaned, turned as loosely as ever. A solitary tallow candle burned in the anteroom. Old Michael was asleep on the chest. Prokofi, the footman, who was so strong that he could lift the back of the carriage from behind, sat plaiting slippers out of cloth selvages. He looked up at the opening door, and his expression of sleepy indifference suddenly changed to one of delighted amazement. "'Gracious heavens! The young Count!' he cried, recognizing his young master. "'Can it be my treasure?' and Prokofi, trembling with excitement, rushed toward the drawing-room door, probably in order to announce him, but, changing his mind, came back and stooped to kiss the young man's shoulder. "'All well?' asked Rostov, drawing away his arm. "'Yes, God be thanked. Yes, they've just finished supper. Let me have a look at you, Your Excellency. Is everything quite all right?' "'Oh, the Lord be thanked, yes!' Rostov, who had completely forgotten Denisov, not wishing anyone to forestall him, threw off his fur coat and ran on tiptoe through the large, dark ballroom. All was the same. There were the same old card tables and the same chandelier with a cover over it. But someone had already seen the young master, and before he had reached the drawing-room, something flew out from a side door like a tornado and began hugging and kissing him. Another and yet another creature of the same kind sprang from a second door and a third. More hugging, more kissing, more outcries and tears of joy. He could not distinguish which was Papa, which Natasha, and which Petya. Everyone shouted, talked, and kissed him at the same time. Only his mother was not there. He noticed that. And I did not know. Nicholas, my darling. Here he is, our own Kolya, dear fellow, how he's changed. Where are the candles? Tea. And me, kiss me, dearest, and me. Sonia, Natasha, Petya, Anna Mikhailovna, Viera, and the old count were all hugging him and the serfs, men and maids, flocked into the room, exclaiming and owing and eyeing. Petya, clinging to his legs, kept shouting, And me too! Natasha, after she had pulled him down toward her and covered his face with kisses, holding him tight by the skirt of his coat, sprang away and pranced up and down in one place like a goat and shrieked piercingly. All around were loving eyes glistening with tears of joy, and all around were lips seeking a kiss. Sonia, too, all rosy red, clung to his arm, and radiant with bliss looked eagerly toward his eyes, waiting for the look for which she longed. Sonia now was sixteen, and she was very pretty, especially at this moment of happy, rapturous excitement. She gazed at him, not taking her eyes off him, and smiling and holding her breath. He gave her a grateful look, but was still expectant and looking for someone. The old countess had not yet come. But now steps were heard at the door, steps so rapid that they could hardly be his mother's. Yet it was she, dressed in a new gown which he did not know, made since he had left. All the others let him go, and he ran to her. When they met, she fell on his breast, sobbing. She could not lift her face, but only pressed it to the cold braiding of his hussar's jacket. Denisov, who had come into the room unnoticed by anyone, stood there and wiped his eyes at the sight. Vasily Denisov, your son's friend, he said, 
introducing himself to the Count, who was looking inquiringly at him. Oh, you are most welcome, I know, I know, said the Count, kissing and embracing Denisov. Nicholas Rotus, Natasha, Viera, look, here is Denisov. The same happy, rapturous faces turned to the shaggy figure of Denisov. Darling Denisov! screamed Natasha, beside herself with rapture, springing to him, putting her arms round him and kissing him. This escapade made everybody feel confused. Denisov blushed, too, but smiled, and taking Natasha's hand, kissed it. Denisov was shown to the room prepared for him, and the Rostovs all gathered round Nicholas in the sitting-room. The old countess, not letting go of his hand, and kissing it every moment, sat beside him. The rest, crowding round him, watched every movement, word, or look of his, never taking their blissfully adoring eyes off him. His brother and sisters struggled for the places nearest to him, and disputed with one another who should bring him tea, his handkerchief, and pipe. Rostov was very happy in the love they showed him, but the first moment of meeting had been so beatific that his present joy seemed insufficient, and he kept expecting something more, more, and yet more. Next morning, after the fatigues of their journey, the travellers slept till ten o'clock. In the room next to Rostov's and Denisov's bedroom, there was a confusion of sabres, satchels, sabre tashes, open portmanteaus, and dirty boots. Two freshly cleaned pairs with spurs had just been placed by the wall. The servants were bringing in jugs and basins, hot water for shaving, and their well-brushed clothes. There was a masculine odor and a smell of tobacco. Hello, Guiska, my pipe, came Vasily Denisov's husky voice. Wostov, get up. Rostov, rubbing his eyes that seemed glued together, raised his disheveled head from the hot pillow. Why, is it late? L late? It's nearly ten o'clock, answered Natasha's voice. A rustle of starched petticoats and the whispering and laughter of girls' voices came from the adjoining room. The door was opened a crack, and there was a glimpse of something blue, of ribbons, black hair, and merry faces. It was Natasha, Sonia, and Petya, who had come to see whether they were getting up. Nicholas, get up! Natasha's voice was again heard at the door. Directly. Meanwhile, Petya, having found and seized the sabres in the outer room, with the delight boys feel at the sight of a military elder brother, and forgetting that it was unbecoming for the girls to see men undressed, opened the bedroom door. Is this your sabre? he shouted. The girl sprang aside. Denisov, hid his hairy legs under the blanket, looking with a scared face at his comrade for help. The door, having let Petya in, closed again. A sound of laughter came from behind it. "'Nicholas, come out in your dressing gown,' said Natasha's voice. "'Is this your sabre?' asked Petya. O "'Or is it yours?' he said, addressing the black-moustached Denisov with servile deference. Rostov hurriedly put something on his feet, drew on his dressing gown, and went out. Natasha had put on one spurred boot and was just getting her foot into the other. Sonia, when he came in, was twirling round and was about to expand her dresses into a balloon and sit down. They were dressed alike in new pale blue frocks and were both fresh, rosy, and bright. Sonia ran away, but Natasha, taking her brother's arm, led him into the sitting room where they began talking. They hardly gave one another time to ask questions and give replies concerning a thousand little matters which could not interest anyone but themselves. Natasha laughed at every word he said or that she said herself, not because what they were saying was amusing, but because she felt happy and was unable to control her joy which expressed itself by laughter. Oh, how nice, how splendid, she said to everything. Rostov felt that under the influence of the warm rays of love, that childlike smile, which had not once appeared on his face since he left home, now, for the first time after eighteen months, again brightened his soul and his face. No, but listen, she said. Now you're quite a man, aren't you? I'm awfully glad you're my brother. She touched his moustache. I want to know what you men are like. Are you the same as we? No? Why did Sonia run away? asked Rostov. Ah, yes, that's a whole long story. How are you going to speak to her, thou or you? Note, in Russian, as in other foreign languages, the second person singular is used in addressing children and intimates, and the second person plural in addressing those with whom one is more formal. As may happen, said Rostov, 
No, call her you, please. I'll tell you all about it some other time. No, I'll tell you now. You know, Sonia's my dearest friend. Such a friend that I burned my arm for her sake. Look here. She pulled up her muslin sleeve and showed him a red scar on her long, slender, delicate arm, high above the elbow, on that part that is covered even by a ball dress. I burned this to prove my love for her. I just heated a ruler in the fire and pressed it there. Sitting on the sofa, with the little cushions on its arms, in what used to be his old schoolroom, and looking into Natasha's wildly bright eyes, Rostov re-entered that world of home and childhood which had no meaning for anyone else, but gave him some of the best joys of his life. And the burning of an arm with a ruler, as a proof of love, did not seem to him senseless. He understood and was not surprised at it. Well, and is that all? he asked. We're such friends, such friends. All that ruler business was just nonsense, but we are friends forever. She, if she loves anyone, does it for life. But I don't understand that. I forget quickly. Well, what then? Well, she loves me and you like that. Natasha suddenly flushed. Why, you remember before you went away? Well, she says you're to forget all that. She says, I shall love him always, but let him be free. Isn't that lovely and noble? Yes, very noble, isn't it? Asked Natasha so seriously and excitedly that it was evident that what she was now saying she had talked of before with tears. Rostov became thoughtful. I never go back on my word, he said. Besides, Sonia is so charming that only a fool would renounce such happiness. No, no, cried Natasha. She and I have already talked it over. We knew you'd say so, but it won't do, because, you see, if you say that, if you consider yourself bound by your promise, it will seem as if she had not meant it seriously. It makes it as if you were marrying her because you must, and that wouldn't do at all. Rostov saw that it had been well considered by them. Sonia had already struck him by her beauty on the preceding day. Today, when he had caught a glimpse of her, she seemed still more lovely. She was a charming girl of sixteen, evidently passionately in love with him. He did not doubt that for an instant. Why should he not love her now and even marry her, Rostov thought. But just now there were so many other pleasures and interests before him. Yes, they've taken a wise decision, he thought. I must remain free. Well, then, that's excellent, said he. We'll talk it over later on. Oh, how glad I am to have you. Well, and are you still true to Boris? he continued. Oh, what nonsense, cried Natasha, laughing. I don't think about him or anyone else, and I don't want anything of the kind. Dear me. Then uh, what are you up to now? Now? repeated Natasha, and a happy smile lit up her face. Have you seen Duport? No. Not seen Duport, the famous dancer? Well, then you won't understand. That's what I'm up to. Curving her arms, Natasha held out her skirts as dancers do, ran back a few steps, turned, cut a caper, brought her little feet sharply together, and made some steps on the very tips of her toes. See, I'm standing, see, she said, but could not maintain herself on her toes any longer. So that's what I'm up to. I'll never marry anyone, but will be a dancer. Only don't tell anyone. Rostov laughed so loud and merrily that Denisov in his bedroom felt envious, and Natasha could not help joining in. No, but, but don't you think it's nice? She kept repeating. Nice? A and so you no longer wish to marry Boris? Natasha flared up. I don't want to marry anyone, and I'll tell him so when I see him. Dear me, said Rostov. But that's all rubbish, Natasha chattered on. And is Denisov nice? she asked. Yes, indeed. Oh, well then, goodbye. Go and dress. Is he very terrible, Denisov? Why terrible? asked Nicholas. No, oh, Vaska is a splendid fellow. You call him Vaska? That's funny. And is he very nice? Very. Well, then, be quick. We'll all have breakfast together. 
and Natasha rose and went out of the room on tiptoe like a ballet dancer, but smiling as only happy girls of fifteen can smile. When Rostov met Sonya in the drawing room, he reddened. He did not know how to behave with her. The evening before, in the first happy moments of meeting, they had kissed each other, but today they felt it could not be done. He felt that everybody, including his mother and sisters, was looking inquiringly at him and watching to see how he would behave with her. He kissed her hand and addressed her not as thou, but as you, Sonya. But their eyes met and said thou and exchanged tender kisses. Her looks asked him to forgive her for having dared, by Natasha's intermediacy, to remind him of his promise, and then thanked him for his love. His looks thanked her for offering him his freedom, and told her that one way or another he would never cease to love her, for that would be impossible. How strange it is, said Viera, selecting a moment when all was silent, that Sonia and Nicholas now say you to one another and meet like strangers. Viera's remark was correct, as her remarks always were, but like most of her observations, it made everyone feel uncomfortable. Not only Sonia, Nicholas, and Natasha, but even the old countess, who, dreading this love affair which might hinder Nicholas from making a brilliant match, blushed like a girl. Denisov, to Rostov's surprise, appeared in the drawing room with pomaded hair, perfumed, and in a new uniform looking just as smart as he made himself when going into battle, and he was more amiable to the ladies and gentlemen than Rostov had ever expected to see him. Chapter 2. Preparations for Club Dinner On his return to Moscow from the army, Nicholas Rostov was welcomed by his home circle as the best of sons, a hero, and their darling Nikolenka, by his relations as a charming, attractive, and polite young man by his acquaintances as a handsome lieutenant of hussars, a good dancer, and one of the best matches in the city. The Rostovs knew everybody in Moscow. The old count had money enough that year, as all his estates had been remortgaged, and so Nicholas, acquiring a trotter of his own, very stylish riding breeches of the latest cut, such as no one else yet had in Moscow, and boots of the latest fashion, with extremely pointed toes and small silver spurs, passed his time very gaily. After a short period of adapting himself to the old conditions of life, Nicholas found it very pleasant to be home again. He felt that he had grown up and matured very much. His despair at failing in a scripture examination, his borrowing money from Gavril to pay a sleigh driver, his kissing Sonia on the sly, he now recalled all this as childishness he had left immeasurably behind. Now he was a lieutenant of hussars, in a jacket laced with silver, and wearing the cross of St. George, awarded to soldiers for bravery in action, and, in the company of well-known, elderly, and respected racing men, was training a trotter of his own for a race. He knew a lady on one of the boulevards whom he visited of an evening. He led the mazurka at the Arkharovs' ball, talked about the war with Field Marshal Kamiensky, visited the English club, and was on intimate terms with a colonel of forty to whom Denisov had introduced him. His passion for the emperor had cooled somewhat in Moscow, but still, as he did not see him and had no opportunity of seeing him, he often spoke about him and about his love for him, letting it be understood that he had not told all, and that there was something in his feelings for the emperor not everyone could understand. And with his whole soul he shared the adoration then common in Moscow for the emperor, who was spoken of as the Angel Incarnate. During Rostov's short stay in Moscow before rejoining the army, he did not draw closer to Sonya, but rather drifted away from her. She was very pretty and sweet, and evidently deeply in love with him, but he was at the period of youth when there seems so much to do that there is no time for that sort of thing, and a young man fears to bind himself, and prizes his freedom which he needs for so many other things. When he thought of Sonya during this stay in Moscow, he said to himself, Ah, uh, there will be, and there are, many more such girls somewhere whom I do not yet know. There will be time enough to think about love when I want to, but now I have no time. Besides, it seemed to him that the society of women was rather derogatory to his manhood. 
He went to balls and into ladies' society with an affectation of doing so against his will. The races, the English club, sprees with Denisa and visits to a certain house, that was another matter, and quite the thing for a dashing young hussar. At the beginning of March, old Count Ilyarostov was very busy arranging a dinner in honor of Prince Bagration at the English club. Note, the English club in Moscow was English only in name. It was a meeting place for the wealthy and the leading nobility and gentry in Moscow from the time of Catherine the Great up to the revolution of 1917. The Count walked up and down the hall in his dressing gown, giving orders to the club's steward and to the famous Fjoktist, the club's head cook, about asparagus, fresh cucumber, strawberries, veal, and fish for this dinner. The Count had been a member and on the committee of the club from the day it was founded. To him, the club entrusted the arrangement of the festival in honor of Bagration, for few men knew so well how to arrange a feast on an open-handed, hospitable scale, and still fewer men would be so well able and willing to make up out of their own resources what might be needed for the success of the fete. The club cook and the steward listened to the Count's orders with pleased faces, for they knew that under no other management could they so easily extract a good profit for themselves from a dinner costing several thousand roubles. Well then, uh, mind and have uh, cock's combs in the turtle soup, you know. Shall we have three cold dishes then? asked the cook. The Count considered. Well, we can't have less. Yes, three. Um, the mayonnaise, that's one, said he, bending down a finger. Then am I to order those large sterlets? asked the steward. Yes, it can't be helped if they if they won't take less. Uh, oh, dear me, I was forgetting we must have another entree. Um, oh, goodness gracious, he clutched at his head. Who's going to get me the flowers? Uh, Dimitri, hey, Dimitri, uh, gallop off to our Moscow estate, he said to the factotum who appeared at his call. Uh, hurry off and tell Maxime the gardener to set the serfs to work. Say that everything out of the hothouses must be brought here well wrapped up in felt. I must have... Two hundred pots here on Friday. Having given several more orders, he was about to go to his little countess to have a rest, but remembering something else of importance, he returned again, called back the cook and the club steward, and again began giving orders. A light footstep and the clinking of spurs were heard at the door, and the young count, handsome, rosy, with a dark little moustache, evidently rested and made sleeker by his easy life in Moscow, entered the room. Ah, oh, my boy, my head's in a whirl, said the old man with a smile, as if he felt a little confused before his son. Now, if you would only help a bit, I must have singers, too. I, I shall have my own orchestra, but uh, shouldn't we get the gypsy singers as well? You, you military men like that sort of thing. Really, Papa, I believe Prince Bagration worried himself less before the Battle of Schoengraben than you do now, said his son with a smile. The old count pretended to be angry. Yes, you talk, but try it yourself. And the count turned to the cook, who, with a shrewd and respectful expression, looked observantly and sympathetically at the father and son. What have the young people come to nowadays, eh, Fjoktist? said he, laughing at us old fellows. That's so, Your Excellency. All they have to do is to eat a good dinner, but providing it and serving it all up, that's not their business. "'That's it! That's it!' exclaimed the Count, and gaily seizing his son by both hands, he cried, "'Now I've got you, so take the sleigh and pair at once, and go to Bezukhov's and tell him Count Ilya has sent you to ask for strawberries and fresh pineapples. We can't get them from anyone else. He's not there himself, so you'll have to go in and ask the princesses, and uh, from there go on to the Rasgulyai, uh, the coachman Ipatka knows, and look up the gypsy Ilyushka, the one who danced at Count Orlov's, you, you remember, in a white Cossack coat, and bring him along to me. <laughs> and am I to bring the gypsy girls along with him? asked Nicholas, laughing. Dear, dear. At that moment, with noiseless footsteps and with the business-like, preoccupied, yet meekly Christian look which never left her face, Anna Mikhailovna entered the hall. Though she came upon the Count in his dressing-gown every day, he invariably became confused and begged her to excuse his costume. "'No matter at all, my dear Count,' she said, meekly closing her eyes. "'But I'll go to Bezukhov's myself.' 
Pierre has arrived, and now we shall get anything we want from his hothouses. I have to see him in any case. He has forwarded me a letter from Boris. Thank God Boris is now on the staff. The Count was delighted at Anna Mikhailovna's taking upon herself one of his commissions, and ordered the small closed carriage for her. Uh, tell Bezukhov to come. I'll put his name down. Uh, is his wife with him? he asked. Anna Mikhailovna turned up her eyes, and profound sadness was depicted on her face. Oh, my dear friend, he's very unfortunate, she said. If what we hear is true, it is dreadful. How little we dreamed of such a thing when we were rejoicing at his happiness. And such a lofty, angelic soul as young Besuchov. Yes, I, I pity him from my heart, and shall try to give him what consolation I can. Oh, well, what's the matter? asked both the young and old Rostov. Anna Mikhailovna sighed deeply. Dolokhov, Mary Ivanovna's son, she said in a mysterious whisper, has compromised her completely, they say. Pierre took him up, invited him to his house in Petersburg, and now she has come here and that daredevil after her, said Anna Mikhailovna, wishing to show her sympathy for Pierre, but by involuntary intonations and a half-smile betraying her sympathy for the daredevil, as she called Dolokhov. They say Pierre is quite broken by his misfortune. Oh, dear, dear. But still, uh, tell him to come to the club. It will all blow over. It will be a tremendous banquet. Next day, the 3rd of March, soon after one o'clock, 250 members of the English club and 50 guests were awaiting the guest of honour and hero of the Austrian campaign, Prince Bagration, to dinner. On the first arrival of the news of the Battle of Austerlitz, Moscow had been bewildered. At that time the Russians were so used to victories that on receiving news of the defeat some would simply not believe it, while others sought some extraordinary explanation of so strange an event. In the English club, where all who were distinguished, important, and well-informed foregathered when the news began to arrive in December, nothing was said about the war and the last battle, as though all were in a conspiracy of silence. The men who set the tone in conversation, Count Rostopchin, Prince Yuri Dolgorukov, Valuyev, Count Markov, and Prince Vyazemsky, did not show themselves at the club, but met in private houses in intimate circles, and the Muscovites, who took their opinions from others, Ilya Rostov among them, remained for a while without any definite opinion on the subject of the war, and without leaders. The Muscovites felt that something was wrong, and that to discuss the bad news was difficult, and so it was best to be silent. But after a while, just as a jury comes out of its room, the big wigs who guided the club's opinion reappeared, and everybody began speaking clearly and definitely. Reasons were found for the incredible, unheard-of, and impossible event of a Russian defeat. Everything became clear, and in all corners of Moscow the same things began to be said. These reasons were the treachery of the Austrians, a defective commissariat, the treachery of the Pole Shebyshevsky, and of the Frenchman Langeron, Kutuzov's incapacity, and, it was whispered, the youth and inexperience of the sovereign, who had trusted worthless and insignificant people. But the army, the Russian army, everyone declared, was extraordinary and had achieved miracles of valour. The soldiers, officers and generals were heroes. But the hero of heroes was Prince Bagration, distinguished by his Schoengraben affair and by the retreat from Austerlitz, where he alone had withdrawn his column unbroken and had all day beaten back an enemy force twice as numerous as his own. What also conduced to Bagration's being selected as Moscow's hero was the fact that he had no connections in the city and was a stranger there. In his person, honour was shown to a simple fighting Russian soldier without connections and intrigues, and to one who was associated by memories of the Italian campaign with the name of Suvorov. Moreover, paying such honour to Bagration was the best way of expressing disapproval and dislike of Kutuzov. Had there been no Bagration, it would have been necessary to invent him, said the wit Shinshin, parodying the words of Voltaire. Kutuzov no one spoke of, except some who abused him in whispers, calling him a court weathercock and an old satyr. 
All Moscow repeated Prince Dolgorukov's saying, If you go on modelling and modelling, you must get smeared with clay, suggesting consolation for our defeat by the memory of former victories. And the words of Rostopchin, that French soldiers have to be incited to battle by highfalutin words, and Germans by logical arguments to show them that it is more dangerous to run away than to advance, but the Russian soldiers only need to be restrained and held back. On all sides, new and fresh anecdotes were heard of individual examples of heroism shown by our officers and men at Austerlitz. One had saved a standard, another had killed five Frenchmen, a third had loaded five cannons single-handed. Berg was mentioned by those who did not know him, as having, when wounded in the right hand, taken his sword in the left and gone forward. Of Bolkonsky nothing was said, and only those who knew him intimately regretted that he had died so young, leaving a pregnant wife with his eccentric father. Chapter 3. The Dinner. Bagration as Guest of Honor. On that 3rd of March all the rooms in the English club were filled with a hum of conversation like the hum of bees swarming in springtime. The members and guests of the club wandered hither and thither, sat, stood, met, and separated, some in uniform and some in evening dress, and a few here and there with powdered hair and in Russian kaftans. Powdered footmen in livery with buckled shoes and smart stockings stood at every door anxiously noting visitors' every movement in order to offer their services. Most of those present were elderly, respected men with broad, self-confident faces, fat fingers, and resolute gestures and voices. This class of guests and members sat in certain habitual places and met in certain habitual groups. A minority of those present were casual guests, chiefly young men among whom were Denisov, Rostov, and Dolokhov, who was now again an officer in the Semyonov regiment. The faces of these young people, especially those who were military men, bore that expression of condescending respect for their elders which seems to say to the older generation, we are prepared to respect and honour you, but all the same remember that the future belongs to us. Nizvitsky was there as an old member of the club. Pierre, who at his wife's command had let his hair grow and abandoned his spectacles, went about the rooms fashionably dressed but looking sad and dull. Here as elsewhere he was surrounded by an atmosphere of subservience to his wealth, and being in the habit of lording it over these people, he treated them with absent-minded contempt. By his age he should have belonged to the younger men, but by his wealth and connections he belonged to the groups of old and honoured guests, and so he went from one group to another. Some of the most important old men were the centre of groups which even strangers approached respectfully to hear the voices of well-known men. The largest circles formed round Count Rostopchin, Valuyev, and Narishkin. Rostopchin was describing how the Russians had been overwhelmed by flying Austrians and had had to force their way through them with bayonets. Valuyev was confidentially telling that Uvarov had been sent from Petersburg to ascertain what Moscow was thinking about Austerlitz. In the third circle, Narishkin was speaking of the meeting of the Austrian Council of War, at which Suvorov crowed like a cock in reply to the nonsense talked by the Austrian generals. Shinshin, standing close by, tried to make a joke saying that Kutuzov had evidently failed to learn from Suvorov even so simple a thing as the art of crowing like a cock. But the elder members glanced severely at the wit, making him feel that in that place and on that day it was improper to speak so of Kutuzov. Count Ilya Rostov, hurried and preoccupied, went about in his soft boots between the dining and drawing rooms, hastily greeting the important and unimportant, all of whom he knew, as if they were all equals while his eyes occasionally sought out his fine, well-set-up young son, resting on him and winking joyfully at him. Young Rostov stood at a window with Dolorov, whose acquaintance he had lately made and highly valued. The old count came up to them and pressed Dolokhov's hand. Please come and visit us. You know my brave boy. Been together out there, both playing the hero, eh? Ah, Vasily Ignatovich. How do you do, old fellow? he said, turning to an old man who was passing. But before he had finished his greeting, there was a general stir, and a footman who had run in announced with a frightened face, He's arrived! Bells rang, the stewards rushed forward, and, like rye shaken together in a shovel, the guests who had been scattered about in different rooms came together and crowded in the large drawing-room by the door of the ballroom. Bagration appeared in the doorway of the anteroom without hat or sword, 
which, in accord with the club custom, he had given up to the hall porter. He had no lambskin cap on his head, nor had he a loaded whip over his shoulder, as when Rostov had seen him on the eve of the Battle of Austerlitz, but wore a tight new uniform with Russian and foreign orders and the Star of St. George on his left breast. Evidently, just before coming to the dinner, he had had his hair and whiskers trimmed, which changed his appearance for the worse. There was something naively festive in his air, which, in conjunction with his firm and virile features, gave him a rather comical expression. Beklishov and Theodor Uvarov, who had arrived with him, paused at the doorway to allow him, as the guest of honour, to enter first. Bagration was embarrassed, not wishing to avail himself of their courtesy, and this caused some delay at the doors, but after all he did at last enter first. He walked shyly and awkwardly over the parquet floor of the reception room, not knowing what to do with his hands. He was more accustomed to walk over a ploughed field under fire, as he had done at the head of the Kursk regiment at Schoengraben, and he would have found that easier. The committeemen met him at the first door, and expressing their delight at seeing such a highly honoured guest, took possession of him, as it were, without waiting for his reply, surrounded him, and led him to the drawing-room. It was at first impossible to enter the drawing-room door for the crowd of members and guests jostling one another and trying to get a good look at Bagration over each other's shoulders, as if he was some rare animal. Count Ilyarostov, laughing and repeating the words, Make way, dear boys, make way, make way, pushed through the crowd more energetically than anyone, led the guests into the drawing-room, and seated them on the centre sofa. The big wigs, the most respected members of the club, beset the new arrivals. Count Ilya, again thrusting his way through the crowd, went out of the drawing-room, and reappeared a minute later with another committeeman, carrying a large silver salver, which he presented to Prince Bagration. On the salver lay some verses composed and printed in the hero's honour. Bagration, on seeing the salver, glanced around in dismay as though seeking help, but all eyes demanded that he should submit. Feeling himself in their power, he resolutely took the salver with both hands, and looked sternly and reproachfully at the Count who had presented it to him. Someone obligingly took the dish from Bagration, or he would have seemed to have held it till evening and have gone into dinner with it, and drew his attention to the verses. "'Well, I will read them, then,' Bagration seemed to say, and, fixing his weary eyes on the paper, began to read them with a fixed and serious expression. But the author himself took the verses and began reading them aloud. Note. The verses read and sung at this banquet are in very bad Russian, and their quality has been preserved in the translation. Bagration bowed his head and listened. Bring glory, then, to Alexander's reign, and on the throne our Titus shield. A dreaded foe be thou, kind-hearted as a man, a Rifius at home, a Caesar in the field. E'en fortunate Napoleon knows by experience now Bagration, and dare not Herculean Russians trouble. But before he had finished reading, a stentorian major-domo announced that dinner was ready. The door opened, and from the dining-room came the resounding strains of the Polonaise, Conquests joyful thunder waken, triumph valiant Russians now. And Count Rostov, glancing angrily at the author, who went on reading his verses, bowed to Bagration. Everyone rose, feeling that dinner was more important than verses, and Bagration, again preceding all the rest, went in to dinner. He was seated in the place of honour between two Alexanders, Bekleshov and Nadishkin, which was a significant allusion to the name of the sovereign. Three hundred persons took their seats in the dining-room, according to their rank and importance the more important nearer to the honoured guest, as naturally as water flows deepest where the land lies lowest. Just before dinner, Count Ilyarostov presented his son to Bagration, who recognised him and said a few words to him, disjointed and awkward, as were all the words he spoke that day, and Count Ilya looked joyfully and proudly around while Bagration spoke to his son. Nicholas Rostov, with Denisov and his new acquaintance Dolohov, sat almost at the middle of the table. Facing them sat Pierre beside Prince Nizvitsky. Count Ilyarostov, with the other members of the committee, sat facing Bagration, 
and, as the very personification of Moscow hospitality, did the honours to the prince. His efforts had not been in vain. The dinner, both the Lenten and the other fare, was splendid, yet he could not feel quite at ease till the end of the meal. He winked at the butler, whispered directions to the footman, and awaited each expected dish with some anxiety. Everything was excellent. With the second course, a gigantic sterlet, at sight of which Ilya Rostov blushed with self-conscious pleasure, the footman began popping corks and filling the champagne glasses. After the fish, which made a certain sensation, the Count exchanged glances with the other committeemen. "'There will be many toasts. It's time to begin,' he whispered, and taking up his glass he rose. All were silent, waiting for what he would say. "'To the health of our sovereign, the Emperor!' he cried, and at the same moment his kindly eyes grew moist with tears of joy and enthusiasm. The band immediately struck up, conquests, joyful thunder waken, all rose and cried, Hurrah! Bagration also rose and shouted, Hurrah! in exactly the same voice in which he had shouted it on the field at Schoengraben. Young Rostov's ecstatic voice could be heard above the three hundred others. He nearly wept. To the health of our sovereign, the emperor, he roared, Hurrah! and emptying his glass at one gulp, he dashed it to the floor. Many followed his example, and the loud shouting continued for a long time. When the voices subsided, the footman cleared away the broken glass, and everybody sat down again, smiling at the noise they had made, and exchanging remarks. The old count rose once more, glanced at a note lying beside his plate, and proposed a toast. To the health of the hero of our last campaign, Prince Peter Ivanovich Bagration! And again his blue eyes grew moist. Hurrah! cried the three hundred voices again. But instead of the band, a choir began singing a cantata composed by Paul Ivanovich Kutuzov. Note, he must not be confused with the commander-in-chief, Michael Ilarionovich Kutuzov. Russians, o'er all barriers on, courage, conquest, guarantees. Have we not Bagration? He brings foemen to their knees, etc. As soon as the singing was over, another and another toast was proposed, and Count Ilyarostov became more and more moved, more glass was smashed, and the shouting grew louder. They drank to Bekleshov, Narishkin, Uvarov, Dolgorukov, Apraksin, Valuyev, to the committee, to all the club members and to all the club guests, and finally to Count Ilyarostov separately as the organizer of the banquet. At that toast, the Count took out his handkerchief and, covering his face, wept outright. Chapter 4 Pierre Challenges Dolokhov Pierre sat opposite Dolokhov and Nicholas Rostov. As usual, he ate and drank much and eagerly. But those who knew him intimately noticed that some great change had come over him that day. He was silent all through dinner, and looked about, blinking and scowling, or with fixed eyes and a look of complete absent-mindedness, kept rubbing the bridge of his nose. His face was depressed and gloomy. He seemed to see and hear nothing of what was going on around him, and to be absorbed by some depressing and unsolved problem. The unsolved problem that tormented him was caused by hints given by the princess, his cousin, at Moscow concerning Dolokhov's intimacy with his wife, and by an anonymous letter he had received that morning, which in the mean, jocular way common to anonymous letters, said that he saw badly through his spectacles, but that his wife's connection with Dolokhov was a secret to no one but himself. Pierre absolutely disbelieved both the princess's hints and the letter but he feared now to look at Dolokhov, who was sitting opposite him. Every time he chanced to meet Dolokhov's handsome, insolent eyes, Pierre felt something terrible and monstrous rising in his soul, and turned quickly away. Involuntarily recalling his wife's past and her relations with Dolokhov, Pierre saw clearly that what was said in the letter might be true, or might at least seem to be true, had it not referred to his wife. He involuntarily remembered how Dolokhov, who had fully recovered his former position after the campaign, had returned to Petersburg and come to him. Availing himself of his friendly relations with Pierre as a boon companion, Dolokhov had come straight to his house, 
and Pierre had put him up and lent him money. Pierre recalled how Hélène had smilingly expressed disapproval of Dolokhov's living at their house, and how cynically Dolokhov had praised his wife's beauty to him, and from that time till they came to Moscow had not left them for a day. Yes, he is very handsome, thought Pierre, and I know him. It would be particularly pleasant to him to dishonor my name and ridicule me just because I have exerted myself on his behalf, befriended him and helped him. I know and understand what a spice that would add to the pleasure of deceiving me, if it really were true. Yes, if, if it were true, but I do not believe it. I have no right to it, and can't believe it. He remembered the expression Dolokhov's face assumed in his moments of cruelty, as when tying the policemen to the bear and dropping them into the water, or when he challenged a man to a duel without any reason, or shot a postboy's horse with a pistol. That expression was often on Dolokhov's face when looking at him. Yes, he is a bully, thought Pierre. To kill a man means nothing to him. It must seem to him that everyone is afraid of him, and that must please him. He must think that I, too, am afraid of him. And in fact I am afraid of him, he thought. And again he felt something terrible and monstrous rising in his soul. Dolokhov, Denisov, and Rostov were now sitting opposite Pierre and seemed very gay. Rostov was talking merrily to his two friends, one of whom was a dashing hussar and the other a notorious duelist and rake, and every now and then he glanced ironically at Pierre, whose preoccupied, absent-minded, and massive figure was a very noticeable one at the dinner. Rostov looked inimically at Pierre, first because Pierre appeared to his hussar eyes as a rich civilian, the husband of a beauty, and, in a word, an old woman, and, secondly, because Pierre in his preoccupation and absent-mindedness had not recognized Rostov and had not responded to his greeting. When the Emperor's health was drunk, Pierre, lost in thought, did not rise or lift his glass. "'What are you about?' shouted Rostov, looking at him in an ecstasy of exasperation. "'Don't you hear it's His Majesty the Emperor's health?' Pierre sighed, rose submissively, emptied his glass, and, waiting till all were seated again, turned with his kindly smile to Rostov. "'Why, I didn't recognize you,' he said. But Rostov was otherwise engaged. He was shouting hurrah. "'Why don't you renew the acquaintance?' said Dolokhov to Rostov. "'Confound him, he's a fool,' said Rostov. "'One should make up to the husbands of pretty women,' said Denisov. Pierre did not catch what they were saying, but knew they were talking about him. He reddened and turned away. "'Well, now to the health of handsome women,' said Dolokhov, and with a serious expression, but with a smile lurking at the corners of his mouth, he turned with his glass to Pierre. "'Here's to the health of lovely women, Petekin, and their lovers,' he added. Pierre, with downcast eyes, drank out of his glass without looking at Dolokhov or answering him. The footman, who was distributing leaflets with Kutuzov's cantata, laid one before Pierre as one of the principal guests. He was just going to take it when Dolokhov, leaning across, snatched it from his hand and began reading it. Pierre looked at Dolokhov and his eyes dropped. The something terrible and monstrous that had tormented him all dinner time rose and took possession of him. He leaned his whole massive body across the table. "'How dare you take it!' he shouted. Hearing that cry, and seeing to whom it was addressed, Nezvitsky and the neighbor on his right quickly turned in alarm to Bezukhov. "'Don't, don't! What are you about?' whispered their frightened voices. Dolokhov looked at Pierre with clear, mirthful, cruel eyes, and that smile of his which seemed to say, "'Ah, this is what I like!' "'You shan't have it,' he said distinctly. Pale, with quivering lips, Pierre snatched the copy. "'You... you... scoundrel!' I challenge you, he ejaculated, and pushing back his chair, he rose from the table. At the very instant he did this and uttered those words, Pierre felt that the question of his wife's guilt, which had been tormenting him the whole day, was finally and indubitably answered in the affirmative. He hated her and was forever sundered from her. Despite Denisov's request that he would take no part in the matter, Rostov agreed to be Dolokhov's second and after dinner he discussed the arrangements for the duel with Nezvitsky, Bezukhov's second. Pierre went home, 
but Rostov with Dolokhov and Denisov stayed on at the club till late, listening to the gypsies and other singers. Well then, till tomorrow at Sokolniki, said Dolokhov, as he took leave of Rostov in the club porch. And do you feel quite calm? Rostov asked. Dolokhov paused. Well, you see, I'll tell you the whole secret of dueling in two words. If you're going to fight a duel, and you make a will, and write affectionate letters to your parents, and if you think you may be killed, you're a fool and are lost for certain. But go with the firm intention of killing your man as quickly and surely as possible, and then all will be right, as our bear huntsman at Kostroma used to tell me. Everyone fears a bear, he says, but when you see one, your fear's all gone, and your only thought is not to let him get away. And that's how it is with me. A demain, mon cher. Till tomorrow, my dear fellow. Next day, at eight in the morning, Pierre and Nezvitsky drove to the Sokolniki forest and found Dolokhov, Denisov, and Rostov already there. Pierre had the air of a man preoccupied with considerations which had no connection with the matter in hand. His haggard face was yellow. He had evidently not slept that night. He looked about distractedly and screwed up his eyes as if dazzled by the sun. He was entirely absorbed by two considerations. His wife's guilt, of which after his sleepless night he had not the slightest doubt, and the guiltlessness of Dolokhov, who had no reason to preserve the honor of a man who was nothing to him. I should perhaps have done the same thing in his place, thought Pierre. It's even certain that I should have done the same. Then why this duel, this murder? Either I shall kill him, or he will hit me in the head or elbow or knee. Can't I go away from here, run away, bury myself somewhere, pass through his mind? But just at moments when such thoughts occurred to him, he would ask in a particularly calm and absent-minded way which inspired the respect of the onlookers, Will it be long? Are things ready? When all was ready, the sabres stuck in the snow to mark the barriers and the pistols loaded. Nezvitsky went up to Pierre. I should not be doing my duty, Count, he said in timid tones, and should not justify your confidence and the honor you have done me in choosing me for your second. If at this grave, this very grave moment, I did not tell you the whole truth. I think there is no sufficient ground for this affair or for blood to be shed over it. You were not right, not quite in the right. You were impetuous. Oh, yes, it is horribly stupid, said Pierre. Then allow me to express your regrets, and I'm sure your opponent will accept them, said Miss Visky, who, like the others concerned in the affair, and like everyone in similar cases, did not yet believe that the affair had come to an actual duel. You know, Count, it is much more honorable to admit one's mistake than to let matters become irreparable. There was no insult on either side. Allow me to convey... No. What is there to talk about, said Pierre? It's all the same. Is everything ready? He added. Only tell me where to go and where to shoot, he said with an unnaturally gentle smile. He took the pistol in his hand and began asking about the working of the trigger, as he had not before held a pistol in his hand, a fact that he did not wish to confess. Oh, yes, like that. I, I know. I, I only forgot, said he. No apologies, none whatever, said Dolokhov to Denisov, who on his side had been attempting a reconciliation. And he also went up to the appointed place. The spot chosen for the duel was some eighty paces from the road where the sleighs had been left, in a small clearing in the pine forest covered with melting snow, the frost having begun to break up during the last few days. The antagonist stood forty paces apart at the farther edge of the clearing. The seconds, measuring the paces, left tracks in the deep wet snow between the place where they had been standing and Nezvitsky's and Dolokhov's sabers, which were stuck into the ground ten paces apart to mark the barrier. It was thawing and misty. At forty paces' distance nothing could be seen. For three minutes all had been ready, but they still delayed, and all was silent. Chapter 5. The Duel "'Well, begin,' said Dolokhov. 
All right, said Pierre, still smiling in the same way. A feeling of dread was in the air. It was evident that the affair so lightly begun could no longer be averted, but was taking its course independently of men's will. Denisov first went to the barrier and announced, As the adversaries have refused a reconciliation, please proceed. Take your pistols, and at the word three, begin to advance. One, two, three, he shouted angrily and stepped aside. The combatants advanced along the trodden tracks, nearer and nearer to one another beginning to see one another through the mist. They had the right to fire when they liked as they approached the barrier. Dolohov walked slowly without raising his pistol, looking intently with his bright, sparkling blue eyes into his antagonist's face. His mouth wore its usual semblance of a smile. So I can fire when I like, said Pierre. And at the word three, he went quickly forward, missing the trodden path and stepping into the deep snow. He held the pistol in his right hand at arm's length, apparently afraid of shooting himself with it. His left hand he held carefully back because he wished to support his right hand with it and knew he must not do so. Having advanced six paces and strayed off the track into the snow, Pierre looked down at his feet and then quickly glanced at Dolohov and, bending his finger as he had been shown, fired. Not at all expecting so loud a report, Pierre shuddered at the sound, and then, smiling at his own sensations, stood still. The smoke, rendered denser by the mist, prevented him from seeing anything for an instant, but there was no second report as he had expected. He only heard Dolohov's hurried steps, and his figure came in view through the smoke. He was pressing one hand to his left side, while the other clutched his drooping pistol. His face was pale. Rostov ran toward him and said something. No, muttered Dolokhov through his teeth. No, it's not over. And after stumbling a few staggering steps right up to the sabre, he sank on the snow beside it. His left hand was bloody. He wiped it on his coat and supported himself with it. His frowning face was pallid and quivered. Please began Dolokhov, but could not at first pronounce the word. Please, he uttered with an effort. Pierre, hardly restraining his sobs, began running toward Dolokhov and was about to cross the space between the barriers when Dolokhov cried, To your barrier! And Pierre, grasping what was meant, stopped by his sabre. Only ten paces divided them. Dolokhov lowered his head to the snow, greedily bit at it, again raised his head, adjusted himself, drew in his legs and sat up, seeking a firm center of gravity. He sucked and swallowed the cold snow. His lips quivered, but his eyes, still smiling, glittered with effort and exasperation as he mustered his remaining strength. He raised his pistol and aimed. Sideways! Cover yourself with your pistol! ejaculated Nezvitsky. Cover yourself! even Denisov cried to his adversary. Pierre, with a gentle smile of pity and remorse, his arms and legs helplessly spread out, stood with his broad chest directly facing Dolokhov and looked sorrowfully at him. Denisov, Rostov, and Nezvitsky closed their eyes. At the same instant they heard a report and Dolokhov's angry cry. Mist! shouted Dolokhov, and he lay helplessly face downwards on the snow. Pierre clutched his temples and, turning round, went into the forest, trampling through the deep snow and muttering incoherent words. Folly, folly, death, lies, he repeated, puckering his face. Nizvitsky stopped him and took him home. Rostov and Denisov drove away with the wounded Dolokhov. The latter lay silent in the sleigh with closed eyes and did not answer a word to the questions addressed to him. But on entering Moscow, he suddenly came to, and lifting his head with an effort, took Rostov, who was sitting beside him, by the hand. Rostov was struck by the totally altered and unexpectedly rapturous and tender expression on Dolokhov's face. Well, how do you feel? he asked. Bad. But it's not that, my friend, 
said Dolohov with a gasping voice. Where are we? In Moscow, I know. I don't matter. But I have killed her. Killed. She won't get over it. She won't survive. Who? asked Rostov. My mother. My mother. My angel. My adored angel mother. And Dolohov pressed Rostov's hand and burst into tears. When he had become a little quieter, he explained to Rostov that he was living with his mother, who, if she saw him dying, would not survive it. He implored Rostov to go on and prepare her. Rostov went on ahead to do what was asked, and to his great surprise learned that Dolohov the brawler, Dolohov the bully, lived in Moscow with an old mother and a hunchback sister, and was the most affectionate of sons and brothers. Chapter 6 Pierre's Separation from Hélène Pierre had of late rarely seen his wife alone. Both in Petersburg and in Moscow their house was always full of visitors. The night after the duel he did not go to his bedroom, but, as he often did, remained in his father's room, that huge room in which Count Vizukhov had died. He lay down on the sofa, meaning to fall asleep and forget all that had happened to him, but could not do so. Such a storm of feelings, thoughts, and memories suddenly arose within him that he could not fall asleep, nor even remain in one place, but had to jump up and pace the room with rapid steps. Now he seemed to see her in the early days of their marriage, with bare shoulders and a languid, passionate look on her face, and then immediately he saw beside her Dolohov's handsome, insolent, hard and mocking face as he had seen it at the banquet, and then that same face, pale, quivering and suffering, as it had been when he reeled and sank on the snow. What has happened? he asked himself. I have killed her lover. Yes, killed my wife's lover. Yes, that was it. And why? How did I come to do it? Because you married her, answered an inner voice. But in what was I to blame? he asked. In marrying her without loving her, in deceiving yourself and her. And he vividly recalled that moment after supper at Prince Vasily's when he spoke those words he had found so difficult to utter. I love you. It all comes from that. Even then I felt it, he thought. I felt then that it was not so, that I had no right to do it. And so it turns out. He remembered his honeymoon and blushed at the recollection. Particularly vivid, humiliating and shameful was the recollection of how one day soon after his marriage he came out of the bedroom into his study a little before noon in his silk dressing gown and found his head steward there, who, bowing respectfully, looked into his face and at his dressing-gown, and smiled slightly, as if expressing respectful understanding of his employer's happiness. But how often I have felt proud of her, proud of her majestic beauty and social tact, thought he, been proud of my house in which she received all Petersburg, proud of her unapproachability and beauty. So this is what I was proud of, I then thought that I did not understand her. How often, when considering her character, I have told myself that I was, to, I was to blame for not understanding her, for not understanding that constant composure and complacency and lack of all interests or desires. And the whole secret lies in the terrible truth that she is a depraved woman. Now I have spoken that terrible word to myself, all has become clear. Anatole used to come to borrow money from her and used to kiss her naked shoulders. She did not give him the money, but let herself be kissed. Her father, in jest, tried to rouse her jealousy, and she replied with a calm smile that she was not so stupid as to be jealous. Let him do what he pleases, she used to say of me. One day I asked her if she felt any symptoms of pregnancy. She laughed contemptuously and said she was not a fool to want to have children, and that she was not going to have any children by me. Then he recalled the coarseness and bluntness of her thoughts, 
and the vulgarity of the expressions that were natural to her, though she had been brought up in the most aristocratic circles. I am not such a fool. Just you try it on. Allez-vous promener, you clear out of this, she used to say. Often seeing the success she had with young and old men and women, Pierre could not understand why he did not love her. Yes, I never loved her, said he to himself. I knew she was a depraved woman, he repeated, but dared not admit it to myself. And now there's Dolokhov sitting in the snow with a forced smile and perhaps dying, while meeting my remorse with some forced bravado. Pierre was one of those people who, in spite of an appearance of what is called weak character, do not seek a confidant in their troubles. He digested his sufferings alone. It is all, all her fault, he said to himself. But what of that? Why did I bind myself to her? Why did I say, je vous aime, I love you to her? Which was a lie, and worse than a lie. I am guilty and must endure... What? A slur on my name? A misfortune for life? No, oh, that's nonsense, he thought. The slur on my name and honor, that's all apart from myself. Louis the Sixteenth was executed because they said he was dishonorable and a criminal, came into Pierre's head. And from their point of view they were right, as were those two who canonized him and died a martyr's death for his sake. Then Robespierre was beheaded for being a despot. Who is right and who is wrong? No one. But if you are alive, live. Tomorrow you'll die, as I might have died an hour ago. And is it worth tormenting oneself when one has only a moment of life in comparison with eternity? But at the moment when he imagined himself calmed by such reflections, she suddenly came into his mind as she was at the moments when he had most strongly expressed his insincere love for her, and he felt the blood rush to his heart and had again to get up and move about and break and tear whatever came to his hand. Tanned. 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 Why did I tell her that je vous aime? he kept repeating to himself. And when he had said it for the tenth time, Moliere's words, Mais que diable allait-il faire dans cette galère? What the dickens did he get himself into that mess for? Or, more literally, what the devil was he going to do in that galley? occurred to him, and he began to laugh to himself. In the night he called his valet and told him to pack up to go to Petersburg. He could not imagine how he could speak to her now. He resolved to go away next day and leave a letter informing her of his intention to part from her forever. Next morning, when the valet came into the room with his coffee, Pierre was lying asleep on the ottoman with an open book in his hand. He woke up and looked round for a while with a startled expression unable to realize where he was. The countess told me to inquire whether your excellency was at home, said the valet. But before Pierre could decide what answer he would send, the countess herself, in a white satin dressing gown embroidered with silver and with simply dressed hair, two immense plaits twice round her lovely head like a coronet, entered the room, calm and majestic, except that there was a wrathful wrinkle on her rather prominent marble brow. With her imperturbable calm, she did not begin to speak in front of the valet. She knew of the duel and had come to speak about it. She waited till the valet had set down the coffee things and left the room. Pierre looked at her timidly over his spectacles, and like a hare surrounded by hounds who lays back her ears and continues to crouch motionless before her enemies, he tried to continue reading. But feeling this to be senseless and impossible, he again glanced timidly at her. She did not sit down, but looked at him with a contemptuous smile, waiting for the valet to go. Well, what's this now? What have you been up to now, I should like to know? She asked sternly. I, what, what, what have I? stammered Pierre. So it seems you're a hero, eh? Come now, what was this duel about? What is it meant to prove? What, I ask you? Pierre turned over heavily on the ottoman and opened his mouth, but could not reply. 
If you won't answer, I'll tell you. Hélène went on. You believe everything you're told. You were told? <laughs> Hélène laughed. That Dolohov was my lover. She said in French with her coarse plainness of speech, uttering the word amant as casually as any other word. And you believed it. Well, what have you proved? What does this duel prove? That you're a fool. Que vous êtes un sot. But everybody knew that. What will be the result? That I shall be the laughing stock of old Moscow. That everyone will say that you, drunk and not knowing what you were about, challenged a man you are jealous of without cause. Hélène raised her voice and became more and more excited. A man who's a better man than you in every way. <clears throat> growled Pierre, frowning without looking at her and not moving a muscle. And how could you believe he was my lover? Why? Because I like his company? If you were cleverer and more agreeable, I should prefer yours. Don't speak to me, I, I beg you, muttered Pierre hoarsely. Why shouldn't I speak? I can speak as I like. And I tell you plainly that there are not many wives with husbands such as you who would not have taken lovers, des amants, but I have not done so, said she. Pierre wished to say something, looked at her with eyes whose strange expression she did not understand, and lay down again. He was suffering physically at that moment. There was a weight on his chest, and he could not breathe. He knew that he must do something to put an end to this suffering, but what he wanted to do was too terrible. We had better separate, he muttered in a broken voice. Separate? Very well, but only if you give me a fortune, said Hélène. Separate? That's a thing to frighten me with. Pierre leaped up from the sofa and rushed staggering toward her. I'll kill you, he shouted, and seizing the marble top of a table with a strength he had never before felt, he made a step toward her, brandishing the slab. Hélène's face became terrible. She shrieked and sprang aside. His father's nature showed itself in Pierre. He felt the fascination and delight of frenzy. He flung down the slab, broke it, and swooping down on her with outstretched hands, shouted, Get out! in such a terrible voice that the whole house heard it with horror. God knows what he would have done at that moment had Hélène not fled from the room. A week later, Pierre gave his wife full power to control all his estates in Great Russia, which formed the larger part of his property and left for Petersburg alone. Chapter 7 Andrew Considered Dead Two months had elapsed since the news of the Battle of Orsolitz and the loss of Prince Andrew had reached Bald Hills, and in spite of the letters sent through the embassy and all the searches made, his body had not been found, nor was he on the list of prisoners. What was worst of all for his relations was the fact that there was still a possibility of his having been picked up on the battlefield by the people of the place, and that he might now be lying, recovering or dying, alone among strangers and unable to send news of himself. The gazettes from which the old prince first heard of the defeat at Austerlitz stated, as usual, very briefly and vaguely, that after brilliant engagements the Russians had had to retreat and had made their withdrawal in perfect order. The old prince understood from this official report that our army had been defeated. A week after the Gazette report of the Battle of Austerlitz came a letter from Kutuzov informing the prince of the fate that had befallen his son. Your son, wrote Kutuzov, fell before my eyes, a standard in his hand and at the head of a regiment. He fell as a hero, worthy of his father and his fatherland. To the great regret of myself and of the whole army, it is still uncertain whether he is alive or not. I comfort myself and you with the hope that your son is alive, for otherwise he would have been mentioned among the officers found on the field of battle, a list of whom has been sent me under flag of truce. After receiving this news late in the evening, when he was alone in his study, the old prince went for his walk as usual next morning, but he was silent with his steward, the gardener, and the architect and though he looked very grim, he said nothing to anyone. When Princess Mary went to him at the usual hour, he was working at his lathe, and, as usual, did not look round at her. Ah, Princess Mary, he said suddenly in an unnatural voice, throwing down his chisel. The wheel continued to revolve by its own impetus, and Princess Mary long remembered the dying creak of that wheel which merged in her memory with what followed. She approached him, 
saw his face, and something gave way within her. Her eyes grew dim. By the expression of her father's face, not sad, not crushed, but angry and working unnaturally, she saw that hanging over her and about to crush her was some terrible misfortune, the worst in life, one she had not yet experienced, irreparable and incomprehensible, the death of one she loved. Father, Andrew, said the ungraceful, awkward princess, with such an indescribable charm of sorrow and self-forgetfulness that her father could not bear her look, but turned away with a sob. Bad news. He's not among the prisoners, nor among the killed. Kutuzov writes, and he screamed as piercingly as if he wished to drive the princess away by that scream, Killed! The princess did not fall down or faint. She was already pale, but on hearing these words, her face changed and something brightened in her beautiful, radiant eyes. It was as if joy, a supreme joy apart from the joys and sorrows of this world, overflowed the great grief within her. She forgot all fear of her father, went up to him, took his hand, and drawing him down, put her arm round his thin, scraggy neck. Father, she said, do not turn away from me. Let us weep together. Scoundrels! Blackguards! shrieked the old man, turning his face away from her. Destroying the army, destroying the men, and why? Go, go, go and tell these. The princess sank helplessly into an armchair beside her father and wept. She saw her brother now, as he had been at the moment when he took leave of her and of Lee's, his look tender yet proud. She saw him tender and amused, as he was when he put on the little icon. Did he believe? Had he repented of his unbelief? Was he now there, there in the realms of eternal peace and blessedness, she thought? Father, tell me how it happened, she asked through her tears. Go, go, killed in battle, where the best of Russian men and Russians' glory were led to destruction. Go, Princess Mary, go and tell Lise, I will follow. When Princess Mary returned from her father, the little princess sat working and looked up with that curious expression of inner, happy calm peculiar to pregnant women. It was evident that her eyes did not see Princess Mary, but were looking within, into herself, at something joyful and mysterious taking place within her. Mary, she said, moving away from her embroidery frame and lying back, give me your hand. She took her sister-in-law's hand and held it below her waist. Her eyes were smiling expectantly. Her downy lip rose and remained lifted in childlike happiness. Princess Mary knelt down before her and hid her face in the folds of her sister-in-law's dress. There, there, did you feel it? I feel so strange. And do you know, Mary, I'm going to love him very much, said Lees, looking with bright and happy eyes at her sister-in-law. Princess Mary could not lift her head. She was weeping. What is the matter, Mary? Nothing. Only I feel sad. Sad about Andrew, she said, wiping away her tears on her sister-in-law's knee. Several times in the course of the morning, Princess Mary began trying to prepare her sister-in-law, and every time began to cry. Unobservant as was the little princess, these tears, the cause of which she did not understand, agitated her. She said nothing, but looked about uneasily as if in search of something. Before dinner, the old prince, of whom she was always afraid, came into her room with a peculiarly restless and malign expression, and went out again without saying a word. She looked at Princess Mary then sat thinking for a while with that expression of attention to something within her that is only seen in pregnant women, and suddenly began to cry. "'Has anything come from Andrew?' she asked. "'No, you know it's too soon for news, but my father is anxious, and I feel afraid. So there's nothing?' "'Nothing,' answered Princess Mary, looking firmly with her radiant eyes at her sister-in-law. She had determined not to tell her, 
and persuaded her father to hide the terrible news from her till after her confinement, which was expected within a few days. Princess Mary and the old prince each bore and hid their grief in their own way. The old prince would not cherish any hope. He made up his mind that Prince Andrew had been killed, and though he sent an official to Austria to seek for traces of his son, he ordered a monument from Moscow which he intended to erect in his own garden to his memory, and he told everybody that his son had been killed. He tried not to change his former way of life, but his strength failed him. He walked less, ate less, slept less, and became weaker every day. Princess Mary hoped. She prayed for her brother as living, and was always awaiting news of his return. Chapter 8 Lise's Confinement Andrew Arrives Dearest, said the little princess after breakfast on the morning of the 19th of March, and her downy little lip rose from old habit. But as sorrow was manifest in every smile, the sound of every word, and even every footstep in that house since the terrible news had come, so now the smile of the little princess, influenced by the general mood, though without knowing its cause, was such as to remind one still more of the general sorrow. Dearest, I'm afraid this morning's frustig, as Foka the cook calls it, has disagreed with me. What is the matter with you, my darling? You look pale. Oh, you're very pale, said Princess Mary in alarm, running with her soft, ponderous steps up to her sister-in-law. Your Excellency, should not Mary Bogdanovna be sent for? said one of the maids who was present. Mary Bogdanovna was a midwife from the neighboring town who had been at Bald Hills for the last fortnight. Oh, yes, assented Princess Mary. Perhaps that's it. I'll go. Courage, my angel. She kissed Lees and was about to leave the room. Oh, no, no. And besides the pallor and the physical suffering on the little princess's face, an expression of childish fear of inevitable pain showed itself. No, it's only indigestion. Say it's only indigestion. Say so, Mary. Say it. And the little princess began to cry capriciously like a suffering child and to wring her little hands, even with some affectation. Princess Mary ran out of the room to fetch Mary Bogdanovna. Mon Dieu, mon Dieu, oh, she heard as she left the room. The midwife was already on her way to meet her, rubbing her small, plump white hands with an air of calm importance. Mary Bogdanovna, I think it's beginning, said Princess Mary, looking at the midwife with wide-open eyes of alarm. Well, the Lord be thanked, Princess, said Mary Bogdanovna, not hastening her steps. You young ladies should not know anything about it. But how is it the doctor from Moscow is not here yet? said the princess. In accordance with Lise's and Prince Andrew's wishes, they had sent in good time to Moscow for a doctor, and were expecting him at any moment. No matter, princess, don't be alarmed, said Mary Bogdanovna. We'll manage very well without a doctor. Five minutes later, Princess Mary, from her room, heard something heavy being carried by. She looked out. The men-servants were carrying the large leather sofa from Prince Andrew's study into the bedroom. On their faces was a quiet and solemn look. Princess Mary sat alone in her room, listening to the sounds in the house, now and then opening her door when someone passed, and watching what was going on in the passage. Some women, passing with quiet steps in and out of the bedroom, glanced at the princess and turned away. She did not venture to ask any questions, and shut the door again, now sitting down in her easy chair, now taking her prayer book, now kneeling before the icon stand. To her surprise and distress, she found that her prayers did not calm her excitement. Suddenly, her door opened softly, and her old nurse Praskovia Savishna, who hardly ever came to that room, as the old prince had forbidden it, appeared on the threshold with a shawl round her head. "'I've come to sit with you a bit, Masha,' said the nurse. And here I've brought the prince's wedding candles to light before his saint, my angel, she said with a sigh. Oh, nurse, I'm so glad. God is merciful, birdie. The nurse lit the gilt candles before the icons and sat down by the door with her knitting. Princess Mary took a book and began reading. Only when footsteps or voices were heard did they look at one another. 
the princess anxious and inquiring, the nurse encouraging. Everyone in the house was dominated by the same feeling that Princess Mary experienced as she sat in her room. But owing to the superstition that the fewer the people who know of it, the less a woman in travail suffers, everyone tried to pretend not to know. No one spoke of it, but apart from the ordinary staid and respectful good manners habitual in the prince's household, a common anxiety, a softening of the heart, and a consciousness that something great and mysterious was being accomplished at that moment, made itself felt. There was no laughter in the maid's large hall. In the men-servants' hall, all sat waiting, silently and alert. In the outlying serfs' quarters, torches and candles were burning, and no one slept. The old prince, stepping on his heels, paced up and down his study, and sent Tikhon to ask Mary Bogdanovna what news. Say only that the prince told me to ask, and come and tell me her answer. Inform the prince that labor has begun, said Mary Bogdanovna, giving the messenger a significant look. Tikhon went and told the prince. Very good, said the prince, closing the door behind him. And Tikhon did not hear the slightest sound from the study after that. After a while, he re-entered it, as if to snuff the candles, and, seeing the prince was lying on the sofa, looked at him, noticed his perturbed face, shook his head, and, going up to him silently, kissed him on the shoulder, and left the room without snuffing the candles or saying why he had entered. The most solemn mystery in the world continued its course. Evening passed, night came, and the feeling of suspense and softening of heart in the presence of the unfathomable did not lessen, but increased. No one slept. It was one of those March nights when winter seems to wish to resume its sway and scatters its last snows and storms with desperate fury. A relay of horses had been sent up the high road to meet the German doctor from Moscow who was expected every moment and men on horseback with lanterns were sent to the crossroads to guide him over the country road with its hollows and snow-covered pools of water. Princess Mary had long since put aside her book. She sat silent, her luminous eyes fixed on her nurse's wrinkled face, every line of which she knew so well, on the lock of grey hair that escaped from under the kerchief, and the loose skin that hung under her chin. Nurse Savishna, knitting in hand, was telling in low tones, scarcely hearing or understanding her own words, what she had told hundreds of times before, how the late princess had given birth to Princess Mary in Kishinyov with only a Moldavian peasant woman to help instead of a midwife. "'God is merciful. Doctors are never needed,' she said. Suddenly a gust of wind beat violently against the casement of the window from which the double frame had been removed. By order of the prince, one window frame was removed in each room as soon as the locks returned, and, forcing open a loosely closed latch, set the damask curtain flapping and blew out the candle with its chill, snowy draught. Princess Mary shuddered. Her nurse, putting down the stocking she was knitting, went to the window and, leaning out, tried to catch the open casement. The cold wind flapped the ends of her kerchief and her loose locks of grey hair. "'Princess, my dear, there's someone driving up the avenue,' she said, holding the casement and not closing it. "'With lanterns. Most likely the doctor.' "'Oh, my God, thank God,' said Princess Mary. "'I must go and meet him. He does not know Russian.' Princess Mary threw a shawl over her head and ran to meet the newcomer. As she was crossing the anteroom, she saw through the window a carriage with lanterns standing at the entrance. She went out on the stairs. On a banister post stood a tallow candle which guttered in the draught. On the landing below, Philip the footman stood, looking scared and holding another candle. Still lower, beyond the turn of the staircase, one could hear the footstep of someone in thick felt boots, and a voice that seemed familiar to Princess Mary was saying something. Thank God, said the voice. And father? Gone to bed, replied the voice of Demyan, the house steward, who was downstairs. Then the voice said something more. Demyan replied, and the steps in the felt boots approached the unseen bend of the staircase more rapidly. "'It's Andrew,' thought Princess Mary. "'No, it can't be. That, that would be too extraordinary.' And at the very moment she thought this, the face and figure of Prince Andrew, in a fur cloak, the deep collar of which was covered with snow, 
appeared on the landing where the footman stood with the candle. Yes, it was he, pale, thin, with a changed and strangely softened but agitated expression on his face. He came up the stairs and embraced his sister. You did not get my letter? he asked, and not waiting for a reply, which he would not have received for the princess was unable to speak, he turned back, rapidly mounted the stairs again with the doctor who had entered the hall after him, they had met at the last post station, and again embraced his sister. What a strange fate, Masha, darling! And having taken off his cloak and felt boots, he went to the little princess's apartment. Chapter 9 Death of Lise The little princess lay supported by pillows with a white cap on her head. The pains had just left her. Strands of her black hair lay round her inflamed and perspiring cheeks. Her charming rosy mouth with its downy lip was open, and she was smiling joyfully. Prince Andrew entered and paused facing her at the foot of the sofa on which she was lying. Her glittering eyes, filled with childlike fear and excitement, rested on him without changing their expression. I love you all and have done no harm to anyone. Why must I suffer so? Help me, her look seemed to say. She saw her husband, but did not realize the significance of his appearance before her now. Prince Andrew went round the sofa and kissed her forehead. My darling, he said a word he had never used to her before. God is merciful. She looked at him inquiringly and with childlike reproach. I expected help from you, and I get none. None from you either, said her eyes. She was not surprised at his having come. She did not realize that he had come. His coming had nothing to do with her sufferings or with their relief. The pangs began again and Mary Bogdanovna advised Prince Andrew to leave the room. The doctor entered. Prince Andrew went out, and meeting Princess Mary again joined her. They began talking in whispers, but their talk broke off at every moment. They waited and listened. "'Go, dear,' said Princess Mary. Prince Andrew went again to his wife, and sat waiting in the room next to hers. A woman came from the bedroom with a frightened face and became confused when she saw Prince Andrew. He covered his face with his hands and remained so for some minutes. Piteous, helpless animal moans came through the door. Prince Andrew got up, went to the door, and tried to open it. Someone was holding it shut. "'You can't come in! You can't!' said a terrified voice from within. He began pacing the room. The screaming ceased and a few more seconds went by. Then suddenly a terrible shriek, it could not be hers, she could not scream like that, came from the bedroom. Prince Andrew ran to the door. The scream ceased, and he heard the wail of an infant. What have they taken a baby in there for? thought Prince Andrew in the first second. A baby? What baby? Why is there a baby there? What is the baby born? Then suddenly he realized the joyful significance of that wail. Tears choked him, and leaning his elbows on the window sill, he began to cry, sobbing like a child. The door opened. The doctor, with his shirt sleeves tucked up, without a coat, pale and with a trembling jaw, came out of the room. Prince Andrew turned to him. But the doctor gave him a bewildered look and passed by without a word. A woman rushed out, and seeing Prince Andrew, stopped, hesitating on the threshold. He went into his wife's room. She was lying dead, in the same position he had seen her in five minutes before, and despite the fixed eyes and the pallor of the cheeks, the same expression was on her charming childlike face with its upper lip covered with tiny black hair. I love you all, and have done no harm to anyone. And what have you done to me?" said her charming, pathetic, dead face. In a corner of the room, something red and tiny gave a grunt and squealed in Mary Bogdanovna's trembling white hands. 
Two hours later, Prince Andrew, stepping softly, went into his father's room. The old man already knew everything. He was standing close to the door, and as soon as it opened, his rough old arms closed like a vice round his son's neck, and without a word he began to sob like a child. Three days later, the little princess was buried, and Prince Andrew went up the steps to where the coffin stood to give her the farewell kiss. And there in the coffin was the same face, though with closed eyes. Ah, what have you done to me, it still seemed to say. And Prince Andrew felt that something gave way in his soul, and that he was guilty of a sin he could neither remedy nor forget. He could not weep. The old man, too, came up and kissed the waxen little hands that lay quietly crossed one on the other on her breast, and to him, too, her face seemed to say, Ah, oh, what have you done to me, and why? And at the sight the old man turned angrily away. Another five days passed, and then the young Prince Nicholas Andreevich was baptized. The wet nurse supported the coverlet with her chin, while the priest with a goose feather anointed the boy's little red and wrinkled soles and palms. His grandfather, who was his godfather, trembling and afraid of dropping him, carried the infant round the battered tin font and handed him over to the godmother, Princess Mary. Prince Andrew sat in another room, faint with fear lest the baby should be drowned in the font, and awaited the termination of the ceremony. He looked up joyfully at the baby when the nurse brought it to him, and nodded approval when she told him that the wax with the baby's hair had not sunk in the font, but had floated. Note, in the Russian baptismal service, the priest cuts off a little of the child's hair and sticks it together with wax from a taper. It is considered unlucky if this wax sinks in the font. Chapter 10 Denisov and Dolokhov at the Rostovs. Rostov's share in Dolokhov's duel with Bezukhov was hushed up by the efforts of the old count, and instead of being degraded to the ranks as he expected, he was appointed an adjutant to the governor-general of Moscow. As a result, he could not go to the country with the rest of the family, but was kept all summer in Moscow by his new duties. Dolokhov recovered, and Rostov became very friendly with him during his convalescence. Dolokhov lay ill at his mother's, who loved him passionately and tenderly, and old Mary Ivanovna, who had grown fond of Rostov for his friendship to her Fedya, often talked to him about her son. Yes, Count, she would say, he is too noble and pure-souled for our present depraved world. No one now loves virtue. It seems like a reproach to everyone. Now tell me, Count, was it right? Was it honourable of Bezukhov? and Fedya, with his noble spirit, loved him, and even now never says a word against him. Those pranks in Petersburg, when they played some tricks on a policeman, didn't they do it together? And there, Bezukhov got off scot-free, while Fedya had to bear the whole burden on his shoulders. Fancy what he had to go through. It's true he has been reinstated, but how could they fail to do that? I, I think there were not many such gallant sons of the fatherland out there as he. And now, this duel. Have these people no feeling or honour? Knowing him to be an only son, to challenge him and shoot so straight? It's well God had mercy on us. And what was it for? Who doesn't have intrigues nowadays? Why, if he was so jealous as I see things, he, he should have shown it sooner. But he lets it go on for months. And then to call him out, reckoning on Fedya not fighting because he owed him money. What baseness, what meanness. I know you understand, Fedya, my dear Count. That, believe me, is why I'm so fond of you. Few people do understand him. He's such a lofty, heavenly soul. Dolokhov himself, during his convalescence, spoke to Rostov in a way no one would have expected of him. I know people consider me a bad man, he said. Let them. I don't care a straw about anyone but those I love. But those I love, I love so that I would give my life for them, and the others I'd throttle if they stood in my way. I have an adored, a priceless mother, and two or three friends, you among them, 
and as for the rest, I only care about them in so far as they are harmful or useful, and most of them are harmful, especially the women. Yes, dear boy, he continued, I've met loving, noble, high-minded men, but I've not yet met any women, countesses or cooks, who were not venal. I've not yet met that divine purity and devotion I look for in women. If I found such a one, I'd give my life for her. But those and he made a gesture of contempt. And believe me, if I still value my life, it is only because I still hope to meet such a divine creature who will regenerate, purify, and elevate me. But you don't understand it. Oh, yes, I quite understand, answered Rostov, who was under his new friend's influence. In the autumn, the Rostovs returned to Moscow. Early in the winter, Denisov also came back and stayed with them. The first half of the winter of 1806, which Nicholas Rostov spent in Moscow, was one of the happiest, merriest times for him and the whole family. Nicholas brought many young men to his parents' house. Viera was a handsome girl of twenty, Sonia a girl of sixteen with all the charm of an opening flower. Natasha, half grown up and half child, was now childishly amusing, now girlishly enchanting. At that time in the Rostovs' house there prevailed an amorous atmosphere characteristic of homes where there are very young and very charming girls. Every young man who came to the house, seeing those impressionable smiling young faces, smiling probably at their own happiness, feeling the eager bustle around him and hearing the fitful bursts of song and music and the inconsequent but friendly prattle of young girls ready for anything and full of hope, experienced the same feeling sharing with the young folk of the Rostovs' household a readiness to fall in love and an expectation of happiness. Among the young men introduced by Rostov, one of the first was Dolokhov, whom everyone in the house liked except Natasha. She almost quarreled with her brother about him. She insisted that he was a bad man, and that in the duel with Bezukhov, Pierre was right and Dolokhov wrong, and further that he was disagreeable and unnatural. "'There's nothing for me to understand,' she cried out with resolute self-will. "'He is wicked and heartless. "'There, now, I, I like your Denisov, though he is a rake and all that. "'Still I like him. "'So, you see, I do understand. I, I don't know how to put it. "'With this one everything is calculated, and I don't like that. "'But Denisov—' "'Oh, Denisov is quite different,' replied Nicholas, "'implying that even Denisov was nothing compared to Dolokhov. You must understand what a soul there is in Dolokhov. You should see him with his mother. What a heart! Well, I don't know about that, but I am uncomfortable with him. And do you know he's fallen in love with Sonia? What nonsense! I'm certain of it. You'll see. Natasha's prediction proved true. Dolokhov, who did not usually care for the society of ladies, began to come often to the house. And the question for whose sake he came, though no one spoke of it, was soon settled. He came because of Sonia. And Sonia, though she would never have dared to say so, knew it and blushed scarlet every time Dolokhov appeared. Dolokhov often dined at the Rostovs, never missed a performance at which they were present, and went to Yogel's balls for young people which the Rostovs always attended. He was pointedly attentive to Sonia and looked at her in such a way that not only could she not bear his glances without colouring, but even the old countess and Natasha blushed when they saw his looks. It was evident that this strange, strong man was under the irresistible influence of the dark, graceful girl who loved another. Rostov noticed something new in Dolokhov's relations with Sonia, but he did not explain to himself what these new relations were. They're always in love with someone, he thought of Sonia and Natasha. But he was not as much at ease with Sonia and Dolokhov as before, and was less frequently at home. In the autumn of 1806, everybody had again begun talking of the war with Napoleon with even greater warmth than the year before. Orders were given to raise recruits, ten men in every thousand for the regular army, and besides this, nine men in every thousand for the militia. Everywhere Bonaparte was anathematized, and in Moscow nothing but the coming war was talked of. For the Rostov family, 
The whole interest of these preparations for war lay in the fact that Nicholas would not hear of remaining in Moscow and only awaited the termination of Denisov's furlough after Christmas to return with him to their regiment. His approaching departure did not prevent his amusing himself, but rather gave zest to his pleasures. He spent the greater part of his time away from home at dinners, parties, and balls. Chapter 11 Sonya Declines Dolokhov's Proposal on the third day after Christmas, Nicholas dined at home, a thing he had rarely done of late. It was a grand farewell dinner, as he and Denisov were leaving to join their regiment after Epiphany. About twenty people were present, including Dolokhov and Denisov. Never had love been so much in the air, and never had the amorous atmosphere made itself so strongly felt in the Rostov's house as at this holiday time. Seize the moments of happiness, love and be loved. That is the only reality in the world. All else is folly. It is the one thing we are interested in here, said the spirit of the place. Nicholas, having as usual exhausted two pairs of horses without visiting all the places he meant to go to and where he had been invited, returned home just before dinner. As soon as he entered, he noticed and felt the tension of the amorous air in the house and also noticed a curious embarrassment among some of those present. Sonia, Dolokhov, and the old countess were especially disturbed, and, to a lesser degree, Natasha. Nicholas understood that something must have happened between Sonia and Dolokhov before dinner, and, with the kindly sensitiveness natural to him, was very gentle and wary with them both at dinner. On that same evening there was to be one of the balls that Yogel, the dancing master, gave for his pupils during the holidays. "'Nicholas, will you come to Yogel's?' Please do, said Natasha. He asked you, and Vasily Dmitrich Denisov is also going. Where would I not go at the Countess's command, said Denisov, who at the Rostovs had jocularly assumed the role of Natasha's knight. I'm even ready to dance the pas de chal. If I have time, answered Nicholas, but I promised the Archarovs uh, they have a party. And you? he asked Dolokhov. But as soon as he had asked the question, he noticed that it should not have been put. Perhaps, coldly and angrily replied Dolokhov, glancing at Sonya, and scowling, he gave Nicholas just such a look as he had given Pierre at the club dinner. There is something up, thought Nicholas, and he was further confirmed in this conclusion by the fact that Dolokhov left immediately after dinner. He called Natasha and asked her what was the matter. And I was looking for you, said Natasha, running out to him. I told you, but you would not believe it she said triumphantly. He has proposed to Sonia. Little as Nicholas had occupied himself with Sonia of late, something seemed to give way within him at this news. Dolokhov was a suitable and in some respects a brilliant match for the dowerless orphan girl. From the point of view of the old countess and of society, it was out of the question for her to refuse him. And therefore Nicholas's first feeling on hearing the news was one of anger with Sonia. He tried to say, that's capital, of course she'll forget her childish promises and accept the offer. But before he had time to say it, Natasha began again, and fancy she refused him quite definitely. Adding, after a pause, she told him she loved another. Yes, my Sonia could not have done otherwise, thought Nicholas. Much as Mamma pressed her, she refused, and I know she won't change once she has said, and Mamma pressed her said Nicholas reproachfully. Yes, said Natasha. Do you know, Nicholas, don't be angry, but I know you will not marry her. I know, heaven knows how, but I know for certain that you won't marry her. Now you don't know that at all, said Nicholas. But I must talk to her. What a darling Sonia is, he added with a smile. Ah, she is indeed a darling. I'll send her to you and Natasha kissed her brother and ran away. A minute later Sonia came in with a frightened, guilty, and scared look. Nicholas went up to her and kissed her hand. This was the first time since his return that they had talked alone and about their love. Sophie, he began, timidly at first, and then more and more boldly, if you wish to refuse one who is not only a brilliant and advantageous match, but a splendid, noble fellow, 
he is my friend. Sonia interrupted him. I've already refused, she said hurriedly. If you're refusing for my sake, I'm afraid that I... Sonia again interrupted. She gave him an imploring, frightened look. Nicholas, don't tell me that, she said. No, but I must. It may be arrogant of me, but still it is best to say it. If you refuse him on my account, I must tell you the whole truth. I love you, and I think I love you more than anyone else. That is enough for me, said Sonia, blushing. No, but I've been in love a thousand times and shall fall in love again, though for no one have I such a feeling of friendship, confidence, and love as I have for you. And I'm young. Mamma does not wish it. In, in a word, I make no promise. And I beg you to consider Dolohov's offer, he said, articulating his friend's name with difficulty. Don't say that to me. I want nothing. I love you as a brother and always shall, and I want nothing more. You're an angel. I'm not worthy of you. But I'm afraid of misleading you. And again, Nicholas kissed her hand. Chapter 12 Yogel's Ball Denisov's Mazurka Yogel's were the most enjoyable balls in Moscow. So said the mothers as they watched their young people executing their newly learned steps, and so said the youths and maidens themselves as they danced till they were ready to drop, and so said the grown-up young men and women who came to these balls with an air of condescension and found them most enjoyable. That year two marriages had come of these balls. The two pretty young princesses Gorchakov met suitors there and were married, and so further increased the fame of these dances. What distinguished them from others was the absence of host or hostess, and the presence of the good-natured Yogel flying about like a feather and bowing according to the rules of his art as he collected the tickets from all his visitors. There was the fact that only those came who wished to dance and amuse themselves, as girls of thirteen and fourteen do, who are wearing long dresses for the first time. With scarcely any exceptions, they all were, or seemed to be, pretty. So rapturous were their smiles, and so sparkling their eyes. Sometimes the best of the pupils, of whom Natasha, who was exceptionally graceful, was first, even danced the pas de chal. But at this last ball, only the Écossaise, the Anglaise, and the Mazurka, which was just coming into fashion, were danced. Yogel had taken a ballroom in Bezukhov's house, and the ball, as everyone said, was a great success. There were many pretty girls, and the Rostov girls were among the prettiest. They were both particularly happy and gay. That evening, proud of Dolohov's proposal, her refusal, and her explanation with Nicholas, Sonia twirled about before she left home so that the maid could hardly get her hair plaited, and she was transparently radiant with impulsive joy. Natasha, no less proud of her first long dress and of being at a real ball, was even happier. They were both dressed in white muslin with pink ribbons. Natasha fell in love the very moment she entered the ballroom. She was not in love with anyone in particular, but with everyone. Whatever person she happened to look at, she was in love with for that moment. Oh, how delightful it is, she kept saying, running up to Sonia. Nicholas and Denisov were walking up and down, looking with kindly patronage at the dancers. How sweet she is. She will be a real beauty, said Denisov. Who? Countess Natasha, answered Denisov. And how she dances, what grace, he said again after a pause. Who are you talking about? About your sister ejaculated Denisov testily. Rostov smiled. "'My dear Count, you were one of my best pupils. You must dance,' said little Yogel, coming up to Nicholas. "'Look how many charming young ladies!' He turned with the same request to Denisov, who was also a former pupil of his. Uh, "'No, my dear fellow, I'll be a wallflower,' said Denisov. Uh, "'Don't you recollect what bad use I made of your lessons?' "'Oh, no,' said Yogel, hastening to reassure him. "'You were only inattentive.' But you had talent, oh yes, you had talent. The band struck up the newly introduced mazurka. Nicholas could not refuse Yogel and asked Sonia to dance. Denisov sat down by the old ladies and, leaning on his sabre and beating time with his foot, told them something funny and kept them amused while he watched the young people dancing. Yogel with Natasha, his pride and his best pupil, were the first couple. 
Noiselessly, skillfully stepping with his little feet in low shoes, Yogel flew first across the hall with Natasha, who, though shy, went on carefully executing her steps. Denisov did not take his eyes off her and beat time with his sabre in a way that clearly indicated that if he was not dancing, it was because he would not and not because he could not. In the middle of a figure, he beckoned to Rostov, who was passing. This is not at all the thing, he said. Uh, what sort of Polish mazurka is this? But she does dance splendidly. Knowing that Denisov had a reputation even in Poland for the masterly way in which he danced the mazurka, Nicholas ran up to Natasha. Go and choose Denisov. He's a real dancer, a wonder, he said. When it came to Natasha's turn to choose a partner, she rose and, tripping rapidly across in her little shoes trimmed with bows, ran timidly to the corner where Denisov sat. She saw that everybody was looking at her and waiting. Nicholas saw that Denisov was refusing, though he smiled delightedly. He ran up to them. Please, Vasily Dmitrich, Natasha was saying, do come. Oh, no, let me off, Countess, Denisov replied. Now then, Vaska, said Nicholas. They coax me as if I were Vaska the cat, said Denisov jokingly. I'll sing for you a whole evening, said Natasha. Oh, the fair way, she can do anything with me, said Denisov and he unhooked his sabre. He came out from behind the chairs, clasped his partner's hand firmly, threw back his head, and advanced his foot, waiting for the beat. Only on horseback and in the mazurka was Denisov's short stature not noticeable, and he looked the fine fellow he felt himself to be. At the right beat of the music he looked sideways at his partner with a merry and triumphant air, suddenly stamped with one foot, bounded from the floor like a ball, and flew round the room, taking his partner with him. He glided silently on one foot half across the room, and seeming not to notice the chairs, was dashing straight at them, when suddenly, clinking his spurs and spreading out his legs, he stopped short on his heels, stood so for a second, stamped on the spot, clanking his spurs, whirled rapidly round, and striking his left heel against his right, flew round again in a circle. Natasha guessed what he meant to do, and, abandoning herself to him, followed his lead, hardly knowing how. First he spun her round, holding her now with his left, now with his right hand. Then, falling on one knee, he twirled her round him, and, again jumping up, dashed so impetuously forward that it seemed as if he would rush through the whole suite of rooms without drawing breath. And then he suddenly stopped and performed some new and unexpected steps. When at last, smartly whirling his partner round in front of a chair, he drew up with a click of his spurs and bowed to her. Natasha did not even make him a curtsy. She fixed her eyes on him in amazement, smiling as if she did not recognize him. "'What does this mean?' she brought out. Although Yogel did not acknowledge this to be the real mazurka, everyone was delighted with Denisov's skill. He was asked again and again as a partner, and the old men began smilingly to talk about Poland and the good old days. Denisov, flushed after the mazurka and mopping himself with his handkerchief, sat down by Natasha and did not leave her for the rest of the evening. Chapter 13 Nicholas Loses 43,000 Rubles to Dolokhov For two days after that, Rostov did not see Dolokhov at his own or at Dolokhov's home. On the third day, he received a note from him. As I do not intend to be at your house again for reasons you know of, and am going to rejoin my regiment, I am giving a farewell supper tonight to my friends. Come to the English Hotel. About ten o'clock, Rostov went to the English Hotel straight from the theatre where he had been with his family and Denisov. He was at once shown to the best room which Dolohov had taken for that evening. Some twenty men were gathered round a table at which Dolohov sat between two candles. On the table was a pile of gold and paper money, and he was keeping the bank. Rostov had not seen him since his proposal and Sonya's refusal and felt uncomfortable at the thought of how they would meet. Dolohov's clear, cold glance met Rostov as soon as he entered the door, as though he had long expected him. "'It's a long time since we met,' he said. "'Thanks for coming. "'I'll just finish dealing, and then Ilyushka will come with his chorus.' "'I called once or twice at your house,' said Rostov, reddening. Dolohov made no reply. "'You may punt,' he said. Rostov recalled at that moment a strange conversation he had once had with Dolohov. 
None but fools trust to luck in play, Dolohov had then said. Or are you afraid to play with me? Dolohov now asked, as if guessing Rostov's thought. Beneath his smile, Rostov saw in him the mood he had shown at the club dinner and at other times, when, as if tired of everyday life, he had felt a need to escape from it by some strange and usually cruel action. Rostov felt ill at ease. He tried but failed to find some joke with which to reply to Dolohov's words. But before he had thought of anything, Dolohov, looking straight in his face, said slowly and deliberately so that everyone could hear, do you remember we had a talk about cards? He's a fool who trusts to luck. One should make certain. And I want to try. To try his luck or the certainty? Rostov asked himself. Well, you'd better not play, Dolohov added, and springing a new pack of cards said, Bank, gentlemen. Moving the money forward, he prepared to deal. Rostov sat down by his side and at first did not play. Dolohov kept glancing at him. Why don't you play? he asked. And strange to say, Nicholas felt that he could not help taking up a card, putting a small stake on it and beginning to play. I have no money with me, he said. I'll trust you. Rostov staked five roubles on a card and lost. Staked again and again lost. Dolohov killed, that is, beat, ten cards of Rostov's running. Gentlemen, said Dolohov, after he had dealt for some time, please place your money on the cards or I may get muddled in the reckoning. One of the players said he hoped he might be trusted. Yes, you might, but I'm afraid of getting the accounts mixed, so I ask you to put the money on your cards, replied Dolohov. Don't stint yourself, we'll settle afterwards, he added, turning to Rostov. The game continued. A waiter kept handing round champagne. All Rostov's cards were beaten, and he had 800 rubles scored up against him. He wrote 800 rubles on a card, but while the waiter filled his glass, he changed his mind and altered it to his usual stake of 20 rubles. Leave it, said Dolohov, though he did not seem to be even looking at Rostov. You'll win it back all the sooner. I lose to the others, but win from you. Or are you afraid of me? he asked again. Rostov submitted. He let the eight hundred remain and laid down a seven of hearts with a torn corner which he had picked up from the floor. He well remembered that seven afterwards. He laid down the seven of hearts on which with a broken bit of chalk he had written eight hundred roubles in clear upright figures. He emptied the glass of warm champagne that was handed him, smiled at Dolohov's words, and with a sinking heart waited for a seven to turn up gazed at Dolohov's hands, which held the pack. Much depended on Rostov's winning or losing on that seven of hearts. On the previous Sunday, the old count had given his son two thousand roubles, and though he always disliked speaking of money difficulties, had told Nicholas that this was all he could let him have till May, and asked him to be more economical this time. Nicholas had replied that it would be more than enough for him, and that he gave his word of honour not to take anything more till the spring. Now only twelve hundred roubles was left of that money, so that this seven of hearts meant for him not only the loss of sixteen hundred roubles, but the necessity of going back on his word. With a sinking heart, he watched Dolohov's hands and thought, Now then, make haste and let me have this card, and I'll take my cap and drive home to supper with Denisov, Natasha, and Sonia, and will certainly never touch a card again. At that moment, his home life, Jokes with Petya, talks with Sonia, duets with Natasha, piquet with his father, and even his comfortable bed in the house on the Povarskaya rose before him with such vividness, clearness, and charm that it seemed as if it were all a lost and unappreciated bliss long past. He could not conceive that a stupid chance, letting the seven be dealt to the right rather than to the left, might deprive him of all this happiness newly appreciated and newly illumined, and plunge him into the depths of unknown and undefined misery. That could not be. Yet he awaited with a sinking heart the movement of Dolohov's hands. Those broad reddish hands with hairy wrists visible from under the shirt cuffs laid down the pack and took up a glass and a pipe that were handed him. So you're not afraid to play with me, repeated Dolohov. 
and as if about to tell a good story, he put down the cards, leaned back in his chair, and began deliberately with a smile. Yes, gentlemen, I've been told there's a rumor going about Moscow that I'm a sharper, so I advise you to be careful. Come now, deal, exclaimed Rostov. Oh, those Moscow gossips, said Dolohov, and he took up the cards with a smile. Ah! Rostov almost screamed, lifting both hands to his head. The seven he needed was lying uppermost, the first card in the pack. He had lost more than he could pay. Still, don't ruin yourself, said Dolohov with a side glance at Rostov as he continued to deal. An hour and a half later, most of the players were but little interested in their own play. The whole interest was concentrated on Rostov. Instead of sixteen hundred rubles, he had a long column of figures scored against him, which he had reckoned up to ten thousand, but that now, as he vaguely supposed, must have risen to fifteen thousand. In reality, it already exceeded twenty thousand rubles. Dolohov was no longer listening to stories or telling them, but followed every movement of Rostov's hands, and occasionally ran his eyes over the score against him. He had decided to play until that score reached 43,000. He had fixed on that number because 43 was the sum of his and Sonya's joint ages. Rostov, leaning his head on both hands, sat at the table which was scrawled over with figures wet with spilled wine and littered with cards. One tormenting impression did not leave him, that those broad-boned reddish hands with hairy wrists visible from under the shirt sleeves, those hands which he loved and hated, held him in their power. Six hundred rubles, ace, a corner, a nine, winning it back's impossible. Oh, how pleasant it was at home. The knave, double quits. It can't be. And why is he doing this to me? Rostov pondered. Sometimes he staked a large sum, but Dolohov refused to accept it and fixed the stake himself. Nicholas submitted to him, and at one moment prayed to God as he had done on the battlefield of the bridge over the Ents, and then guessed that the card that came first to hand from the crumpled heap under the table would save him. Now counted the cords on his coat, and took a card with that number, and tried staking the total of his losses on it. Then he looked round for aid from the other players, or peered at the now cold face of Dolohov, and tried to read what was passing in his mind. He knows, of course, what this loss means to me. He can't want my ruin. Wasn't he my friend? Wasn't I fond of him? But it's not his fault. What's he to do if he has such luck? And it's not my fault either, he thought to himself. I've done nothing wrong. Have I killed anyone or insulted or, or wished harm to anyone? Why such a terrible misfortune? And when did it begin? Such a little while ago I came to this table with the thought of winning a hundred roubles to buy that casket for Mama's name day and then going home. I, I was so happy, so free, so light-hearted. And I did not realize how happy I was. When did that end? And when did this new, terrible state of things begin? What marked the change? I sat all the time in this same place at this table, chose and placed cards, and watched those broad-boned, agile hands in the same way. When did it happen, and, and what has happened? I'm well and strong, and still the same, and in the same place. No, it can't be. Surely it will all end in nothing. He was flushed and bathed in perspiration, though the room was not hot. His face was terrible and piteous to see, especially from its helpless efforts to seem calm. The score against him reached the fateful sum of 43,000. Rostov had just prepared a card by bending the corner of which he meant to double the 3,000 just put down to his score, when Dolohov, slamming down the pack of cards, put it aside, and began rapidly adding up the total of Rostov's debt, breaking the chalk as he marked the figures in his clear, bold hand. Supper! It's time for supper! And here are the gypsies! 
Some swarthy men and women were really entering from the cold outside and saying something in their gypsy accents. Nicholas understood that it was all over, but he said in an indifferent tone, Well, won't you go on? I had a splendid card already, as if it were the fun of the game which interested him most. It's all up. I'm lost, thought he. Now a bullet through my brain. That's all that's left me. And at the same time he said in a cheerful voice, Come now, just this one more little card. All right, said Dolohov, having finished the edition. All right. Twenty-one roubles, he said, pointing to the figure twenty-one by which the total exceeded the round sum of forty-three thousand, and taking up a pack he prepared to deal. Rostov submissively unbent the corner of his card, and instead of the six thousand he had intended, carefully wrote twenty-one. It's all the same to me, he said. I only want to see whether you will let me win this ten or beat it. Dolohov began to deal seriously. Oh, how Rostov detested at that moment those hands with their short reddish fingers and hairy wrists which held him in their power. The ten fell to him. You owe forty-three thousand, Count, said Dolohov, and stretching himself he rose from the table. One does get tired sitting so long, he added. Yes, I'm tired too, said Rostov. Dolohov cut him short as if to remind him that it was not for him to jest. When am I to receive the money, Count? Rostov, flushing, drew Dolohov into the next room. I cannot pay it all immediately. Will you take an I.O.U.? he said. I say, Rostov, said Dolohov clearly, smiling and looking Nicholas straight in the eyes. You know the saying, lucky in love, unlucky at cards. Your cousin is in love with you, I know. Oh, it's terrible to feel oneself so in this man's power, thought Rostov. He knew what a shock he would inflict on his father and mother by the news of this loss. He knew what a relief it would be to escape it all, and felt that Dolohov knew that he could save him from all this shame and sorrow, but wanted now to play with him as a cat does with a mouse. Your cousin, Dolohov started to say, but Nicholas interrupted him. My cousin has nothing to do with this, and it's not necessary to mention her, he exclaimed fiercely. Then when am I to have it? Tomorrow, replied Rostov, and left the room. Chapter 14 Nicholas at Home Natasha Sings To say tomorrow and keep up a dignified tone was not difficult, but to go home alone, see his sisters, brother, mother, and father, confess, and ask for money he had no right to after giving his word of honor, was terrible. At home they had not yet gone to bed. The young people, after returning from the theater, had had supper and were grouped round the clavichord. As soon as Nicholas entered, he was enfolded in that poetic atmosphere of love which pervaded the Rostov household that winter, and now, after Dolohov's proposal and Yogel's ball, seemed to have grown thicker round Sonia and Natasha as the air does before a thunderstorm. Sonia and Natasha, in the light blue dresses they had worn at the theatre, looking pretty and conscious of it, were standing by the clavichord, happy and smiling. Viera was playing chess with Shinshin in the drawing-room. The old countess, waiting for the return of her husband and son, sat playing patience with the old gentlewoman who lived in their house. Denisov, with sparkling eyes and ruffled hair, sat at the clavichord, striking chords with his short fingers, his legs thrown back, and his eyes rolling as he sang with his small, husky, but true voice some verses called Enchantress, which he had composed, and to which he was trying to fit music. Enchantress, say... To my forsaken lyre, what magic power is this, recalls me still? What spark has set my inmost soul on fire? What is this bliss that makes my fingers thrill? He was singing in passionate tones, gazing with his sparkling black agate eyes at the frightened and happy Natasha. Splendid! Excellent! exclaimed Natasha. Another verse, she said, without noticing Nicholas. Everything's still the same with them thought Nicholas, glancing into the drawing-room, where he saw Viera and his mother with the old lady. "'Ah, and here's Nicholas,' cried Natasha, running up to him. "'Is Papa at home?' 
he asked. I'm so glad you've come, said Natasha, without answering him. We are enjoying ourselves. Vasily Dmitrich is staying a day longer for my sake. Did you know? No, uh, Papa's not back yet, said Sonia. Nicholas, have you come? Come here, dear, called the old countess from the drawing room. Nicholas went to her, kissed her hand, and sitting down silently at her table began to watch her hands arranging the cards. From the dancing room, they still heard the laughter and merry voices trying to persuade Natasha to sing. All white, all white, shouted Denisov. It's no good making excuses now. It's your turn to sing the Barca Wall, I entreat you. The countess glanced at her silent son. What's the matter? she asked. Oh, nothing, said he, as if weary of being continually asked the same question. Will Papa be back soon? I expect so. Everything's the same with them. They know nothing about it. Where am I to go? thought Nicholas, and went again into the dancing room where the clavichord stood. Sonia was sitting at the clavichord playing the prelude to Denisov's favorite barcarole. Natasha was preparing to sing. Denisov was looking at her with enraptured eyes. Nicholas began pacing up and down the room. Why do they want to make her sing? How can she sing? There's nothing to be happy about, thought he. Sonia struck the first chord of the prelude. My God, I'm a ruined and dishonored man. A bullet through my brain is the only thing left me, not singing, his thoughts ran on. Go away? But where to? It's all one. Let them sing. He continued to pace the room, looking gloomily at Denisov and the girls and avoiding their eyes. Nikolinka, what is the matter? Sonya's eyes fixed on him seemed to ask. She noticed at once that something had happened to him. Nicholas turned away from her. Natasha, too, with her quick instinct, had instantly noticed her brother's condition, but though she noticed it, she was herself in such high spirits at that moment, so far from sorrow, sadness, or self-reproach, that she purposely deceived herself as young people often do. Now I'm too happy now to spoil my enjoyment by sympathy with anyone's sorrow, she felt and she said to herself, No, I must be mistaken. He must be feeling happy, just as I am. Now, Sonia, she said, going to the very middle of the room, where she considered the resonance was best. Having lifted her head and let her arms droop lifelessly, as ballet dancers do, Natasha, rising energetically from her heels to her toes, stepped to the middle of the room and stood still. Yes, that's me, she seemed to say, answering the rapt gaze with which Denisov followed her. And what is she so pleased about, thought Nicholas, looking at his sister. Why isn't she dull and ashamed? Natasha took the first note. Her throat swelled, her chest rose, her eyes became serious. At that moment she was oblivious of her surroundings, and from her smiling lips flowed sounds which anyone may produce at the same intervals and hold for the same time, but which leave you cold a thousand times, and the thousand and first time thrill you and make you weep. Natasha, that winter, had for the first time begun to sing seriously, mainly because Denisov so delighted in her singing. She no longer sang as a child. There was no longer in her singing that comical, childish, painstaking effect that had been in it before. But she did not yet sing well. As all the connoisseurs who heard her said, it is not trained, but it is a beautiful voice that must be trained. Only they generally said this some time after she had finished singing. While that untrained voice with its incorrect breathing and labored transitions was sounding, even the connoisseurs said nothing, but only delighted in it and wished to hear it again. In her voice there was a virginal freshness, an unconsciousness of her own powers, and an as yet untrained velvety softness, which so mingled with her lack of art and singing that it seemed as if nothing in that voice could be altered without spoiling it. What is this? thought Nicholas, listening to her with widely opened eyes. What has happened to her? How she is singing today! And suddenly the whole world centered for him on anticipation of the next note, the next phrase, and everything in the world was divided into three beats. O oh, mio crudele affetto, one, two, three, one, two, three, one. Oh, mio crudele affetto, one, two, three, one. 
Oh, this senseless life of ours, thought Nicholas, all this misery and money and Dolokhov and anger and honor, it's all nonsense. But this is real. 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 Now then, Natasha, now then, dearest. Now then, darling. How will she take that sea? She's taken it. Thank God. And without noticing that he was singing, to strengthen the sea, he sung a second, a third below the high note. Ah, oh God, how fine! Did I really take it? How fortunate, he thought. Oh, how that chord vibrated, and how moved was something that was finest in Rostov's soul. And this something was apart from everything else in the world, and above everything in the world. What were losses and Dolokhov and words of honor? All nonsense. One might kill and rob and yet be happy. Chapter 15 Nicholas tells his father of his losses. Denisov proposes to Natasha. It was long since Rostov had felt such enjoyment from music as he did that day. But no sooner had Natasha finished her Barker role than reality again presented itself. He got up without saying a word and went downstairs to his own room. A quarter of an hour later, the old count came in from his club, cheerful and contented. Nicholas, hearing him drive up, went to meet him. Well, had a good time, said the old count, smiling gaily and proudly at his son. Nicholas tried to say yes, but could not, and he nearly burst into sobs. The count was lighting his pipe and did not notice his son's condition. Ah, it can't be avoided, thought Nicholas, for the first and last time. And suddenly, in the most casual tone, which made him feel ashamed of himself, he said, as if merely asking his father to let him have the carriage to drive to town, Papa, I've come on a matter of business. I was nearly forgetting. I need some money. Dear me, said his father, who was in especially good humor. I told you it would not be enough. How much? Very much, said Nicholas, flushing, and with a stupid, careless smile for which he was long unable to forgive himself. I've lost a little. I, I mean a good deal, a great deal. Forty-three thousand. What? To whom? What? Nonsense! cried the Count, suddenly reddening with an apoplectic flush over neck and nape as old people do. I promise to pay tomorrow, said Nicholas. Well, said the old Count, spreading out his arms and sinking helplessly on the sofa. It can't be helped. It happens to everyone said the son with a bold, free and easy tone, while in his soul he regarded himself as a worthless scoundrel whose whole life could not atone for his crime. He longed to kiss his father's hands and kneel to beg his forgiveness, but said in a careless and even rude voice that it happens to everyone. The old count cast down his eyes on hearing his son's words and began bustlingly searching for something. Yes, yes, he muttered, it, it will be difficult, I feared, or difficult to raise. Happens to everybody, yes, who has not done it? And with a furtive glance at his son's face, the Count went out of the room. Nicholas had been prepared for resistance, but had not at all expected this. Papa, papa, he called after him, sobbing, forgive me. And seizing his father's hand, he pressed it to his lips and burst into tears. While father and son were having their explanation, the mother and daughter were having one not less important. Natasha came running to her mother, quite excited. Mama! Mama! He has made me... Made what? Mama! Made, made me an offer, Mama! Mama! she exclaimed. The countess did not believe her ears. Denisov had proposed. To whom? To this chit of a girl, Natasha, who not so long ago was playing with dolls and who was still having lessons. Don't, Natasha, what nonsense, she said, hoping it was a joke. Nonsense, indeed, I'm telling you the fact, said Natasha indignantly. I come to ask you what to do, and you call it nonsense. The countess shrugged her shoulders. If it is true that Monsieur Denisov has made you a proposal, tell him he's a fool, that's all. No, he's not a fool, replied Natasha indignantly and seriously. Well, then, what do you want? "'You're all in love nowadays. "'Well, if you're in love, marry him,' said the Countess, "'with a laugh of annoyance. "'Good luck to you. "'No, Mamma, I'm not in love with him. "'I suppose I'm not in love with him. "'Well, then, tell him so.' 
Mamma, are you cross? Don't be cross, dear. Is it my fault? No, but what is it, my dear? Do you want me to go and tell him? said the countess, smiling. No, I will do it myself, only tell me what to say. It's all very well for you, said Natasha with a responsive smile. You should have seen how he said it. I know he did not mean to say it, but it came out accidentally. Well, all the same, you must refuse him. No, I mustn't. I, I'm so sorry for him. He's so nice. Well, then accept his offer. It's high time for you to be married, answered the countess sharply and sarcastically. No, Mamma, but I, I'm so sorry for him. I, I don't know how I'm to say it. And there's nothing for you to say. I shall speak to him myself, said the countess, indignant that they should have dared to treat this little Natasha as grown-up. "'No, not on any account. I will tell him myself, and you'll listen at the door.' And Natasha ran across the drawing-room to the dancing-hall, where Denisov was sitting on the same chair by the clavichord with his face in his hands. He jumped up at the sound of her light step. "'Natalie,' he said, moving with rapid steps toward her, "'decide my fate. It is in your hands.' "'Vasily Dmitrich, I'm so sorry for you. No, but, but you're so nice.' But, but it it won't do, not, not that. But as a friend, I shall always love you. Denisov bent over her hand, and she heard strange sounds she did not understand. She kissed his rough, curly, black head. At this instant they heard the quick rustle of the countess's dress. She came up to them. Vasily Dmitrich, I thank you for the honor, she said with an embarrassed voice, though it sounded severe to Denisov. But my daughter is so young, and I thought that, as my son's friend, you would have addressed yourself first to me. In that case, you would not have obliged me to give this refusal. Countess, said Denisov with downcast eyes and a guilty face. He tried to say more, but faltered. Natasha could not remain calm, seeing him in such a plight. She began to sob aloud. Countess, I have done wrong. Denisov went on in an unsteady voice. But, believe me, I, I so adore your daughter and all your family that I would give my life twice over. He looked at the Countess, and seeing her severe face, said, Well, good-bye, Countess. And kissing her hand, he left the room with quick, resolute strides, without looking at Natasha. Next day Rostov saw Denisov off. He did not wish to stay another day in Moscow. All Denisov's Moscow friends gave him a farewell entertainment at the Gypsies, with the result that he had no recollection of how he was put in the sleigh or of the first three stages of his journey. After Denisov's departure, Rostov spent another fortnight in Moscow without going out of the house, waiting for the money his father could not at once raise, and he spent most of his time in the girls' room. Sonia was more tender and devoted to him than ever. It was as if she wanted to show him that his losses were an achievement that made her love him all the more. But Nicholas now considered himself unworthy of her. He filled the girls' albums with verses and music, and having at last sent Dolokhov the whole 43,000 roubles and received his receipt, he left at the end of November, without taking leave of any of his acquaintances, to overtake his regiment, which was already in Poland. Book Five. Dates of Principal Historical Events, 1807. The dates are old style. January 27th, Battle of Preussisch Eilau. June 2nd, Battle of Friedland. June 13th, The Emperors Meet at Tilsit. Chapter One. Pierre Meets Bazdeyev. After his interview with his wife, Pierre left for Petersburg. At the Torzhok post station, either there were no horses or the postmaster would not supply them. Pierre was obliged to wait. Without undressing, he lay down on the leather sofa in front of a round table, put his big feet in their overboots on the table, and began to reflect. "'Will you have the portmanteaus brought in, and a bed got ready, and tea?' asked his valet. Pierre gave no answer, for he neither heard nor saw anything. He had begun to think of the last station, and was still pondering on the same question, one so important that he took no notice of what went on around him. Not only was he indifferent as to whether he got to Petersburg earlier or later, 
or whether he secured accommodation at this station, but compared to the thoughts that now occupied him, it was a matter of indifference whether he remained there for a few hours or for the rest of his life. The postmaster, his wife, the valet, and a peasant woman selling Torjok embroidery came into the room offering their services. Without changing his careless attitude, Pierre looked at them over his spectacles, unable to understand what they wanted, or how they could go on living without having solved the problems that so absorbed him. He had been engrossed by the same thoughts ever since the day he returned from Sokolniki after the duel, and had spent that first agonizing sleepless night. But now, in the solitude of the journey, they seized him with special force. No matter what he thought about, he always returned to these same questions which he could not solve, and yet could not cease to ask himself. It was as if the thread of the cheap screw which held his life together were stripped, so that the screw could not get in or out, but went on turning uselessly in the same place. The postmaster came in and began obsequiously to beg His Excellency to wait only two hours when, come what might, he would let His Excellency have the courier horses. It was plain that he was lying, and only wanted to get more money from the traveller. "'Is this good or bad?' Pierre asked himself. "'It is good for me, bad for another traveller. And for himself it's unavoidable, because he needs money for food.' The man said an officer had once given him a thrashing for letting a private traveller have the courier horses, but the officer thrashed him because he had to get on as quickly as possible. And I, continued Pierre, shot Dolokhov because I considered myself injured, and Louis the Sixteenth was executed because they considered him a criminal, and a year later they executed those who executed him also for some reason. What is bad? What is good? What should one love and what hate? What does one live for? And what am I? What is life and what is death? What power governs all? There was no answer to any of these questions except one, and that not a logical answer, and not at all a reply to them. The answer was, You'll die, and all will end. You'll die, and know all, or cease asking. But dying was also dreadful. The Torjok peddler woman, in a whining voice, went on offering her wares, especially a pair of goatskin slippers. I have hundreds of rubles I don't know what to do with and she stands in her tattered cloak looking timidly at me, he thought. And what does she want the money for? As if that money could add a hair's breadth to her happiness or peace of mind. Can anything in the world make her or me less a prey to evil and death? Death which ends all and must come today or tomorrow? At any rate, in an instant as compared with eternity. And again he twisted the screw with the stripped thread, and again it turned uselessly in the same place. His servant handed him a half-cut novel in the form of letters by Madame de Souza. He began reading about the sufferings and virtuous struggles of a certain Émilie de Mansfeld. And why did she resist her seducer when she loved him, he thought. God could not have put into her heart an impulse that was against his will. My wife, as she once was, did not struggle, and perhaps she was right. Nothing has been found out, nothing discovered, Pierre again said to himself. All we can know is that we know nothing, and that's the height of human wisdom. Everything within and around him seemed confused, senseless, and repellent, yet in this very repugnance to all his circumstances, Pierre found a kind of tantalizing satisfaction. "'I make bold to ask Your Excellency to move a little for this gentleman,' said the postmaster, entering the room followed by another traveller, also detained for lack of horses. The newcomer was a short, large-boned, yellow-faced, wrinkled old man, with grey, bushy eyebrows overhanging bright eyes of an indefinite greyish colour. 
Pierre took his feet off the table, stood up, and lay down on a bed that had been got ready for him, glancing now and then at the newcomer, who, with a gloomy and tired face, was wearily taking off his wraps with the aid of his servant, and not looking at Pierre. With a pair of felt boots on his thin bony legs, and keeping on a worn nankeen-covered sheepskin coat, the traveller sat down on the sofa, leaned back his big head with its broad temples and close-cropped hair, and looked at Bezukhov. The stern, shrewd, and penetrating expression of that look struck Pierre. He felt a wish to speak to the stranger, but by the time he had made up his mind to ask him a question about the roads, the traveller had closed his eyes. His shriveled old hands were folded, and on the finger of one of them Pierre noticed a large cast-iron ring with a seal representing a death's head. The stranger sat without stirring, either resting, or, as it seemed to Pierre, sunk in profound and calm meditation. His servant was also a yellow, wrinkled old man, without beard or moustache, evidently not because he was shaven, but because they had never grown. This active old servant was unpacking the traveller's canteen and preparing tea. He brought in a boiling samovar. When everything was ready, the stranger opened his eyes, moved to the table, filled a tumbler with tea for himself and one for the beardless old man to whom he passed it. Pierre began to feel a sense of uneasiness, and the need, even the inevitability, of entering into conversation with this stranger. The servant brought back his tumbler turned upside down with an unfinished bit of nibbled sugar and asked if anything more would be wanted. Note, Russian serfs and peasants often turn their tea tumblers upside down as an indication that they do not want any more. From economy they do not dissolve the sugar but nibble a little with their tea. No, give me the book, said the stranger. The servant handed him a book which Pierre took to be a devotional work, and the traveller became absorbed in it. Pierre looked at him. All at once the stranger closed the book, putting in a marker, and again, leaning with his arms on the back of the sofa, sat in his former position with his eyes shut. Pierre looked at him, and had not time to turn away when the old man, opening his eyes, fixed his steady and severe gaze straight on Pierre's face. Pierre felt confused and wished to avoid that look, but the bright old eyes attracted him irresistibly. "'I have the pleasure of addressing Count Bezukhov, if I'm not mistaken,' said the stranger in a deliberate and loud voice. Pierre looked silently and inquiringly at him over his spectacles. "'I have heard of you, my dear sir,' continued the stranger and of your misfortune. He seemed to emphasize the last word as if to say, Yes, misfortune, call it what you please. I know that what happened to you in Moscow was a misfortune. I regret it very much, my dear sir. Pierre flushed, and hurriedly putting his legs down from the bed, bent forward toward the old man with a forced and timid smile. I have not referred to this out of curiosity, my dear sir but for greater reasons. He paused, his gaze still on Pierre, and moved aside on the sofa by way of inviting the other to take a seat beside him. Pierre felt reluctant to enter into conversation with this old man, but submitting to him involuntarily came up and sat down beside him. "'You are unhappy, my dear sir,' the stranger continued. "'You are young, and I am old. I should like to help you as far as lies in my power.' Oh, yes, said Pierre with a forced smile. I am very grateful to you. Where are you traveling from? The stranger's face was not genial. It was even cold and severe. But in spite of this, both the face and words of his new acquaintance were irresistibly attractive to Pierre. But if for any reason you don't feel inclined to talk to me, said the old man, say so, my dear sir and he suddenly smiled in an unexpected and tenderly paternal way. "'Oh, no, not at all. On the contrary, I am very glad to make your acquaintance,' said Pierre. And again glancing at the stranger's hands, he looked more closely at the ring with its skull, a Masonic sign. "'Allow me to ask,' he said. "'Are you a Mason?' "'Yes. I belong to the Brotherhood of the Freemasons,' 
said the stranger, looking deeper and deeper into Pierre's eyes. And in their name and my own, I hold out a brotherly hand to you. Note, Freemasonry was established in Russia about 1760. It took its foundations largely from England and Scotland, but was suspected of having an interest in political reforms and consequently suffered repression in Catherine's reign. It flourished under Alexander I, but was completely suppressed by Nicholas I, under whom no secret organization had any chance of being tolerated. I am afraid, said Pierre, smiling and wavering between the confidence the personality of the Freemason inspired in him and his own habit of ridiculing the Masonic beliefs. I am afraid I am very far from understanding... Uh, how am I to put it? I am afraid my way of looking at the world is so opposed to yours that we shall not understand one another. I know your outlook, said the Mason, and the view of life you mention, and which you think is the result of your own mental efforts, is the one held by the majority of people, and is the invariable fruit of pride, indolence, and ignorance. Forgive me, my dear sir, but if I had not known it, I should not have addressed you. Your view of life is a regrettable delusion. Just as I may suppose you to be deluded, said Pierre with a faint smile. I should never dare to say that I know the truth, said the mason, whose words struck Pierre more and more by their precision and firmness. No one can attain to truth by himself. Only by laying stone on stone, with the cooperation of all, by the millions of generations from our forefather Adam to our own times, is that temple reared which is to be a worthy dwelling place of the great God, he added, and closed his eyes. I ought to tell you that I do not believe... Do not believe in God, said Pierre, regretfully and with an effort, feeling it essential to speak the whole truth. The mason looked intently at Pierre and smiled as a rich man with millions in hand might smile at a poor fellow who told him that he, poor man, had not the five roubles that would make him happy. Yes, you do not know him, my dear sir, said the mason. You cannot know him. You do not know him, and that is why you are unhappy. Yes, yes, I am unhappy, assented Pierre, but what am I to do? You know him not, my dear sir, and so you are very unhappy. You do not know him, but he is here. He is in me. He is in my words. He is in thee. And even in those blasphemous words thou hast just uttered, pronounced the mason in a stern and tremulous voice. He paused and sighed, evidently trying to calm himself. If he were not, he said quietly, you and I would not be speaking of him, my dear sir. Of what, of whom are we speaking? Whom hast thou denied? He suddenly asked with exulting austerity and authority in his voice. Who invented him if he did not exist? Whence came thy conception of the existence of such an incomprehensible being? Why didst thou and why did the whole world conceive the idea of the existence of such an incomprehensible being, a being all-powerful, eternal, and infinite in all his attributes? He stopped and remained silent for a long time. Pierre could not and did not wish to break this silence. He exists, but to understand him is hard. The mason began again, looking not at Pierre, but straight before him, and turning the leaves of his book with his old hands, which from excitement he could not keep still. If it were a man whose existence thou didst doubt, I could bring him to thee, could take him by the hand and show him to thee. But how can I, an insignificant mortal, show his omnipotence, his infinity, and all his mercy? to one who is blind, or who shuts his eyes that he may not see or understand him, and may not see or understand his own vileness and sinfulness. He paused again. Who art thou? Thou dreamest that thou art wise 
because thou couldst utter those blasphemous words, he went on with a somber and scornful smile. And thou art more foolish and unreasonable than a little child, who, playing with the parts of a skillfully made watch, dares to say that as he does not understand its use, he does not believe in the master who made it. To know him is hard. For ages, from our forefather Adam to our own day, we labor to attain that knowledge and are still infinitely far from our aim. But in our lack of understanding, we see only our weakness and his greatness. Pierre listened with swelling heart, gazing into the mason's face with shining eyes, not interrupting or questioning him, but believing with his whole soul what the stranger said. Whether he accepted the wise reasoning contained in the mason's words, or believed as a child believes in the speaker's tone of conviction and earnestness, or the tremor of the speaker's voice which sometimes almost broke, or those brilliant aged eyes grown old in this conviction, or the calm firmness and certainty of his vocation which radiated from his whole being, and which struck Pierre especially by contrast with his own dejection and hopelessness. At any rate, Pierre longed with his whole soul to believe, and he did believe, and felt a joyful sense of comfort, regeneration, and return to life. He is not to be apprehended by reason, but by life, said the mason. I do not understand, said Pierre, feeling with dismay doubts reawakening. He was afraid of any want of clearness, any weakness in the mason's arguments. He dreaded not to be able to believe in him. I don't understand, he said, how it is that the mind of man cannot attain the knowledge of which you speak. The mason smiled with his gentle fatherly smile. The highest wisdom and truth are like the purest liquid we may wish to imbibe, he said. Can I receive that pure liquid into an impure vessel and judge of its purity? Only by the inner purification of myself can I retain in some degree of purity the liquid I receive. Yes, yes, that is so, said Pierre joyfully. The highest wisdom is not founded on reason alone, not on those worldly sciences of physics, history, chemistry, and the like, into which intellectual knowledge is divided. The highest wisdom is one. The highest wisdom has but one science, the science of the whole, the science explaining the whole creation and man's place in it. To receive that science, it is necessary to purify and renew one's inner self, and so before one can know, it is necessary to believe and to perfect oneself. And to attain this end, we have the light called conscience that God has implanted in our souls. Yes, yes, assented Pierre. Look then at thy inner self with the eyes of the Spirit, and ask thyself whether thou art content with thyself. What hast thou attained relying on reason only? What art thou? You are young, you are rich, you are clever, you are well educated. And what have you done with all these good gifts? Are you content with yourself and with your life? No, I hate my life, Pierre muttered, wincing. Thou hatest thy life, the mason said to Pierre. Then change it, purify thyself. And as thou art purified, thou wilt gain wisdom. Look at your life, my dear sir. How have you spent it? In riotous orgies and debauchery, receiving everything from society and giving nothing in return. You have become the possessor of wealth. How have you used it? What have you done for your neighbor? Have you ever thought of your tens of thousands of slaves? Have you helped them physically and morally? No. You have profited by their toil to lead a profligate life. That is what you have done. Have you chosen a post in which you might be of service to your neighbor? No, you have spent your life in idleness. Then you married, my dear sir, took on yourself responsibility for the guidance of a young woman. And what have you done? You have not helped her to find the way of truth, my dear sir, but have thrust her into an abyss of deceit and misery. 
A man offended you, and you shot him, and you say you do not know God and hate your life. There is nothing strange in that, my dear sir. After these words, the mason, as if tired by his long discourse, again leaned his arms on the back of the sofa and closed his eyes. Pierre looked at that aged, stern, motionless, almost lifeless face, and moved his lips without uttering a sound. He wished to say, yes, a vile, idle, vicious life, but dared not break the silence. The mason cleared his throat huskily, as old men do, and called his servant. How about the horses? he asked, without looking at Pierre. The exchange horses have just come, answered the servant. Will you not rest here? No, tell them to harness. Can he really be going away and leaving me alone without having told me all, and without promising to help me, thought Pierre, rising with downcast head. And he began to pace the room, glancing occasionally at the mason. Yes, I never thought of it, but I have led a contemptible and profligate life, though I did not like it and did not want to, thought Pierre. But this man knows the truth, and if he wished to, could disclose it to me. Pierre wished to say this to the mason, but did not dare to. The traveller, having packed his things with his practised hands, began fastening his coat. When he had finished, he turned to Bezukhov and said in a tone of indifferent politeness, Where are you going to now, my dear sir? I, uh, I, I'm going to Petersburg, answered Pierre, in a childlike, hesitating voice. I, I thank you. I agree with all you have said, but do not suppose me to be so bad. With my whole soul I wish to be what you would have me be, but I've never had help from anyone. But it is I, above all, who am to blame for everything. Help me, teach me, and, and perhaps I, I may... Pierre could not go on. He gulped and turned away. The mason remained silent for a long time, evidently considering. Help comes from God alone, he said. But such measure of help as our order can bestow, it will render you, my dear sir. You are going to Petersburg. Hand this to Count Villarsky. He took out his notebook and wrote a few words on a large sheet of paper folded in four. Allow me to give you a piece of advice. When you reach the capital, first of all, devote some time to solitude and self-examination, and do not resume your former way of life. And now I wish you a good journey, my dear sir he added, seeing that his servant had entered. And success. The traveller was Joseph Alexeyevich Bazdeyev, as Pierre saw from the postmaster's book. Bazdeyev had been one of the best-known Freemasons and Martinists, even in Nobikov's time. For a long while after he had gone, Pierre did not go to bed or order horses, but paced up and down the room, pondering over his vicious past, and, with a rapturous sense of beginning anew, pictured to himself the blissful, irreproachable, virtuous future that seemed to him so easy. It seemed to him that he had been vicious only because he had somehow forgotten how good it is to be virtuous. Not a trace of his former doubts remained in his soul. He firmly believed in the possibility of the brotherhood of men united in the aim of supporting one another in the path of virtue. And that is how Freemasonry presented itself to him. Chapter 2 Pierre Becomes a Freemason On reaching Petersburg, Pierre did not let anyone know of his arrival. He went nowhere and spent whole days in reading Thomas a Kempis, whose book had been sent him by someone unknown. One thing he continually realized as he read that book, the joy, hitherto unknown to him, of believing in the possibility of attaining perfection and in the possibility of active brotherly love among men, which Joseph Alexeyevich had revealed to him. A week after his arrival, 
the young Polish Count Wilarski, whom Pierre had known slightly in Petersburg society, came into his room one evening in the official and ceremonious manner in which Dolokhov II had called on him, and having closed the door behind him and satisfied himself that there was nobody else in the room, addressed Pierre. I have come to you with a message and an offer, Count, he said without sitting down. A person of very high standing in our brotherhood has made application for you to be received into our order before the usual term, and has proposed to me to be your sponsor. I consider it a sacred duty to fulfill that person's wishes. Do you wish to enter the Brotherhood of Freemasons under my sponsorship? The cold, austere tone of this man, whom he had almost always before met at balls, amiably smiling in the society of the most brilliant women, surprised Pierre. Yes, I do wish it, said he. Bilarski bowed his head. One more question, Count, he said, which I beg you to answer in all sincerity, not as a future mason, but as an honest man. Have you renounced your former convictions? Do you believe in God? Pierre considered. Yes, yes, I believe in God, he said. In that case, began Vilarski, but Pierre interrupted him. Yes, I do believe in God, he repeated. In that case, we can go, said Vilarski. My carriage is at your service. Vilarski was silent throughout the drive. To Pierre's inquiries as to what he must do and how she, he should answer, Vilarski only replied that brothers more worthy than he would test him, and that Pierre had only to tell the truth. Having entered the courtyard of a large house where the lodge had its headquarters, and having ascended a dark staircase, they entered a small, well-lit anteroom where they took off their cloaks without the aid of a servant. From there they passed into another room. A man in strange attire appeared at the door. Bilarski, stepping toward him, said something to him in French in an undertone, and then went up to a small wardrobe in which Pierre noticed garments such as he had never seen before. Having taken a kerchief from the cupboard, Bilarski bound Pierre's eyes with it and tied it in a knot behind, catching some hairs painfully in the knot. Then he drew his face down, kissed him, and taking him by the hand, led him forward. The hairs tied in the knot hurt Pierre, and there were lines of pain on his face and a shamefaced smile. His huge figure with arms hanging down and with a puckered, though smiling face, moved after Vilarski with uncertain, timid steps. Note. Tolstoy took the ceremonies of the Freemasons from his study of books and manuscripts in the rich collection of the Rumyantsev Museum in Moscow. In a letter to his wife, in the autumn of 1866, he wrote, After drinking my coffee, I went to the Rumyantsev Museum and sat there till three o'clock, reading very interesting Masonic manuscripts. I can't describe to you why the reading produced on me a depression I have not been able to get rid of all day. What is distressing is that all those Masons were fools. Tolstoy sympathized with their aims, but considered their methods futile. Having led him about ten paces, Vilarski stopped. Whatever happens to you, he said, you must bear it all manfully if you have firmly resolved to join our brotherhood. Pierre nodded affirmatively. When you hear a knock at the door, you will uncover your eyes, added Vilarski. I wish you courage and success. And pressing Pierre's hand, he went out. Left alone, Pierre went on smiling in the same way. Once or twice he shrugged his shoulders and raised his hand to the kerchief as if wishing to take it off, but let it drop again. The five minutes spent with his eyes bandaged seemed to him an hour. His arms felt numb, his legs almost gave way. It seemed to him that he was tired out. He experienced a variety of most complex sensations. He felt afraid of what would happen to him, and still more afraid of showing his fear. He felt curious to know what was going to happen and what would be revealed to him. But most of all, he felt joyful that the moment had come 
when he would at last start on that path of regeneration and on the actively virtuous life of which he had been dreaming since he met Joseph Alexeyevich. Loud knocks were heard at the door. Pierre took the bandage off his eyes and glanced around him. The room was in black darkness. Only a small lamp was burning inside something white. Pierre went nearer and saw that the lamp stood on a black table on which lay an open book. The book was the gospel, and the white thing with the lamp inside was a human skull with its cavities and teeth. After reading the first words of the gospel, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, Pierre went round the table and saw a large open box filled with something. It was a coffin with bones inside. He was not at all surprised by what he saw. Hoping to enter on an entirely new life quite unlike the old one, he expected everything to be unusual, even more unusual than what he was seeing. A skull, a coffin, the gospel. It seemed to him that he had expected all this and even more. Trying to stimulate his emotions, he looked around. God, death, love, the brotherhood of man, he kept saying to himself, associating these words with vague yet joyful ideas. The door opened and someone came in. By the dim light to which Pierre had already become accustomed, he saw a rather short man. Having evidently come from the light into the darkness, the man paused, then moved with cautious steps toward the table and placed on it his small leather-gloved hands. This short man had on a white leather apron which covered his chest and part of his legs. He had on a kind of necklace above which rose a high white ruffle outlining his rather long face, which was lit up from below. "'For what have you come hither?' asked the newcomer, turning in Pierre's direction at a slight rustle made by the latter. "'Why have you, who do not believe in the truth of the light, and who have not seen the light, come here? What do you seek from us? Wisdom, virtue, enlightenment? At the moment the door opened and the stranger came in, Pierre felt a sense of awe and veneration, such as he had experienced in his boyhood at confession. He felt himself in the presence of one socially a complete stranger, yet nearer to him through the brotherhood of man. With bated breath and beating heart, he moved toward the Ritor, by which name the brother who prepared a seeker for entrance into the brotherhood was known. Drawing nearer, he recognized in the Rita a man he knew, Smolyaninov, and it mortified him to think that the newcomer was an acquaintance. He wished him simply a brother and a virtuous instructor. For a long time he could not utter a word, so that the Rita had to repeat his question. Rita is spelled R-H-E-T-O-R. -E yes, I... Uh, I desire regeneration, Pierre uttered with difficulty. Very well, said Smolyaninov, and went on at once. Have you any idea of the means by which our holy order will help you to reach your aim? said he quietly and quickly. I hope for guidance, help in regeneration, said Pierre with a trembling voice and some difficulty in utterance due to his excitement and to being unaccustomed to speak of abstract matters in Russian. What is your conception of Freemasonry? I imagine that Freemasonry is the fraternity and equality of men who have virtuous aims, said Pierre, feeling ashamed of the inadequacy of his words for the solemnity of the moment as he spoke. I imagine good said the Rito quickly, apparently satisfied with this answer. Have you sought for means of attaining your aim in religion? No, I, I considered it erroneous and did not follow it, said Pierre, so softly that the Rito did not hear him and asked him what he was saying. I have been an atheist, answered Pierre. You are seeking for truth 
in order to follow its laws in your life. Therefore you seek wisdom and virtue. Is that not so? said the reader after a moment's pause. Yes, yes, assented Pierre. The reader cleared his throat, crossed his gloved hands on his breast, and began to speak. Now I must disclose to you the chief aim of our order, he said. And if this aim coincides with yours, you may enter our brotherhood with profit. The first and chief object of our order, the foundation on which it rests, and which no human power can destroy, is the preservation and handing on to posterity of a certain important mystery, which has come down to us from the remotest ages, even from the first man, a mystery on which perhaps the fate of mankind depends. But since this mystery is of such a nature that nobody can know or use it unless he be prepared by long and diligent self-purification, not everyone can hope to attain it quickly. Hence we have a secondary aim, that of preparing our members as much as possible to reform their hearts, to purify and enlighten their minds by means handed on to us by tradition from those who have striven to attain this mystery, and thereby to render them capable of receiving it. By purifying and regenerating our members, we try, thirdly, to improve the whole human race, offering it in our members an example of piety and virtue, and thereby try with all our might to combat the evil which sways the world. Think this over, and I will come to you again. To combat the evil which sways the world, Pierre repeated, and a mental image of his future activity in this direction rose in his mind. He imagined men such as he had himself been a fortnight ago, and he addressed an edifying exhortation to them. He imagined to himself vicious and unfortunate people whom he would assist by word and deed, imagined oppressors whose victims he would rescue. Of the three objects mentioned by the reader, this last, that of improving mankind, especially appealed to Pierre. The important mystery mentioned by the reader, though it aroused his curiosity, did not seem to him essential. And the second aim, that of purifying and regenerating himself, did not much interest him, because at that moment he felt with delight that he was already perfectly cured of his former faults and was ready for all that was good. Half an hour later, the reader returned to inform the seeker of the seven virtues, corresponding to the seven steps of Solomon's temple, which every Freemason should cultivate in himself. These virtues were, one, discretion, the keeping of the secrets of the order, two, obedience to those of higher ranks in the order, three, morality, four, love of mankind, five, courage, six, generosity, seven, the love of death. In the seventh place, try by the frequent thought of death, the Rita said, to bring yourself to regard it not as a dreaded foe, but as a friend that frees the soul grown weary in the labors of virtue from this distressful life and leads it to its place of recompense and peace. Yes, that must be so, thought Pierre, when after these words the Rita went away, leaving him to solitary meditation. It must be so, but I am still so weak that I love my life, the meaning of which is only now gradually opening before me. But five of the other virtues which Pierre recalled, counting them on his fingers, he felt already in his soul. Courage, generosity, morality, love of mankind, and especially obedience, which did not even seem to him a virtue, but a joy. He now felt so glad to be free from his own lawlessness and to submit his will to those who knew the indubitable truth. He forgot what the seventh virtue was and could not recall it. The third time, the Rita came back more quickly and asked Pierre whether he was still firm in his intention and determined to submit to all that would be required of him. I am ready for everything, said Pierre. I must also inform you, said the Rita, 
that our order delivers its teaching not in words only, but also by other means, which may perhaps have a stronger effect on the sincere seeker after wisdom and virtue than mere words. This chamber, with what you see therein, should already have suggested to your heart, if it is sincere, more than words could do. You will perhaps also see in your further initiation a like method of enlightenment. Our order imitates the ancient societies that explained their teaching by hieroglyphics. A hieroglyph, said the Rita, is an emblem of something not cognizable by the senses, but which possesses qualities resembling those of the symbol. Pierre knew very well what a hieroglyph was, but dared not speak. He listened to the reader in silence, feeling from all he said that his ordeal was about to begin. If you are resolved, I must begin your initiation, said the reader, coming closer to Pierre. In token of generosity, I ask you to give me all your valuables. I have nothing here, replied Pierre, supposing that he was asked to give up all he possessed. What do you have with you? Watch, money, rings? Pierre quickly took out his purse and watch, but could not manage for some time to get the wedding ring off his fat finger. When that had been done, the Rita said, In token of obedience, I ask you to undress. Pierre took off his coat, waistcoat, and left boot, according to the Rita's instructions. The mason drew the shirt back from Pierre's left breast and, stooping down, pulled up the left leg of his trousers to above the knee. Pierre hurriedly began taking off his right boot also and was going to tuck up the other trouser leg to save this stranger the trouble, but the mason told him that was not necessary and gave him a slipper for his left foot. With a childlike smile of embarrassment, doubt, and self-derision, which appeared on his face against his will, Pierre stood with his arms hanging down and legs apart before his brother Rita and awaited his further commands. And now, in token of candor, I ask you to reveal to me your chief passion, said the latter. My passion? I've had so many, replied Pierre. That passion which more than all others caused you to waver on the path of virtue said the mason. Pierre paused, seeking a reply. Wine, gluttony, idleness, laziness, irritability, anger, women. He went over his vices in his mind, not knowing to which of them to give the preeminence. Women, he said in a low, scarcely audible voice. The mason did not move, and for a long time said nothing after this answer. At last he moved up to Pierre, and taking the kerchief that lay on the table, again bound his eyes. For the last time I say to you, turn all your attention upon yourself, put a bridle on your senses, and seek blessedness not in passion, but in your own heart. The source of blessedness is not without us, but within. Pierre had already long been feeling in himself that refreshing source of blessedness which now flooded his heart with glad emotion. Soon after this there came into the dark chamber to fetch Pierre, not the Rita, but Pierre's sponsor, Vilarsky, whom he recognized by his voice. To fresh questions as to the firmness of his resolution, Pierre replied, Yes, yes, I agree. And with a beaming childlike smile, his fat chest uncovered, stepping unevenly and timidly in one slippered and one booted foot, he advanced while Vilarsky held a sword to his bare chest. He was conducted from that room along passages that turned backwards and forwards, and was at last brought to the doors of the lodge. Vilarsky coughed. He was answered by the Masonic knock with mallets. The doors opened before them. A bass voice, Pierre was still blindfold, questioned him as to who he was, when and where he was born, and so on. Then he was again led somewhere, still blindfold, and as they went along he was told allegories of the toils of his pilgrimage, of holy friendship, of the eternal architect of the universe, 
and of the courage with which he should endure toils and dangers. During their wanderings, Pierre noticed that he was spoken of now as the seeker, now as the sufferer, and now as the postulant, to the accompaniment of various knockings with mallets and swords. As he was being led up to some object, he noticed a hesitation and uncertainty among his conductors. He heard those around him disputing in whispers, and one of them insisting that he should be led along a certain carpet. After that they took his right hand, placed it on something, and told him to hold a pair of compasses to his left breast with the other hand, and to repeat after someone who read aloud an oath of fidelity to the laws of the order. The candles were then extinguished, and some spirit lighted, as Pierre knew by the smell, and he was told that he would now see the lesser light. The bandage was taken off his eyes, and by the faint light of the burning spirit, Pierre, as in a dream, saw several men standing before him, wearing aprons like the Rita's, and holding swords in their hands, pointed at his breast. Among them stood a man whose white shirt was stained with blood. On seeing this, Pierre moved forward with his breast toward the swords, meaning them to pierce it. But the swords were drawn back from him, and he was at once blindfolded again. Now thou hast seen the lesser light uttered a voice. Then the candles were relit, and he was told that he would see the full light. The bandage was again removed, and more than ten voices said together, Sic transit gloria mundi. So passes away the glory of the world. Pierre gradually began to recover himself, and looked about at the room and at the people in it. Round a long table covered with black, sat some twelve men in garments like those he had already seen. Some of them Pierre had met in Petersburg society. In the president's chair sat a young man he did not know, with a peculiar cross hanging from his neck. On his right sat the Italian abbe whom Pierre had met at Anna Pavlovna's two years before. There were also present a very distinguished dignitary and a Swiss who had formerly been tutor at the Kuragins. All maintained a solemn silence, listening to the words of the President, who held a mallet in his hand. Let into the wall was a star-shaped light. At one side of the table was a small carpet with various figures worked upon it. At the other was something resembling an altar, on which lay a testament and a skull. Round it stood seven large candlesticks like those used in churches. Two of the brothers led Pierre up to the altar, placed his feet at right angles, and bade him lie down, saying that he must prostrate himself at the gates of the temple. "'He must first receive the trowel,' whispered one of the brothers. "'Oh, hush, please,' said another. Pierre, perplexed, looked round with his short-sighted eyes without obeying, and suddenly doubts arose in his mind. "'Where am I? What am I doing? Are they laughing at me?' Shan't I be ashamed to remember this? But these doubts only lasted a moment. Pierre glanced at the serious faces of those around, remembered all he had already gone through, and realized that he could not stop halfway. He was aghast at his hesitation, and trying to arouse his former devotional feeling, prostrated himself before the gates of the temple. And really the feeling of devotion returned to him even more strongly than before. When he had lain there some time, he was told to get up, and a white leather apron such as the others wore was put on him. He was given a trowel and three pairs of gloves, and then the Grand Master addressed him. He told him that he should try to do nothing to stain the whiteness of that apron which symbolized strength and purity. Then of the unexplained trowel he told him to toil with it to cleanse his own heart from vice and indulgently to smooth with it the heart of his neighbor. As to the first pair of gloves, a man's, he said that Pierre could not know their meaning, but must keep them. The second pair of man's gloves he was to wear at the meetings, and finally of the third, a pair of women's gloves, he said, Dear brother, these women's gloves are intended for you too. Give them to the woman whom you shall honor most of all. 
This gift will be a pledge of your purity of heart to her whom you select to be your worthy helpmeet in masonry. And after a pause he added, But beware, dear brother, that these gloves do not deck hands that are unclean. While the Grand Master said these last words, it seemed to Pierre that he grew embarrassed. Pierre himself grew still more confused, blushed like a child till tears came to his eyes, began looking about him uneasily, and an awkward pause followed. This silence was broken by one of the brethren, who led Pierre up to the rug, and began reading to him from a manuscript book an explanation of all the figures on it, the sun, the moon, a hammer, a plumb line, a trowel, a rough stone, and a squared stone, a pillar, three windows, and so on. Then a place was assigned to Pierre. He was shown the signs of the lodge, told the password, and at last was permitted to sit down. The Grand Master began reading the statutes. They were very long, and Pierre, from joy, agitation, and embarrassment, was not in a state to understand what was being read. He managed to follow only the last words of the statutes, and these remained in his mind. In our temples we recognize no other distinctions, read the Grand Master, but those between virtue and vice. Beware of making any distinctions which may infringe equality. Fly to a brother's aid, whoever he may be. Exhort him who goeth astray. Raise him that falleth. Never bear malice or enmity toward thy brother. Be kindly and courteous. Kindle in all hearts the flame of virtue. Share thy happiness with thy neighbor, and may envy never dim the purity of that bliss. Forgive thy enemy. Do not avenge thyself, except by doing him good. Thus fulfilling the highest law, thou shalt regain traces of the ancient dignity which thou hast lost. He finished and, getting up, embraced and kissed Pierre, who, with tears of joy in his eyes, looked round him, not knowing how to answer the congratulations and greetings from acquaintances that met him on all sides. He acknowledged no acquaintances, but saw in all these men only brothers, and burned with impatience to set to work with them. The Grand Master rapped with his mallet. All the masons sat down in their places, and one of them read an exhortation on the necessity of humility. The Grand Master proposed that the last duty should be performed, and the distinguished dignitary who bore the title of Collector of Arms went round to all the brothers. Pierre would have liked to subscribe all he had, but fearing that it might look like pride, subscribed the same amount as the others. The meeting was at an end, and on reaching home, Pierre felt as if he had returned from a long journey on which he had spent dozens of years, had become completely changed, and had quite left behind his former habits and way of life. Chapter 3 Pierre Repulses Prince Vasily The day after he had been received into the lodge, Pierre was sitting at home reading a book and trying to fathom the significance of the square one side of which symbolized God, another moral things, a third physical things, and the fourth a combination of these. Now and then his attention wandered from the book and the square, and he formed in imagination a new plan of life. On the previous evening at the lodge he had heard that a rumor of his duel had reached the Emperor, and that it would be wiser for him to leave Petersburg. Pierre proposed going to his estates in the south, and there attending to the welfare of his serfs. He was joyfully planning this new life when Prince Vasily suddenly entered the room. "'My dear fellow, what have you been up to in Moscow? Why have you quarrelled with Hélène, mon cher? You are under a delusion,' said Prince Vasily as he entered. "'I know all about it, and I can tell you positively that Hélène is as innocent before you as Christ was before the Jews.' Pierre was about to reply, but Prince Vasily interrupted him. And why didn't you simply come straight to me as to a friend? I know all about it and understand it all, he said. 
You behaved as becomes a man who values his honour, perhaps too hastily, but we won't go into that. But consider the position in which you are placing her and me in the eyes of society, and even of the court, he added, lowering his voice. She is living in Moscow, and you are here. Remember, dear boy, and he drew Pierre's arm downwards, it is simply a misunderstanding. I expect you feel it so yourself. Let us write her a letter at once, and she'll come here, and all will be explained. Or else, my dear boy, let me tell you, it's quite likely you'll have to suffer for it. Prince Vasily gave Pierre a significant look. I know from reliable sources that the Dodger Empress is taking a keen interest in the whole affair. You know she is very gracious to Hélène. Pierre tried several times to speak, but on one hand Prince Vasily did not let him, and on the other Pierre himself feared to begin to speak in the tone of decided refusal and disagreement in which he had firmly resolved to answer his father-in-law. Moreover, the words of the Masonic statutes, be kindly and courteous, recurred to him. He blinked, went red, got up and sat down again, struggling with himself to do what was for him the most difficult thing in life, to say an unpleasant thing to a man's face, to say what the other, whoever he might be, did not expect. He was so used to submitting to Prince Vasily's tone of careless self-assurance that he felt he would be unable to withstand it now. But he also felt that on what he said now his future depended, whether he would follow the same old road or that new path so attractively shown him by the Masons, on which he firmly believed he would be reborn to a new life. Now, dear boy, said Prince Vasily playfully, say yes, and I write to her myself, and we will kill the fatted calf. But before Prince Vasily had finished his playful speech, Pierre, without looking at him, and with a kind of fury that made him like his father, muttered in a whisper, Prince, I did not ask you here. Go, please go. And he jumped up and opened the door for him. Go, he repeated, amazed at himself, and glad to see the look of confusion and fear that showed itself on Prince Vasily's face. What's the matter with you? Are you ill? Go, the quivering voice repeated, and Prince Vasily had to go without receiving any explanation. A week later, Pierre, having taken leave of his new friends, the Masons, and leaving large sums of money with them for arms, went away to his estates. His new brethren gave him letters to the Kiev and Odessa Masons, and promised to write to him and guide him in his new activity. Chapter 4 A Soiree at Anna Pavlovna's Hélène takes up Boris. The duel between Pierre and Dolokhov was hushed up, and, in spite of the Emperor's severity regarding duels at that time, neither the principals nor their seconds suffered for it. But the story of the duel, confirmed by Pierre's rupture with his wife, was the talk of society. Pierre, who had been regarded with patronizing condescension when he was an illegitimate son, and petted and extolled when he was the best match in Russia, had sunk greatly in the esteem of society after his marriage, when the marriageable daughters and their mothers had nothing to hope from him, especially as he did not know how and did not wish to court society's favour. Now he alone was blamed for what had happened. He was said to be insanely jealous and subject, like his father, to fits of bloodthirsty rage. And when after Pierre's departure Hélène returned to Petersburg, she was received by all her acquaintances not only cordially, but even with a shade of deference due to her misfortune. When conversation turned on her husband, Hélène assumed a dignified expression which with characteristic tact she had acquired, though she did not understand its significance. This expression suggested that she had resolved to endure her troubles uncomplainingly, and that her husband was a cross laid upon her by God. Prince Vasily expressed his opinion more openly. He shrugged his shoulders when Pierre was mentioned, and, pointing to his forehead, remarked, A bit touched. I always said so. I said from the first, declared Anna Pavlovna, referring to Pierre, 
I said at the time, and before anyone else, she insisted on her priority, that that senseless young man was spoiled by the depraved ideas of these days. I said so even at the time when everybody was in raptures about him, when he had just returned from abroad, and when, if you remember, he posed as a sort of marat at one of my soirees. And how has it ended? I was against this marriage even then, and foretold all that has happened. Anna Pavlovna continued to give on free evenings the same kind of soirees as before, such as she alone had the gift of arranging, at which was to be found the cream of all really good society, the bloom of the intellectual essence of Petersburg, as she herself put it. Besides this refined selection of society, Anna Pavlovna's receptions were also distinguished by the fact that she always presented some new and interesting person to the visitors, and that nowhere else was the state of the political thermometer of legitimate Petersburg court society so clearly and distinctly indicated. Toward the end of 1806, when all the sad details of Napoleon's destruction of the Prussian army at Jena and Auerstadt and the surrender of most of the Prussian fortresses had been received, when our troops had already entered Prussia and our second war with Napoleon was beginning, Anna Pavlovna gave one of her soirees. The cream of really good society consisted of the fascinating Hélène, forsaken by her husband, Mortemar, the delightful Prince Hippolyte, who had just returned from Vienna, two diplomatists, the old aunt, a young man referred to in that drawing-room as a man of great merit, un homme de beaucoup de mérite, a newly appointed maid of honour and her mother, and several other less noteworthy persons. The novelty Anna Pavlovna was setting before her guests that evening was Boris Drubetskoy, who had just arrived as a special messenger from the Prussian army and was aide-de-camp to a very important personage. The temperature shown by the political thermometer to the company that evening was this. Whatever the European sovereigns and commanders may do to countenance Bonaparte, and to cause me, and us in general, annoyance and mortification, our opinion of Bonaparte cannot alter, cannot alter, cannot alter, cannot alter, cannot alter, cannot alter. We shall not cease to express our sincere views on that subject, and can only say to the King of Prussia and others, so much the worse for you. Tu l'as voulu, Georges Dandin. You would have it so. That's all we have to say about it. When Boris, who was to be served up to the guests, entered the drawing-room, almost all the company had assembled, and the conversation, guided by Anna Pavlovna, was about our diplomatic relations with Austria and the hope of an alliance with her. Boris, grown more manly and looking fresh, rosy, and self-possessed, entered the drawing-room elegantly dressed in the uniform of an aide-de-camp, and was duly conducted to pay his respects to the aunt, and then brought back to the general circle. Anna Pavlovna gave him her shriveled hand to kiss, and introduced him to several persons whom he did not know, giving him a whispered description of each. Uh, Prince Hippolyte Kuragin, charming young fellow. Monsieur Kronk, chargé d'affaires from Copenhagen, a profound intellect. And simply, uh, Mr. Shitov, a man of great merit, this of the man usually so described. Thanks to his mother's, Anna Mikhailovna's, efforts, his own tastes, and the peculiarities of his reserved nature, Boris had managed during his service to place himself very advantageously. He was aide-de-camp to a very important personage, had been sent on a very important mission to Prussia, and had just returned from there as a special messenger. He had become thoroughly conversant with that unwritten code with which he had been so pleased at Olmütz, and according to which an ensign might rank incomparably higher than a general, and according to which what was needed for success in the service was not effort or work or courage or perseverance, but only the knowledge of how to get on with those who can grant rewards. And he was himself often surprised at the rapidity of his success, and at the inability of others to understand these things. In consequence of this discovery, his whole manner of life, all his relations with old friends, all his plans for his future, were completely altered. He was not rich, 
but would spend his last groat to be better dressed than others, and would rather deprive himself of many pleasures than allow himself to be seen in a shabby equipage or appear in the streets of Petersburg in an old uniform. He made friends with and sought the acquaintance of only those above him in position and who could therefore be of use to him. He liked Petersburg and despised Moscow. The remembrance of the Rostovs' house and of his childish love for Natasha was unpleasant to him, and he had not once been to see the Rostovs since the day of his departure for the army. To be in Anna Pavlovna's drawing-room he considered an important step up in the service and he at once understood his role, letting his hostess make use of whatever interest he had to offer. He himself carefully scanned each face, appraising the possibilities of establishing intimacy with each of those present and the advantages that might accrue. He took the seat indicated to him beside the fair Hélène and listened to the general conversation. Vienna uh, considers the basis of the proposed treaty so unattainable that not even a continuity of most brilliant successes would secure them, and she doubts the means we have of gaining them. That is the actual phrase used by the Vienna cabinet, said the Danish chargé d'affaires. The doubt is flattering, said the man of profound intellect with a subtle smile. We must distinguish between the Vienna cabinet and the Emperor of Austria, said Mortmar. The Emperor of Austria can never have thought of such a thing. It is only the cabinet that says it. Ah, my dear Vicomte, put in Anna Pavlovna, l'Europe, for some reason she called it Europe, as if that were a specially refined French pronunciation which she could allow herself when conversing with a Frenchman. L'Europe ne sera jamais notre allié sincère. Europe will never be our sincere ally. After that, Anna Pavlovna led up to the courage and firmness of the King of Prussia in order to draw Boris into the conversation. Boris listened attentively to each of the speakers, awaiting his turn, but managed meanwhile to look round repeatedly at his neighbour, the beautiful Hélène, whose eyes several times met those of the handsome young aide-de-camp with a smile. Speaking of the position of Prussia, Anna Pavlovna very naturally asked Boris to tell them about his journey to Glogau, and in what state he found the Prussian army. Boris, speaking with deliberation, told them in pure, correct French many interesting details about the armies and the court, carefully abstaining from expressing an opinion of his own about the facts he was recounting. For some time he engrossed the general attention, and Anna Pavlovna felt that the novelty she had served up was received with pleasure by all her visitors. The greatest attention of all to Boris's narrative was shown by Hélène, she asked him several questions about his journey and seemed greatly interested in the state of the Prussian army. As soon as he had finished, she turned to him with her usual smile. "'You absolutely must come and see me,' she said, in a tone that implied that for certain considerations he could not know of, this was absolutely necessary. "'On Tuesday, between eight and nine, it will give me great pleasure.' Boris promised to fulfil her wish and was about to begin a conversation with her when Anna Pavlovna called him away on the pretext that her aunt wished to hear him. "'You know her husband, of course,' said Anna Pavlovna, closing her eyes and indicating Hélène with a sorrowful gesture. "'Ah, she is such an unfortunate and charming woman. Don't mention him before her. Please don't. It is too painful for her.'" Chapter 5 Hippolyte at Anna Pavlovna's when Boris and Anna Pavlovna returned to the others, Prince Hippolyte had the ear of the company. Bending forward in his armchair, he said, Le roi de Prusse, and having said this, laughed. Everyone turned toward him. Le roi de Prusse, Hippolyte said interrogatively, again laughing, and then calmly and seriously sat back in his chair. Anna Pavlovna waited for him to go on. But as he seemed quite decided to say no more, she began to tell of how at Potsdam the impious Bonaparte had stolen the sword of Frederick the Great. "'It is the sword of Frederick the Great which I—' she began, but Hippolyte interrupted her with the words, "'Le roi de Prusse," and again, as soon as all turned toward him, excused himself and said no more. 
Anna Pavlovna frowned. Mortemar, Hippolyte's friend, addressed him firmly. Come now, what about your roi de Prusse? Hippolyte laughed as if ashamed of laughing. Oh, it's nothing. I only wish to say... He wanted to repeat a joke he had heard in Vienna, and which he had been trying all that evening to get in. I only wish to say that we're wrong to fight pour le roi de Prusse. Note, for the king of Prussia, a phrase used in French to denote for a trifle of no value. Boris smiled circumspectly, so that it might be taken as ironical or appreciative according to the way the joke was received. Everybody laughed. "'Your joke is too bad. It's witty, but unjust,' said Anna Pavlovna, shaking her little shriveled finger at him. "'We are not fighting pour le roi de Prusse, but for right principles.' "'Oh, that wicked Prince Hippolyte, she said. The conversation did not flag all evening, and turned chiefly on the political news. It became particularly animated toward the end of the evening, when the rewards bestowed by the Emperor were mentioned. You know, uh, N. N. received a snuff-box with the portrait last year, said the man of profound intellect. Why shouldn't S. S. get the same distinction? Pardon me, a snuff-box with the Emperor's portrait is a reward, but not a distinction said the diplomatist. Uh, a gift, rather. Oh, there are precedents. I may mention Schwarzenberg. It's impossible, replied another. Will you bet? The ribbon of the order is a different matter. When everybody rose to go, Hélène, who had spoken very little all the evening, again turned to Boris, asking him in a tone of caressing, significant command to come to her on Tuesday. It is of great importance to me she said, turning with a smile toward Anna Pavlovna, and Anna Pavlovna, with the same sad smile with which she spoke of her exalted patroness, supported Hélène's wish. It seemed as if, from some words Boris had spoken that evening about the Prussian army, Hélène had suddenly found it necessary to see him. She seemed to promise to explain that necessity to him when he came on Tuesday. But on Tuesday evening, having come to Hélène's splendid salon, Boris received no clear explanation of why it had been necessary for him to come. There were other guests, and the Countess talked little to him, and only as he kissed her hand on taking leave said unexpectedly, and in a whisper with a strangely unsmiling face, "'Come to dinner tomorrow in the evening. You must come. Come.' During that stay in Petersburg, Boris became an intimate in the Countess's house. Chapter 6 Old Bolkonsky as Commander-in-Chief of the Conscription. Andrew's Anxiety. A Letter from His Father. The war was flaming up and nearing the Russian frontier. Everywhere one heard curses on Bonaparte, the enemy of mankind. Militiamen and recruits were being enrolled in the villages, and from the seat of war came contradictory news, false as usual, and therefore variously interpreted. The life of old Prince Bolkonsky, Prince Andrew, and Princess Mary had greatly changed since 1805. In 1806 the old prince was made one of the eight commanders-in-chief then appointed to supervise the enrollment decreed throughout Russia. Despite the weakness of age, which had become particularly noticeable since the time when he thought his son had been killed, he did not think it right to refuse a duty to which he had been appointed by the emperor himself and this fresh opportunity for action gave him new energy and strength. He was continually traveling through the three provinces entrusted to him, was pedantic in the fulfillment of his duties, severe to cruelty with his subordinates, and went into everything down to the minutest details himself. Princess Mary had ceased taking lessons in mathematics from her father, and when the old prince was at home, went to his study with the wet nurse and little Prince Nicholas, as his grandfather called him. The baby Prince Nicholas lived with his wet nurse and nurse Savishna in the late princess's rooms, and Princess Mary spent most of the day in the nursery, taking a mother's place to her little nephew as best she could. Mademoiselle Bourienne, too, seemed passionately fond of the boy, and Princess Mary often deprived herself to give her friend the pleasure of dandling the little angel, as she called her nephew, and playing with him. Near the altar of the church at Bald Hills there was a chapel over the tomb of the little princess, 
and in this chapel was a marble monument brought from Italy, representing an angel with outspread wings ready to fly upwards. The angel's upper lip was slightly raised, as though about to smile, and once on coming out of the chapel, Prince Andrew and Princess Mary admitted to one another that the angel's face reminded them strangely of the little princess. But what was still stranger, though of this Prince Andrew said nothing to his sister, was that in the expression the sculptor had happened to give the angel's face, Prince Andrew read the same mild reproach he had read on the face of his dead wife. Ah, why have you done this to me? Soon after Prince Andrew's return, the old prince made over to him a large estate, Bogucharovo, about twenty-five miles from Bald Hills. Partly because of the depressing memories associated with Bald Hills, partly because Prince Andrew did not always feel equal to bearing with his father's peculiarity, and partly because he needed solitude, Prince Andrew made use of Bogucharovo, began building, and spent most of his time there. After the Austerlitz campaign, Prince Andrew had firmly resolved not to continue his military service, and when the war recommenced and everybody had to serve, he took a post under his father in the recruitment so as to avoid active service. The old prince and his son seemed to have changed roles since the campaign of 1805. The old man, roused by activity, expected the best results from the new campaign, while Prince Andrew, on the contrary, taking no part in the war and secretly regretting this, saw only the dark side. On February 26, 1807, the old prince set off on one of his circuits. Prince Andrew remained at Bald Hills as usual during his father's absence. Little Nicholas had been unwell for four days. The coachman who had driven the old prince to town returned bringing papers and letters for Prince Andrew. Not finding the young prince in his study, the valet went with the letters to Princess Mary's apartments, but did not find him there. He was told that the prince had gone to the nursery. "'If you please, Your Excellency, Petrusha has brought some papers,' said one of the nursemaids to Prince Andrew, who was sitting on a child's little chair, while, frowning and with trembling hands, he poured drops from a medicine bottle into a wine-glass half full of water. "'What is it?' he said crossly and, his hand shaking unintentionally, he poured too many drops into the glass. He threw the mixture onto the floor and asked for some more water. The maid brought it. There were in the room a child's cot, two boxes, two armchairs, a table, a child's table, and the little chair on which Prince Andrew was sitting. The curtains were drawn, and a single candle was burning on the table, screened by a bound music book, so that the light did not fall on the cot. "'My dear,' said Princess Mary, addressing her brother from beside the cot where she was standing, "'better wait a bit. Later.' "'Oh, leave off. You always talk nonsense and keep putting things off. And this is what comes of it,' said Prince Andrew, in an exasperated whisper, evidently meaning to wound his sister. "'My dear, really, it's better not to wake him. He's asleep.' said the princess in a tone of entreaty. Prince Andrew got up and went on tiptoe up to the little bed, wine-glass in hand. "'Perhaps we'd really better not wake him,' he said, hesitating. "'As you please, really, I, I, I think so, but as you please,' said Princess Mary, evidently intimidated and confused that her opinion had prevailed. She drew her brother's attention to the maid who was calling him in a whisper. It was the second night that neither of them had slept, watching the boy who was in a high fever. These last days, mistrusting their household doctor and expecting another for whom they had sent to town, they had been trying first one remedy and then another. Worn out by sleeplessness and anxiety, they threw their burden of sorrow on one another and reproached and disputed with each other. "'Petrusha has come with papers from your father,' whispered the maid. Prince Andrew went out. "'Devil take them,' he muttered, and after listening to the verbal instructions his father had sent, and taking the correspondence and his father's letter, he returned to the nursery. "'Well?' he asked. "'Still the same. Wait, for heaven's sake. Karl Ivanich always says that sleep is more important than anything.' 
whispered Princess Mary with a sigh. Prince Andrew went up to the child and felt him. He was burning hot. Confound you and your Karl Ivanich. He took the glass with the drops and again went up to the cot. Andrew, don't, said Princess Mary. But he scowled at her angrily, though also with suffering in his eyes, and stooped glass in hand over the infant. But I wish it, he said. I beg you, give it him. Princess Mary shrugged her shoulders, but took the glass submissively, and, calling the nurse, began giving the medicine. The child screamed hoarsely. Prince Andrew winced, and, clutching his head, went out and sat down on a sofa in the next room. He still had all the letters in his hand. Opening them mechanically, he began reading. The old prince, now and then using abbreviations, wrote in his large, elongated hand on blue paper as follows. Have just this moment received by special messenger very joyful news, if it's not false. Benixen seems to have obtained a complete victory over Bonaparte at Eilau. In Petersburg, everyone is rejoicing, and the rewards sent to the army are innumerable. Though he is a German, I congratulate him. I can't make out what the commander at Korchevo, a certain Khandrikov, is up to. Till now the additional men and provisions have not arrived. Gallop off to him at once and say I'll have his head off if everything is not here in a week. Have received another letter about the Preussisch Eilau battle from Petjenka. He took part in it, and it's all true. When mischief makers don't meddle, even a German beats Buonaparte. He is said to be fleeing in great disorder. Mind you gallop off to Korchevo without delay and carry out instructions. Prince Andrew sighed and broke the seal of another envelope. It was a closely written letter of two sheets from Bilibin. He folded it up without reading it, and reread his father's letter, ending with the words, Gallop off to Korchevo and carry out instructions. No, pardon me, I won't go now till the child is better, thought he, going to the door and looking into the nursery. Princess Mary was still standing by the cot, gently rocking the baby. Ah, yes, and what else did he say that's unpleasant, thought Prince Andrew, recalling his father's letter. Yes, we've gained a victory over Bonaparte, just when I'm not serving. Yes, yes, he's always poking fun at me. Ah, well, let him. And he began reading Bilibin's letter, which was written in French. He read without understanding half of it, read only to forget, if but for a moment, what he had too long been thinking of so painfully, to the exclusion of all else. Chapter 7 Bilibin's Letter About the Campaign The Baby Convalescent Bilibin was now at army headquarters in a diplomatic capacity, and though he wrote in French and used French jests and French idioms, he described the whole campaign with a fearless self-censure and self-derision genuinely Russian. Bilibin wrote that the obligation of diplomatic discretion tormented him, and he was happy to have in Prince Andrew a reliable correspondent to whom he could pour out the bile he had accumulated at the sight of all that was being done in the army. The letter was old, having been written before the battle at Preussisch Eilau. Since the day of our brilliant success at Austerlitz, wrote Bilibin, as you know, my dear Prince, I never leave headquarters. I have certainly acquired a taste for war, and it is just as well for me. What I have seen during these last three months is incredible. I begin ab ovo, from the beginning. The enemy of the human race, as you know, attacks the Prussians. The Prussians are our faithful allies who have only betrayed us three times in three years. We take up their cause, but it turns out that the enemy of the human race pays no heed to our fine speeches, and in his rude and savage way throws himself on the Prussians without giving them time to finish the parade they had begun, and in two twists of the hand he breaks them to smithereens and installs himself in the palace at Potsdam. I most ardently desire, writes the King of Prussia to Bonaparte, that your majesty should be received and treated in my palace in a manner agreeable to yourself, and, in so far as circumstances allowed, I have hastened to take all steps to that end. May I have succeeded? The Prussian generals pride themselves on being polite to the French, 
and lay down their arms at the first demand. The head of the garrison at Glogau, with 10,000 men, asks the king of Prussia what he is to do if he is summoned to surrender. All this is absolutely true. In short, hoping to settle matters by taking up a warlike attitude, it turns out that we have landed ourselves in war, and what is more, in war on our own frontiers, with and for the king of Prussia. No, this is the same untranslatable pun as in the last page. It means with the king of Prussia and for a matter of no account. We have everything in perfect order. Only one little thing is lacking, namely a commander-in-chief. As it was considered that the Austerlitz success might have been more decisive had the commander-in-chief not been so young, all our octogenarians were reviewed, and of Prozorovsky and Kamyinsky, the latter was preferred. The general comes to us, Suvorov-like, in a kibitka, and is received with acclamations of joy and triumph. Note, kibitka, originally a movable dwelling used by nomad tribes and constructed of lattice work covered with felt. The word is also used, as in this case, of an old-fashioned wooden cart with a covered top. On the 4th, the first courier arrives from Petersburg. The males are taken to the field marshal's room, for he likes to do everything himself. I am called in to help sort the letters and take those meant for us. The field marshal looks on and waits for letters addressed to him. We search, but none are to be found. The field marshal grows impatient and sets to work himself and finds letters from the emperor to Count T, Prince V, and others. Then he bursts into one of his wild furies and rages at everyone and everything, seizes the letters, opens them, and reads those from the emperor addressed to others. Ah, so that's the way they treat me. No confidence in me. Ah, ordered to keep an eye on me. Very well, then. Get along with you. So he writes the famous order of the day to General Bennigsen. I am wounded and cannot ride and consequently cannot command the army. You have brought your army corps to Pultusk routed. Here it is exposed and without fuel or forage, so something must be done. And, as you yourself reported to Count Buxhoven yesterday, you must think of retreating to our frontier, which do today. From all my riding, he writes to the Emperor, I've got a saddle sore, which, coming after all my previous journeys, quite prevents my riding and commanding so vast an army. So I have passed on the command to the next general in seniority, Count Buxhoven, having sent him my whole staff and all that belongs to it, advising him if there is a lack of bread to move farther into the interior of Prussia, for only one day's ration of bread remains, and in some regiments none at all, as reported by the division commanders, Ostermann and Sedmoretsky, and all that the peasants had has been eaten up. I myself will remain in hospital at Ostrolenka till I recover, in regard to which I humbly submit my report with the information that if the army remains in its present bivouac another fortnight, there will not be a healthy man left in it by spring. Grant leave to retire to his country seat to an old man who is already in any case dishonoured by being unable to fulfil the great and glorious task for which he was chosen. I shall await your most gracious permission here in hospital that I may not have to play the part of a secretary rather than commander in the army. My removal from the army does not produce the slightest stir. A blind man has left it. There are thousands such as I in Russia. The field marshal is angry with the emperor, and he punishes us all. Isn't it logical? This is the first act. Those that follow are naturally increasingly interesting and entertaining. After the field marshal's departure, it appears that we are within sight of the enemy and must give battle. Buxhoven is commander-in-chief by seniority, but General Bennigsen does not quite see it. More particularly, as it is he and his corps who are within sight of the enemy, and he wishes to profit by the opportunity to fight a battle on his own hand, as the Germans say. He does so. This is the Battle of Pultusk, which is considered a great victory, 
but in my opinion was nothing of the kind. We civilians, as you know, have a very bad way of deciding whether a battle was won or lost. Those who retreat after a battle have lost it, is what we say, and according to that it is we who lost the battle of Pultusk. In short, we retreat after the battle, but send a courier to Petersburg with news of a victory, and General Bennigsen, hoping to receive from Petersburg the post of commander-in-chief as a reward for his victory, does not give up the command of the army to General Buxhoevden. During this interregnum, we begin a very original and interesting series of manoeuvres. Our aim is no longer, as it should be, to avoid or attack the enemy, but solely to avoid General Buxhoevden, who by right of seniority should be our chief. So energetically do we pursue this aim, that after crossing an unfordable river, we burn the bridges to separate ourselves from our enemy, who at the moment is not Bonaparte, but Buxhoevden. General Buxhoevden was all but attacked and captured by a superior enemy force as a result of one of these maneuvers that enabled us to escape him. Buxhoevden pursues us, we scuttle. He hardly crosses the river to our side before we recross to the other. At last our enemy, Buxhoevden, catches us and attacks. Both generals are angry, and the result is a challenge on Buxhoevden's part and an epileptic fit on Bennigsen's. But at the critical moment, the courier who carried the news of our victory at Pultusk to Petersburg returns, bringing our appointment as commander-in-chief, and our first foe, Buxhoevden, is vanquished. We can now turn our thoughts to the second, Bonaparte. But as it turns out, just at that moment, a third enemy rises before us, namely the orthodox Russian soldiers, loudly demanding bread, meat, biscuits, fodder, and what not. The stores are empty, the roads impassable. The orthodox begin looting, and in a way of which our last campaign can give you no idea. Half the regiments form bands and scour the countryside and put everything to fire and sword. The inhabitants are totally ruined, the hospitals overflow with sick, and famine is everywhere. Twice the marauders even attack our headquarters, and the commander-in-chief has to ask for a battalion to disperse them. During one of these attacks, they carried off my empty portmanteau and my dressing gown. The emperor proposes to give all commanders of divisions the right to shoot marauders, but I much fear this will oblige one half the army to shoot the other. At first Prince Andrew read with his eyes only, but after a while, in spite of himself, although he knew how far it was safe to trust Bilibin, what he had read began to interest him more and more. When he had read thus far, he crumpled the letter up and threw it away. It was not what he had read that vexed him, but the fact that the life out there in which he had now no part could perturb him. He shut his eyes, rubbed his forehead as if to rid himself of all interest in what he had read, and listened to what was passing in the nursery. Suddenly he thought he heard a strange noise through the door. He was seized with alarm, lest something should have happened to the child while he was reading the letter. He went on tiptoe to the nursery door and opened it. Just as he went in, he saw that the nurse was hiding something from him with a scared look, and that Princess Mary was no longer by the cot. My dear... He heard what seemed to him her despairing whisper behind him. As often happens after long sleeplessness and long anxiety, he was seized by an unreasoning panic. It occurred to him that the child was dead. All that he saw and heard seemed to confirm this terror. All is over, he thought, and a cold sweat broke out on his forehead. He went to the cot in confusion, sure that he would find it empty, and that the nurse had been hiding the dead baby. He drew the curtain aside, and for some time his frightened, restless eyes could not find the baby. At last he saw him. The rosy boy had tossed about till he lay across the bed with his head lower than the pillow, and was smacking his lips in his sleep and breathing evenly. Prince Andrew was as glad to find the boy like that as if he had already lost him. He bent over him, and, as his sister had taught him, tried with his lips whether the child was still feverish. The soft forehead was moist. Prince Andrew touched the head with his hand, 
Even the hair was wet, so profusely had the child perspired. He was not dead, but evidently the crisis was over, and he was convalescent. Prince Andrew longed to snatch up, to squeeze, to hold to his heart this helpless little creature, but dared not do so. He stood over him, gazing at his head and at the little arms and legs which showed under the blanket. He heard a rustle behind him, and a shadow appeared under the curtain of the cot. He did not look round, but, still gazing at the infant's face, listened to his regular breathing. The dark shadow was Princess Mary, who had come up to the cot with noiseless steps, lifted the curtain, and dropped it again behind her. Prince Andrew recognized her without looking, and held out his hand to her. She pressed it. "'He has perspired,' said Prince Andrew. I was coming to tell you so. The child moved slightly in his sleep, smiled, and rubbed his forehead against the pillow. Prince Andrew looked at his sister. In the dim shadow of the curtain, her luminous eyes shone more brightly than usual from the tears of joy that were in them. She leaned over to her brother and kissed him, slightly catching the curtain of the cot. Each made the other a warning gesture and stood still in the dim light beneath the curtain, as if not wishing to leave that seclusion where they three were shut off from all the world. Prince Andrew was the first to move away, ruffling his hair against the muslin of the curtain. Yes, this is the one thing left me now, he said with a sigh. Chapter 8 Pierre goes to Kiev and visits his estates. Obstacles to the Emancipation of His Serfs Soon after his admission to the Masonic Brotherhood, Pierre went to the Kiev province, where he had the greatest number of serfs, taking with him full directions which he had written down for his own guidance as to what he should do on his estates. When he reached Kiev, he sent for all his stewards to the head office and explained to them his intentions and wishes. He told them that steps would be taken immediately to free his serfs, and that till then... They were not to be overburdened with labor. Women, while nursing their babies, were not to be sent to work. Assistance was to be given to the serfs. Punishments were to be admonitory and not corporal. And hospitals, asylums, and schools were to be established on all the estates. Some of the stewards, there were semi-literate foremen among them, listened with alarm. Supposing these words to mean that the young count was displeased with their management and embezzlement of money, some, after their first fright, were amused by Pierre's lisp and the new words they had not heard before. Others simply enjoyed hearing how the master talked, while the cleverest among them, including the chief steward, understood from this speech how they could best handle the master for their own ends. The chief steward expressed great sympathy with Pierre's intentions, but remarked that, besides these changes, it would be necessary to go into the general state of affairs which was far from satisfactory. Despite Count Bezukhov's enormous wealth, since he had come into an income which was said to amount to 500,000 rubles a year, Pierre felt himself far poorer than when his father had made him an allowance of 10,000 rubles. He had a dim perception of the following budget. About 80,000 went in payments on all the estates to the land bank. About 30,000 went for the upkeep of the estate near Moscow, the townhouse, and the allowance to the three princesses. About 15,000 was given in pensions and the same amount for asylums. 150,000 alimony was sent to the countess. About 70,000 went for interest on debts. The building of a new church previously begun had cost about 10,000 in each of the last two years, and he did not know how the rest, about 100,000 rubles, was spent and almost every year he was obliged to borrow. Besides this, the chief steward wrote every year telling him of fires and bad harvests, or of the necessity of rebuilding factories and workshops. So the first task Pierre had to face was one for which he had very little aptitude or inclination. Practical business. Pierre discussed estate affairs every day with his chief steward. But he felt that this did not forward matters at all. He felt that these consultations were detached from real affairs and did not link up with them or make them move. On the one hand, 
The chief steward put the state of things to him in the very worst light, pointing out the necessity of paying off the debts and undertaking new activities with serf labor, to which Pierre did not agree. On the other hand, Pierre demanded that steps should be taken to liberate the serfs, which the steward met by showing the necessity of first paying off the loans from the land bank and the consequent impossibility of a speedy emancipation. The steward did not say it was quite impossible, but suggested selling the forests in the province of Kostroma, the land lower down the river, and the Crimean estate in order to make it possible, all of which operations, according to him, were connected with such complicated measures, the removal of injunctions, petitions, permits, and so on, that Pierre became quite bewildered and only replied, yes, yes, uh, do so. Pierre had none of the practical persistence that would have enabled him to attend to the business himself, and so he disliked it, and only tried to pretend to the steward that he was attending to it. The steward, for his part, tried to pretend to the Count that he considered these consultations very valuable for the proprietor and troublesome to himself. In Kiev, Pierre found some people he knew, and strangers hastened to make his acquaintance and joyfully welcomed the rich newcomer, the largest landowner of the province. Temptations to Pierre's greatest weakness, the one to which he had confessed when admitted to the lodge, were so strong that he could not resist them. Again whole days, weeks, and months of his life passed in as great a rush and were as much occupied with evening parties, dinners, lunches, and balls, giving him no time for reflection, as in Petersburg. Instead of the new life he had hoped to lead, he still lived the old life, only in new surroundings. Of the three precepts of Freemasonry, Pierre realized that he did not fulfill the one which enjoined every Mason to set an example of moral life, and that of the seven virtues he lacked two, morality and the love of death. He consoled himself with the thought that he fulfilled another of the precepts, that of reforming the human race, and had other virtues, love of his neighbor, and especially generosity. In the spring of 1807 he decided to return to Petersburg. On the way he intended to visit all his estates and see for himself how far his orders had been carried out and in what state were the serfs whom God had entrusted to his care and whom he intended to benefit. The chief steward, who considered the young Count's attempts almost insane, unprofitable to himself, to the Count, and to the serfs, made some concessions. Continuing to represent the liberation of the serfs as impracticable, he arranged for the erection of large buildings, schools, hospitals, and asylums, on all the estates before the master arrived. Everywhere preparations were made, not for ceremonious welcomes, which he knew Pierre would not like, but for just such gratefully religious ones, with offerings of icons and the bread and salt of hospitality, as, according to his understanding of his master, would touch and delude him. The southern spring, the comfortable rapid travelling in a Vienna carriage, and the solitude of the road, all had a gladdening effect on Pierre. The estates he had not before visited were each more picturesque than the other. The serfs everywhere seemed thriving and touchingly grateful for the benefits conferred on them. Everywhere were receptions which, though they embarrassed Pierre, awakened a joyful feeling in the depth of his heart. In one place the peasants presented him with bread and salt and an icon of St. Peter and St. Paul, asking permission, as a mark of their gratitude for the benefits he had conferred on them, to build a new chantry to the church at their own expense in honor of Peter and Paul, his patron saints. In another place, the women with infants in arms met him to thank him for releasing them from hard work. On a third estate, the priest, bearing a cross, came to meet him surrounded by children whom by the Count's generosity he was instructing in reading, writing, and religion. On all his estates, Pierre saw with his own eyes brick buildings erected or in the course of erection, all on one plan, for hospitals, schools, and almshouses, which were soon to be opened. Everywhere he saw the steward's accounts, according to which the serf's manorial labor had been diminished, and heard the touching thanks of deputations of serfs in their full-skirted blue coats. 
What Pierre did not know was that the place where they presented him with bread and salt and wished to build a chantry in honor of Peter and Paul was a market village where a fair was held on St. Peter's Day and that the richest peasants who formed the deputation had begun the chantry long before but that nine-tenths of the peasants in that village were in a state of the greatest poverty. He did not know that since the nursing mothers were no longer sent to work on his land, they did still harder work on their own land. He did not know that the priest who met him with the cross oppressed the peasants by his exactions, and that the pupils' parents wept at having to let him take their children and secured their release by heavy payments. Note, the work of the children on the plots cultivated by the peasants for themselves was valuable to them. He did not know that the brick buildings built to plan were being built by serfs whose manorial labor was thus increased, though lessened on paper. He did not know that where the steward had shown him in the accounts that the serfs' payments had been diminished by a third, their obligatory manorial work had been increased by a half. And so Pierre was delighted with his visit to his estates and quite recovered the philanthropic mood in which he had left Petersburg and wrote enthusiastic letters to his brother instructor, as he called the Grand Master. How easy it is, how little effort it needs to do so much good, thought Pierre, and how little attention we pay to it. He was pleased at the gratitude he received, but felt abashed at receiving it. This gratitude reminded him of how much more he might do for these simple, kindly people. The chief steward, a very stupid but cunning man, who saw perfectly through the naive and intelligent count and played with him as with a toy, seeing the effect these prearranged receptions had on Pierre, pressed him still harder with proofs of the impossibility and, above all, the uselessness of freeing the serfs, who were quite happy as it was. Pierre, in his secret soul, agreed with the steward that it would be difficult to imagine happier people, and that God only knew what would happen to them when they were free. But he insisted, though reluctantly, on what he thought right. The steward promised to do all in his power to carry out the Count's wishes, seeing clearly that not only would the Count never be able to find out whether all measures had been taken for the sale of the land and forests, and to release them from the land bank, but would probably never even inquire, and would never know that the newly erected buildings were standing empty, and that the serfs continued to give in money and work all that other people's serfs gave, that is to say, all that could be got out of them. Chapter 9 Pierre Visits Prince Andrew Returning from his journey through South Russia in the happiest state of mind, Pierre carried out an intention he had long had of visiting his friend Bolkonsky, whom he had not seen for two years. Bogucharovo lay in a flat, uninteresting part of the country, among fields and forests of fir and birch, which were partly cut down. The house lay behind a newly dug pond filled with water to the brink and with banks still bare of grass. It was at the end of a village that stretched along the high road in the midst of a young copse in which were a few fir trees. The homestead consisted of a threshing floor, outhouses, stables, a bathhouse, a lodge, and a large brick house with semicircular facade still in course of construction. Round the house was a garden newly laid out. The fences and gates were new and solid. Two fire pumps and a water cart painted green stood in a shed. The paths were straight, the bridges were strong, and had handrails. Everything bore an impress of tidiness and good management. Some domestic serfs Pierre met, in reply to inquiries as to where the prince lived, pointed out a small newly built lodge close to the pond. Anton, a man who had looked after Prince Andrew in his boyhood, helped Pierre out of his carriage, said that the prince was at home, and showed him into a clean little anteroom. Pierre was struck by the modesty of the small though clean house after the brilliant surroundings in which he had last met his friend in Petersburg. He quickly entered the small reception room with its still unplastered wooden walls redolent of pine, and would have gone farther 
but Anton ran ahead on tiptoe and knocked at a door. "'Well, what is it?' came a sharp, unpleasant voice. "'A visitor,' answered Anton. "'Ask him to wait.' And the sound was heard of a chair being pushed back. Pierre went with rapid steps to the door and suddenly came face to face with Prince Andrew, who came out frowning and looking old. Pierre embraced him and, lifting his spectacles, kissed his friend on the cheek and looked at him closely. "'Well, I did not expect you. I am very glad,' said Prince Andrew. Pierre said nothing. He looked fixedly at his friend with surprise. He was struck by the change in him. His words were kindly, and there was a smile on his lips and face, but his eyes were dull and lifeless, and in spite of his evident wish to do so, he could not give them a joyous and glad sparkle. Prince Andrew had grown thinner, paler, and more manly-looking, but what amazed and estranged Pierre till he got used to it were his inertia and a wrinkle on his brow indicating prolonged concentration on some one thought. As is usually the case with people meeting after a prolonged separation, it was long before their conversation could settle on anything. They put questions and gave brief replies about things they knew ought to be talked over at length. At last the conversation gradually settled on some of the topics at first lightly touched on. Their past life, plans for the future, Pierre's journeys and occupations, the war, and so on. The preoccupation and despondency which Pierre had noticed in his friend's look was now still more clearly expressed in the smile with which he listened to Pierre, especially when he spoke with joyful animation of the past or the future. It was as if Prince Andrew would have liked to sympathize with what Pierre was saying, but could not. The latter began to feel that it was in bad taste to speak of his enthusiasms, dreams, and hopes of happiness or goodness in Prince Andrew's presence. He was ashamed to express his new Masonic views, which had been particularly revived and strengthened by his late tour. He checked himself, fearing to seem naive, yet he felt an irresistible desire to show his friend as soon as possible that he was now a quite different and better Pierre than he had been in Petersburg. I can't tell you how much I have lived through since then. I hardly know myself again. Yes, we have altered much, very much since then, said Prince Andrew. Well, and you, what are your plans? Plans? repeated Prince Andrew ironically. My plans, he said, as if astonished at the word. Well, you see, I'm building. I mean to settle here altogether next year. Pierre looked silently and searchingly into Prince Andrew's face, which had grown much older. "'No, I, I meant to ask,' Pierre began, but Prince Andrew interrupted him. "'But why talk of me?' "'Talk to me, yes. Tell me about your travels and all you've been doing on your estates.' Pierre began describing what he had done on his estates, trying as far as possible to conceal his own part in the improvements that had been made. Prince Andrew several times prompted Pierre's story of what he had been doing, as though it were all an old-time story, and he listened not only without interest, but even as if ashamed of what Pierre was telling him. Pierre felt uncomfortable and even depressed in his friend's company, and at last became silent. "'I'll tell you what, my dear fellow,' said Prince Andrew, who evidently also felt depressed and constrained with his visitor. I'm only bivouacking here, and have just come to look around. I'm going back to my sister today. I will introduce you to her. But, uh, of course, you know her already, he said, evidently trying to entertain a visitor with whom he now found nothing in common. We will go after dinner. And uh, would you now like to look round my place? They went out and walked about till dinner time, talking of the political news and common acquaintances like people who do not know each other intimately. Prince Andrew spoke with some animation and interest only of the new homestead he was constructing and its buildings. But even here, while on the scaffolding, in the midst of a talk explaining the future arrangements of the house, he interrupted himself. However, this is not at all interesting. Let us have dinner and then we'll set off. 
At dinner, conversation turned on Pierre's marriage. I was very much surprised when I heard of it, said Prince Andrew. Pierre blushed, as he always did when it was mentioned, and said hurriedly, I will tell you some time how it all happened, but you know it is all over and forever. Forever? said Prince Andrew. Nothing's forever. But you know how it all ended, don't you? You heard of the duel? <laughs> and so you had to go through that, too. One thing I thank God for is that I did not kill that man, said Pierre. Why so? asked Prince Andrew. To kill a vicious dog is a very good thing, really. No, to, to kill a man is bad, wrong. Why is it wrong? urged Prince Andrew. It is not given to man to know what is right and what is wrong. Men always did and always will err, and in nothing more than in what they consider right and wrong. What does harm to another is wrong, said Pierre, feeling with pleasure that for the first time since his arrival Prince Andrew was roused, had begun to talk, and wanted to express what had brought him to his present state. <laughs> and who has told you what is bad for another man? he asked. Oh, bad, bad, exclaimed Pierre. We all know what is bad for ourselves. Yes, but we know that, but the harm I am conscious of in myself is something I cannot inflict on others, said Prince Andrew, growing more and more animated and evidently wishing to express his new outlook to Pierre. He spoke in French. I only know two very real evils in life remorse and illness. The only good is the absence of those evils. To live for myself, avoiding those two evils, is my whole philosophy now. And love of one's neighbor and self-sacrifice, began Pierre. No, I can't agree with you. To live only so as not to do evil and not to have to repent is not enough. I lived like that. I lived for myself and ruined my life. And only now, when I'm living, or at least trying, Pierre's modesty made him correct himself, to live for others, only now have I understood all the happiness of life. No, I shall not agree with you, and you do not really believe what you're saying. Prince Andrew looked silently at Pierre with an ironic smile. When you see my sister, Princess Mary, you'll get on with her, he said. Perhaps you're right for yourself, he added after a short pause, but everyone lives in his own way. You lived for yourself and say you nearly ruined your life and only found happiness when you began living for others. I experienced just the reverse. I lived for glory. After all, what is glory? The same love of others, a desire to do something for them, a desire for their approval. So I lived for others and not almost, but quite ruined my life. And I've become calmer since I began to live only for myself. But what do you mean by living only for yourself? asked Pierre, growing excited. What about your son, your sister, and your father? But that's just the same as myself. They are not others, explained Prince Andrew. The others, one's neighbors, le prochain, as you and Princess Mary call it, are the chief source of all error and evil. Le prochain, your Kiev peasants to whom you want to do good. And he looked at Pierre with a mocking, challenging expression. He evidently wished to draw him on. No, you're joking, replied Pierre, growing more and more excited. What error or evil can there be in my wishing to do good, and even doing a little? Uh, though I, I did very little and did it very badly. What evil can there be in it if unfortunate people, our serfs, people like ourselves, were growing up and dying with no idea of God and truth beyond ceremonies and meaningless prayers, and are now instructed in a comforting belief in future life, retribution, recompense, and consolation? What evil and error are there in it if people were dying of disease without help while material assistance could so easily be rendered and I supplied them with a doctor, a hospital, and an asylum for the aged? And is it not uh, palpable, 
unquestionable good if a peasant or a woman with a baby has no rest day or night, and I give them rest and leisure, said Pierre, hurrying and lisping. And I have done that, though badly and to a small extent, but I have done something toward it, and you cannot persuade me that it was not a good action. And more than that, you can't make me believe that you do not think so yourself. And the main thing is, he continued, that I know and know for certain that the enjoyment of doing this good is the only sure happiness in life. Yes, if you put it like that, it's quite a different matter, said Prince Andrew. I build a house and lay out a garden, and you build hospitals. The one and the other may serve as a pastime, but what's right and what's good must be judged by one who knows all, but not by us. Well, you want an argument, he added. Come on, then. They rose from the table and sat down in the entrance porch, which served as a veranda. Come, let's argue, then, said Prince Andrew. You talk of schools, he went on, crooking a finger. Education and so forth. That is, you want to raise him, pointing to a peasant who passed by them taking off his cap, from his animal condition, and awaken in him spiritual needs, while it seems to me that animal happiness is the only happiness possible. And that is just what you want to deprive him of. I envy him, but you want to make him what I am without giving him my means. Then you say, lighten his toil. But as I see it, physical labor is as essential to him, as much a condition of his existence, as mental activity is to you or me. You can't help thinking. I go to bed after two in the morning, thoughts come and I can't sleep but toss about till dawn because I think and can't help thinking, just as he can't help plowing and mowing. If he didn't, he would go to the drink shop or fall ill, just as I could not stand his terrible physical labor but should die of it in a week. So he could not stand my physical idleness but would grow fat and die. Now, the third thing, uh, what else was it you talked about? and Prince Andrew crooked a third finger. Ah, yes, hospitals, medicine. He has a fit, he's dying. And you come and bleed him and patch him up. He will drag about as a cripple, a burden to everybody for another ten years. It would be far easier and simpler for him to die. Others are being born, and there are plenty of them as it is. It would be different if you grudged losing a laborer, and that's how I regard him. But you want to cure him from love of him, and he does not want that. And besides, what a notion that medicine ever cured anyone. Killed them, yes, said he, frowning angrily and turning away from Pierre. Prince Andrew expressed his idea so clearly and distinctly that it was evident he had reflected on this subject more than once, and he spoke readily and rapidly like a man who has not talked for a long time. His glance became more animated as his conclusions became more hopeless. Oh, that is dreadful, dreadful, said Pierre. I don't understand how one can live with such ideas. I had such moments myself not long ago in Moscow and when traveling, but at such times I collapse so that I don't live at all. Everything seems hateful to me, myself most of all. Then I don't eat, don't wash, and, and how is it with you? Why not wash? That is not cleanly, said Prince Andrew. On the contrary, we must try to make one's life as pleasant as possible. I'm alive, that is not my fault, so I must live out my life as best I can without hurting others. But with such ideas, what motive have you for living? One would sit without moving, undertaking nothing. Life as it is leaves one no peace. I should be thankful to do nothing, but here on the one hand the local nobility have done me the honor to choose me to be their marshal. It was all I could do to get out of it. They could not understand that I have not the necessary qualifications for it, the kind of good-natured, fussy shallowness necessary for the position. Then there's this house, which must be built in order to have a nook of one's own in which to be quiet. And now there's this recruiting. Why aren't you serving in the army? After Austerlitz, said Prince Andrew gloomily, no, thank you very much. I promised myself not to serve again in the active Russian army, and I won't, not even if Bonaparte were here at Smolensk threatening bald hills. Even then I wouldn't serve in the Russian army. Well, as I was saying, 
he continued, recovering his composure. Now there's this recruiting. My father is chief in command of the third district, and my only way of avoiding active service is to serve under him. Then you are serving? I am. He paused a little while. And why do you serve? Why, for this reason. My father is one of the most remarkable men of his time. But he's growing old, and though not exactly cruel, he has too energetic a character. He's so accustomed to unlimited power that he's terrible. And now he has this authority of a commander-in-chief of the recruiting, granted by the emperor. If I had been two hours late a fortnight ago, he would have had a paymaster's clerk at Yuchnovna hanged, said Prince Andrew with a smile. So I am serving because I alone have any influence with my father, and now and then can save him from actions which would torment him afterwards. Well, there, you see. Yes, but it is not as you imagine, Prince Andrew continued. I did not and do not in the least care about that scoundrel of a clerk who had stolen some boots from the recruits. I should even have been very glad to see him hanged. But I was sorry for my father. That, again, is for myself. Prince Andrew grew more and more animated. His eyes glittered feverishly while he tried to prove to Pierre that in his actions there was no desire to do good to his neighbor. There now. You wish to liberate your serfs, Prince Andrew continued to Pierre. That is a very good thing. But not for you. I don't suppose you ever had anyone flogged or sent to Siberia. And still less for your serfs. If they are beaten, flogged, or sent to Siberia, I don't suppose they're any the worse off. In Siberia they lead the same animal life, and the stripes on their bodies heal, and they're happy as before. But it is a good thing for proprietors who perish morally, bring remorse upon themselves, stifle this remorse, and grow callous, as a result of being able to inflict punishments justly and unjustly. It is those people I pity, and for their sake I should like to liberate the serfs. You may not have seen, but I have seen, how, how good men brought up in those traditions of unlimited power, in time when they grow more irritable, become cruel uh, and harsh, are conscious of it, but cannot restrain themselves, and grow more and more miserable. Prince Andrew spoke so earnestly that Pierre could not help thinking that these thoughts had been suggested to Prince Andrew by his father's case. He did not reply. So that's what I'm sorry for. Human dignity, peace of mind, purity. And not the serfs, backs and foreheads, which, beat and shave as you may, always remain the same, backs and foreheads. No, no, a thousand times no. I shall never agree with you, said Pierre. Note. Shaved foreheads refers to the fact that a proprietor could send any of his serfs as exiles to Siberia, and when going there, one side of the head was shaved, that the man might more easily be recaptured should he run away. Chapter 10 Pierre's and Prince Andrew's Talk on the Ferry Raft In the evening, Andrew and Pierre got into the open carriage and drove to Bald Hills. Prince Andrew, glancing at Pierre, broke the silence now and then with remarks which showed that he was in a good temper. Pointing to the fields, he spoke of the improvements he was making in his husbandry. Pierre remained gloomily silent, answering in monosyllables, and apparently immersed in his own thoughts. He was thinking that Prince Andrew was unhappy, had gone astray, did not see the true light, and that he, Pierre, ought to aid and lighten and raise him. But as soon as he thought of what he should say, he felt that Prince Andrew, with one word, one argument, would upset all his teaching, and he shrank from beginning, afraid of exposing to possible ridicule what to him was precious and sacred. No, but why do you think so? Pierre suddenly began, lowering his head and looking like a bull about to charge. Why do you think so? You should not think so. Think? What about? asked Prince Andrew with surprise. About life, about man's destiny. It can't be so. I myself thought like that. And do you know what saved me? Freemasonry. No, no, don't smile. 
Freemasonry is not a religious ceremonial sect as I thought it was. Freemasonry is the best expression of the best, the eternal aspects of humanity. And he began to explain Freemasonry as he understood it to Prince Andrew. He said that Freemasonry is the teaching of Christianity freed from the bonds of state and church, a teaching of equality, brotherhood, and love. Only our holy brotherhood has the real meaning of life. All the rest is a dream, said Pierre. Now understand, my dear fellow, that outside this union all is filled with deceit and falsehood. And I agree with you that nothing is left for an intelligent and good man but to live out his life like you, merely trying not to harm others. But make our fundamental convictions your own. Join our brotherhood. Give yourself up to us. Let yourself be guided, and you will at once feel yourself, as I have felt myself, a part of that vast invisible chain, the beginning of which is hidden in heaven, said Pierre. Prince Andrew, looking straight in front of him, listened in silence to Pierre's words. More than once, when the noise of the wheels prevented his catching what Pierre said, he asked him to repeat it, and by the peculiar glow that came into Prince Andrew's eyes and by his silence, Pierre saw that his words were not in vain, and that Prince Andrew would not interrupt him or laugh at what he said. They reached a river that had overflowed its banks and which they had to cross by ferry. While the carriage and horses were being placed on it, they also stepped on the raft. Prince Andrew, leaning his arms on the raft railing, gazed silently at the flooding waters glittering in the setting sun. Well, what do you think about it? Pierre asked. Why are you silent? What do I think about it? I'm listening to you. It's all very well. You say... Join our brotherhood, and we will show you the aim of life, the destiny of man, and the laws which govern the world. But who are we, men? How is it you know everything? Why do I alone not see what you see? You see a reign of goodness and truth on earth, but I don't see it. Pierre interrupted him. Do you believe in a future life? he asked. A future life, Prince Andrew repeated, but Pierre, giving him no time to reply, took the repetition for a denial, the more readily as he knew Prince Andrew's former atheistic convictions. You say you can't see a reign of goodness and truth on earth, nor could I, and it cannot be seen if one looks on our life here as the end of everything. On earth, here on this earth, Pierre pointed to the fields, there is no truth. All is false and evil, but in the universe, in the whole universe, there is a kingdom of truth. And we who are now the children of earth are eternally children of the whole universe. Don't I feel in my soul that I am part of this vast, harmonious whole? Don't I feel that I form one link, one step between the lower and higher beings in this vast, harmonious multitude of beings in whom the deity, the supreme power, if you prefer the term, is manifest. If I see, clearly see, that ladder leading from plant to man, why should I suppose it breaks off at me and does not go farther and farther? I feel that I cannot vanish, since nothing vanishes in this world, but that I shall always exist and always have existed. I feel that beyond me and above me there are spirits, and that in this world there is truth. Yes, that is Herder's theory, said Prince Andrew. But it is not that which can convince me, dear friend. Life and death are what convince what convinces is when one sees a being dear to one, bound up with one's own life, before whom one was to blame and had hoped to make it right. Prince Andrew's voice trembled and he turned away. And suddenly 